Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Rockstar Untamed A Single Dad Romance Audiobook By Michelle Love Narrated by Google Play Auto Narrated Voice Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Blurb She's my new personal assistant. I have to keep reminding myself of that. I'm Bodhi Creed Rockstar Superstar Hustler. I admit it, I've used my looks, my fame, my money to get any woman I want. But Sailor King is different. She has a past, a terrifying, horrifying past, one that threatens her life every single day. I want to protect her, I want to keep her safe. And more than anything, I want her for me. She has more power over me than she knows, and yet. I have to keep reminding myself, she's my employee. But I don't see how I can stop myself from falling for her. Part 1 Chicago, Illinois January Bodhi Creed breathed in the scent of the crowd, sweat, excitement, almost frenzied adoration. He stood at the front of the stage, taking in the love of his fans as he finished his song, putting everything into the final few chords, his voice soaring and dipping perfect pitch. He knew he could make people shiver with the sound of his voice. He finished the song and took his final bow, taking his time to wave to the crowd as he left the stage, his whole system flooding with adrenaline. Who needed drugs when just singing could make you feel like this? He grinned to his crew and his band, thanking each of them personally. There was a reason people loved Bodhi Creed. It wasn't just that he had pulled himself out of a hellish path to a drug-fueled death, or that his face could sell anything, as much as his singing voice. It was that he was a genuinely humble man, off stage and on. He had his demons, what rock god didn't, but now, nearing 40, he still appealed to fans of all ages. Bodhi walked back to his dressing room, pushed the door open and almost choked he. Poppy, his personal assistant of two months, had been cleansing his space again, burning sage and wafting it around the windowless room. She grinned at him. Hey boss. She had bright pink hair, tattoos up and down her arms, and wore clothes that would make a fetishist blush. She looked like a real rock goddess, Bodhi smiled fondly at her now, more than he ever did. Gosh, he was tired. This had been the last date on a tour that had lasted well over a year now, and he was exhausted, drained, ready for some downtime. Bodhi knew himself, it was times like these he would have, back in the day, reached for the bottle or the white stuff. The thought of drugs now made him feel sick. Jimi Hendrix, Lane Staley, Scott Weiland, Shannon Hoon, he used their names as a mantra to stay away from drugs now, even when he was depressed. Now, as he ran his hand through his dark curls and slumped down onto the sofa, a cold soda in hand, he looked for respite in other ways. His good friend, Claudio Fonseca, an artist, had invited him to go stay at his farmhouse in the Tuscan Hills for the summer, picking olives, chilling out. Bodhi couldn't wait. Two months of Italian sun, wine, food and relaxation in the company of good friends. He could see his mom at her home in Florence. Bodhi longed to go back to Italy. His American father had brought the family over to America just after Bodhi had been born, and growing up in San Francisco, Bodhi had longed to know the place he had come from. When his dad died, his mom sold her house and went back, begging Bodhi to come with her. But by then, he was a star, and he needed to be in Los Angeles for his career. He looked up as the door opened, and Franklin, the theater manager, stuck his head in. Sorry to interrupt, Bodhi, but there's a kid out here to see you. Bodhi was surprised. A kid. Show them in, please. Thanks, Frank. He always, always took the time to talk with his fans, despite how tired he was. Without them, he was nothing. A kid with dark curls not older than ten pushed shyly into the room, and Bodhi got up to greet him. Hey there, what's your name, kiddo? The kid blinked his huge green eyes up at Bodhi, seeming dumbstruck. Bodhi didn't see the woman who had entered behind the child until she spoke softly. 
His name is Tim Bodie. Bode, recognizing the voice, immediately looked up, and a shock ran through him. Gemma? The blonde woman smiled at him. Been a long time, hasn't it? Bodhi stared at her, still stunned to see his former lover. Age she was Bodhi's senior by five years, had not dulled her beauty, but there was a haunted, desperate look in her eyes. Must be about ten, yay. Bodhi broke off, realization dawning, and he gazed down at the young boy standing between them. Dark hair, bright green eyes. Bodhi's eyes, there really was no question. Tim was Bodhi's son. Gemma looked at him, her eyes filling with tears as she watched him put the pieces together. I'm sorry to do this to you, Bodhi, I really am. But I'm not doing so well. I need to go away for a while, alone. And I thought it's time. It's time for Tim to know his daddy. Bodhi's whole body felt as if he'd been hit by a sledgehammer as he gazed down into the face of his son. Miami, Florida Sailor King followed her minder through the mall. It was cool inside the spacious building, but Sailor didn't mind. Even January in Florida was too hot for her, and her dark hair stuck to her forehead and to the back of her neck. Monica, her minder, gave her an annoyed look. What's wrong with you today? You know Bartholomew will punish me if we're more than two hours. We haven't even found your wedding dress yet. Sailor stared back at Monica blankly. She felt so tired lately, so hopeless that she had stopped taking the tablets they had given her all her life, and now she felt as if her brain would go mad. She didn't want this, didn't want to be married to a man more than twice her age. She knew within the ranks of the organization that she was lucky. Other girls were clamoring to be partnered with Bart Foy, their leader, their captain. But Bart had chosen her. She had known the unease of his lascivious gaze on her body, her curves, her flat belly, her full breasts, since she was a teenager. He had held her face in his hands when she was just 14, an entire decade ago, and it had been decreed. She would be his new wife when she reached the age of womanhood. In their ideology, it would be her 25th birthday in a few weeks. Bart Foy had been married twice before. The first wife was Tamsin, about whom nobody knew much. They had been married before Bart formed the Children of Love commune, deep in the Florida Everglades. His wife had left him after refusing to join him in his mission. Bart's second wife, Clotilde, was a beautiful, loving Frenchwoman, with dark brown hair tumbling down her back and a sweet nature. She had joined the group as a teacher to the children, and Sailor had been one of her wards. She had been particularly close to Clotilde, Tilly to those who loved her, and when, one shocking horrific night, Tilly had been found dead, Sailor had been devastated. Bart made them all walk past Tilly's body, laid out on the shrine in their temple. I want you to look, children. Look what sin can bring. Sailor had always wondered what he meant. When she found out, from hushed whispers in the schoolyard, that Tilly had been having an affair with another man, and that she had been stabbed to death, even at eleven, Sailor knew what that meant. The terror when Bart chose her for his next wife had been all-encompassing, but she had buried her head in the sand, thinking the day would never come. Then, three months ago, he had summoned her. My dearest Sailor, your womanhood is fast approaching, and to me it seems the perfect time for us to become one. Your birthday will serve as our wedding day, do you understand? She nodded, the fear inside overwhelming her ability to speak. Bart smiled and touched her cheek. Good. Now, I'm afraid we have to deal with a little unpleasantness before you go. As you know, I take my role here very seriously, and in choosing you as my wife, I need you to be an ambassador for us all. He paused, studying her. You were very close to Clotilde, I know. She betrayed all of us, sailor. All of us. Her punishment, well. He picked up a folder and handed it to her. I'm going to leave you alone here for a few minutes to study what's in that folder. When I return, this matter will be closed. This is what happens when my women betray me, sailor, understand? That's the only reason why I'm showing you these photographs. Sailor nodded again. Good girl. I'll leave you alone. He left his office, and Sailor heard the lock being clicked from outside. 
She opened the folder, feeling nausea rise up in her, and a small moan of despair escaped her as she looked at the first photograph. Tilly looked terrified as the two men in the picture held her down, obviously making sure the photographer got a good shot of her. The next photograph made Sailor cry out. The knife was buried deep in Tilly's stomach, and her face was contorted in agony. Sailor was trembling as she looked through every photograph of Tilly's murder, each one more stark and brutal than the last. The last photograph broke Sailor. There was another man now, strapped down to a chair, gagged and bound, his face contorted with grief as he gazed down at his dead love's body. Tilly's lover. They'd made him watch while they killed her. Sailor started to cry. Bart's meaning was obvious. Step out of line and you die. It was at that moment that Sailor knew she had to risk everything and escape the only life she had ever known. Monica was chatting with the saleswoman in the wedding shop. She was used to Monica and Sailor coming now. Sailor had deliberately been picky over her choice, giving herself time to check out the fitting rooms and any potential escape routes. She'd nearly been foiled by Monica insisting on accompanying her to the rooms. Sailor had used her only weapon, she was Bart's chosen one. I don't think, she told Monica archly, that Bart would be too pleased that you laid eyes on my body before the wedding. I am his, Monica, and his alone. Her implied threat hit the mark, and Monica let her change alone. Sailor was careful, never taking too long between changes to reappear, but still, she managed to figure out the layout of the store. Now she could barely wait. Careful. Careful. She took her time choosing then took the dress with her. It was a huge, completely inappropriate choice, layers and layers of tulle that she would never wear in a million years, but Sailor knew what she was doing. The shirt she was wearing today was too big, plaid and her trousers combats. In the many pockets she had stashed the money she had been saving over the last three months, squirreled away and stolen from the commune's money cash, a little at a time. Her birth certificates and social security number, and any other thing she found in Bart's office that terrible day, that she could use. She even had a small penknife, tucked in the back pocket of her pants. In all, she only had a couple of hundred dollars, but it was enough for a bus ticket. After that, she'd figure something out. Monica didn't even blink as Sailor walked toward the fitting rooms, calling back to her, I won't be a sec. Monica smirked. That atrocity that Sailor was carrying would take more than a sec to change into. Lording it over her like she was some special kind. Look how that worked out for Tilly's skank. She turned back to the saleswoman, who knew all about the commune, all about Bart's proclivities. Monica had told her all about them one night in bed. The girl, Bettina, had been a good, if inexperienced lay, and Monica wouldn't mind another go around. The alarm screeched through the shop, and both of women started. What the heck? The fire escape door, Bettina looked terrified, as Monica cursed loudly and drew out a blade, darting towards the fitting rooms. Effing skank. She saw the fire escape door standing wide open, and the wedding dress dumped in the doorway. Monica screamed, racing down the corridor and around the corner towards the exit, Bettina close behind her. They both trod on the dress in their eagerness to get out, but Sailor had ripped the tool to shreds and their feet got caught, tangled, and they both fell. Bettina shrieked as Monica's knife came way too close to her neck. Shut up, Monica sliced away at the fabric, trying to free them. Out of the fire escape, they could see the parking lot, and Monica raked it with her eyes, trying to spot Sailor. Sailor dropped from the top of the fitting room wall and slid silently into the main room. Inspiration striking, she went to the register, hoping against hope that some rich Mukatimak had paid with cash. She was in luck. She scooped a wad of twenties out of the register, raking every note and coin in there into her pocket. Listening intently to make sure she could still hear Monica cursing away in the back, she quickly took stock and grabbed the wigs from the mannequins in the window. In a high-end store like this, they used real human hair wigs, and she could use them to disguise herself and then sell them. She stuffed them all into a plastic bag and then she was free. Running to the exit of the mall and out into the Florida sunshine, she flagged down a cab and asked the driver to take her to the bus station. In a half hour she was on the bus, hunched down, hiding. 
and breathing freely for the first time in her young life. Los Angeles Six months later Bodhi ate the piece of toast half-heartedly as he watched his son push his cereal around his bowl. Kiddo, that will get all mushy if you do that. I like it mushy. Bodhi sighed. Well, at least Tim was speaking to him now. Okay then. Tim glanced at his father briefly, then looked away when Bodhi met his gaze. Can I go to school now? Bodhi nodded, not knowing what else to do. Since Gemma had left Tim with him, this had been their routine. Tim, thankfully, had settled into his new school happily, but at home. At home, Bodhi thought bitterly, it's been the Cold War. Tim hadn't taken to him at all, was rude, silent, and resentful. Bodhi knew Tim blamed him for his mother leaving him, but Bodhi had no idea what else to do. Poppy, his assistant, had suddenly quit, telling him she was sorry but looking after a kid hadn't been in the job description. It's just not my jam, Bodhi, I'm sorry. Since then, Tim had seen off two childminders and one English tutor. Bodhi had cancelled gigs, interviews, recording sessions to try and bond with his son, but nothing was working. Tim was vastly unimpressed with his father's musical friends, couldn't care less about the instruments Bodhi played. Even the priceless grand piano in the living room held no interest. Tim kept to his room, his vast well stocked with everything a boy could need room, and didn't even explore the pool or the grounds of Bodhi's luxurious Hollywood Hills mansion. Bodhi got into the driver's seat of his RAV4, and they began another silent drive to Tim's school. Gemma had insisted that Tim had the best education, and Bodhi, ignoring the fact she was making demands while asking an enormous favor, agreed. Gosh, he would do anything for his son. He knew that the moment Gemma had brought Tim into his life. He just wished he could feel like anything but a deadbeat dad. He glanced over to Tim now. Hey, kiddo. What say we go shopping for a new laptop for you at the weekend? Tim looked at him with those huge green eyes even wider. Really? Really? Thank you, Bodhi. Progress, although he wished Tim would call him dad. Deciding not to push it and ruin the atmosphere, he just smiled at Tim and was rewarded by a slight smile. That one you have is ancient, I'm surprised you can still use it. Tim's smile disappeared and he looked away from his father. Evan brought me that laptop before he went away. Ah, the sainted Evan. Bodhi sighed. If Tim talked at all about his life before Bodhi, it was about his former stepfather Evan. Evan Witter was a detective up in Portland, and to hear Tim talk, the most amazing man he'd ever met. Evan had practically raised Tim from birth, so Bodhi couldn't help be grateful. He just wished and hoped that Witter had some faults, so that he, Bodhi, wouldn't feel such like a loser. When Evan and Gemma had split up, Tim had been devastated. And now Bodhi had insulted Evan's final gift to Tim. Bodhi opened his mouth to apologize, but closed it again. Why bother? He dropped him off at school, barely receiving a bye. He checked his watch and drove into the center of L.A. to his agent's office. Maurice had summoned him, obviously trying to get him back in the game after six months away. Bodhi's little sabbatical wasn't making Maurice his 15%, and he was getting antsy about it. Maybe it is time I got back to work, Bodhi thought now, as he steered his way into a parking space. I'm sure not doing anything helpful at home. He sighed and got out of the car and opened the door to the office. Sailor gritted her teeth as for the fourth time that morning, Maurice Winston leaned across her, pressing his sweaty body against hers. I'll move, she said archly, pushing back her chair so it rammed him in the ankle. She had worked for Maurice for three months, and if she hadn't been desperate for money and eager to hide out in her little apartment, she would have quit the day after she started. Maurice Winston was a lech, a man who clearly saw his assistant as his property. When he wasn't making gross suggestions to her, he was outright rude, criticizing her at every turn, even though Sailor ran his office like a tight ship. Her past, the rules, the chores of the commune had left her with one good thing. She was organized, efficient and punctual and she knew Maurice knew it too. But the harassment he gave her every day, was it worth it?
She had been searching out other job opportunities, but it seemed the rest of L.A. wasn't hiring just yet. She had no choice to put up with his behavior. Escaping the clutches of the children of love had only been the start of her tumultuous new life. Getting off the bus in L.A. after traveling for days, she had checked herself into a small motel, and after a hot shower, a night's sleep, and vending machine food, she had taken stock. The money she had stolen was enough that she could manage for a month or so. She had no remorse about taking it, either. She checked the Miami local news on a computer at the local library. The robbery and her disappearance were never mentioned. No, because I know too much, hey Bart. I know about Tilly. What you did to her. Even now, the thought of Bart's anger scared her. She knew he would try to find her, and if he did, she was a dead woman. She had constant nightmares about him stabbing her to death. But as time went on, she began to relax into her new life. She found a studio flat close to where Maurice's office was, and although it was tiny, she loved it. She began to make it her own, books, records, flowers on every surface. She even loved the small galley kitchen and began to teach herself how to cook. After work each night, she would come home, change out of her work clothes into sweats and eat, watch TV, play music, or read. And she loved every moment. It was hers and hers alone. Maurice was reading a letter now, oblivious to Sailor's annoyance. She sat back down in her chair and started to go through emails, occasionally mentioning important notes to him. He grunted as if he wasn't listening properly, and Sailor rolled her eyes. It would mean her staying late and making a cheat sheet of everything he needed to know. Jerk. She was so engrossed in her work that she failed to notice he had put down the letter and was standing too close behind her. Sailor stood to go grab a photocopy, and Maurice pounced. He swept a foot under hers and Sailor lost balance, falling into Maurice's clutches. He tumbled her to the couch and began to kiss her. Sailor struggled, panicking, angry and terrified. Get off me. Maurice grinned. Come on now, Sailor, you know this has been coming for a while. Don't fight it. I know you want me. Sailor pounded his chest with her fists. Let me go. Get off me. Maurice still grinning. Come on, lovely girl. Sailor lost it then, and drawing back her arm, she punched Maurice in the eye, her ring tearing a piece of flesh from below his eyebrow. He rocked back, roaring in pain. Sailor scrambled away from him, but he grabbed her ankle and pulled her back. Join the cue jerk, Sailor hissed and rammed her foot into his groin hard. Maurice screamed and doubled up, and Sailor skittered away from him. I quit, you monster. And believe me, I'm going to the police and the press. You don't ever get to put your hands on me. She was raging now, every ounce of hurt in her life coming back to her and releasing through her anger and hurt. Who do you think you are touching me like that? Maurice smiled nastily. More than you'll ever be in this town, skank. How are you this naive? Did you really think I hired you for your typing skills? No, princess, it was because I wanted you in bed, and I always get what I want. He lunged for again and got his hands around her throat, choking her as she tried to scream, struggling to pull his hands away. She twisted away from him, and his hands loosened enough for her to scream at the top of her lungs. Maurice's body weight was heavy on her, and she knew that he had the upper hand. Suddenly there seemed to be a tornado of fresh air blowing in as the door burst open and a man, his beautiful face filled with anger, of shock, hauled Maurice off Sailor and threw him across the room. If Maurice dwarfed Sailor, then this man was a giant, and Maurice was no match. What do you think you're doing? He roared at Maurice, who was trying to stand up. Her savior held out his hands to Sailor, and gratefully she took them, her whole body trembling. Are you okay, sweetheart? Sailor gazed into the man's huge green eyes, seeing only empathy there, and she shook her head. He put his arm gently around her shoulders. It's okay, lovely, I won't let him near you again. You, he turned back to Maurice. You're so fired, Maurice. How dare you behave like this? Maurice was straightening up his clothes. Oh, back off, Bodhi, it was just a little fun. Bodhi's face was a picture of utter disgust and rage. A little fun? Fun? 
When a woman is screaming like that, that's not fun, Maurice, that's assault. He turned his beautiful eyes back to Sailor. Honey, what's your name? Sailor. A whisper, her throat raw from being choked. Bodhi swept a gentle hand over her cheek, brushing away her tears. Sailor, sweetheart, we need to go to the police. I'll back you 100%. Now, wait a minute. Shut up, Maurice. Now. A lion's roar. Maurice, shut up. Bodhi steered Sailor into a chair and pulled out his phone, but Sailor put her hand over it and shook her head. Bodhi frowned. Are you sure? She nodded, meeting his gaze. Even through her teary eyes, her shock that was slowly turning to numbness, she was enwrapped with this man's beauty, his grace, his kindness. She wanted to close her eyes and lean into him and sleep with his arms around her. She sighed. I just want to go, she said softly. Bodhi touched her cheek. Then we'll go. Maurice, you're a lucky man that Sailor doesn't want to press charges, but as from this moment, you are no longer my agent. Maurice seemed to realize that his biggest cash cow was on the way out of the door. Now wait Bodhi, there's no need. Bodhi turned his furious eyes on the other man. There is every need, jerk. Maurice smiled nastily. Then you should know, I'll do everything in my power to finish you in this town. Everything? Go right ahead, Bodhi said calmly. Try it. See how far you'll get. He took Sailor's hand and pulled her to her feet. Come on, sweetie, get your things and we'll get out of here. Sailor nodded and quickly grabbed her purse and a few personal items from her desk. Maurice watched her. I don't even need to tell you that you'll never work in this town again, you little skank. Bodhi stepped up to Maurice and punched him across the room. You don't ever talk to her or any other woman like that again. You're a lucky sailor doesn't want the police involved, but believe me, I hear of anything else like this, and I'll call your wife and her billionaire daddy. So go to hell. He looked at Sailor, watching him, waiting by the door, and he smiled the most beautiful smile at her. Sailor felt her stomach flutter. Besides, Bodhi continued, you're so wrong. Sailor already has another job. If she agrees, she'll be working for me and twice at the salary. Not only that, but I will make sure every employer in town knows and respects her. Think about that, Maurice. He stalked over to Sailor and offered her his hand. Ready to go, lovely? Sailor smiled and took his hand. In Bodhi's car, Sailor finally stopped her hands trembling. She looked at the man beside her. Bodhi Creed, she'd heard of him, of course, he was her boss's, scratch that, ex-boss's biggest client, and yet she hadn't met or even spoken to him before today. His magnetism was a powerful thing, even just sitting beside him here, she couldn't help wonder at his incredible physical beauty. Swarthy skin, stubble, dark curls flopping around his head. And those eyes, gosh, she could get lost in them. She pulled herself up sharply. Do not get a crush. Thank you for what you did back there, Mr. Creed. I can never repay you. He turned and smiled at her. It's Bodhi and there's nothing to repay. Are you feeling okay now? She nodded. I am, thank you. Where are we going? Bodhi blinked. You know, I was just heading home. Automatic, you know? Would you feel more comfortable going somewhere public? I thought I would make you some lunch. A rock god making her lunch? Was this happening? He was so normal. So down to earth. You really don't have to. Bodhi grinned. Full disclosure. I like making food for people, I enjoy the company. How about if I ask instead of assuming? Sailor, would you like to have lunch with me? And Sailor knew without a doubt that she most definitely would. Sailor groaned and put her hand on her belly. Bodhi Creed knew how to cook. I think you may have killed me. She grinned at him. That was incredible, thank you. I won't need to eat for a few weeks, I think. Bodhi laughed, spearing the last piece of his steak into his mouth. A blue cheese and steak salad was his specialty. Throw in freshly baked bread that he admitted he'd got from the store, 
fresh, plump peaches and a light pinot grigio and sailor was in heaven. Sure I can't tempt you with some gelato or anything? Gosh, sailor said, I love gelato but even my pudding stomach is full. Your pudding stomach? Bodhi laughed loudly and sailor grinned at him. Yeah, you know when you're so full of savory stuff but then someone offers you sugar and all bets are off. Except today. Pudding stomach is out of action? Yes, sir. Bodhi chuckled. If my mom was here, you'd been talked into it. She's been making gelato since I was a kid, before that even. Family recipes. Your mom's Italian? She is. An artist. She lives in Florence, and I don't get to see her as often as I would like. She would like you, sailor. She hates women who pick at their food. So do I. One of life's great pleasures, food. Especially if it's made by a rock star, Sailor grinned, and laughing, he toasted her with his glass. They were sitting out on his patio, looking over the hills to Los Angeles in the distance. His huge infinity pool shone bright blue, and a small breeze took some of the afternoon heat off. Sailor studied her host. Do you live here alone? Bodhi shook his head. No, my son is here with me at the moment. He's ten while well, only just. His name is Tim. He reached into his pocket for his wallet, then pulled out a photograph to show Sailor. She studied it. Adorable. He is your doppelganger, she said, nodding. In looks only, I'm afraid, Bodhi smiled a little sadly. While his old pa is an exhibitionist and a show-off, Tim is definitely erring on the side of science. Not that it's a bad thing. He could run rings around me and frequently does. Bodhi gazed out at the view for a long moment. I didn't know him, or even that he existed until six months ago. His mother, Gemma, was my girlfriend a decade ago, but we hadn't seen or spoken for that long. She came to me, telling me that she needed some alone time and that it was my turn to raise my son. He looked at Sailor and gave a hopeless shrug. I have no idea what I'm doing, Sailor. None. And Tim, Tim resents me. Sailor was startled at his openness, but touched that he opened up to her. Two hours ago, they were strangers. I think you're probably doing better than you think, Bodhi. It has to be hard, there's no owner's manual when it comes to kids. With a pang, she thought back to how she was raised. There, in the cult, there was definitely an owner's manual, and it was one of subjugation, terror and manipulation. Sailor? You okay? Sailor realized she was frowning and grinned sheepishly. Sorry. Stuck in memory. Bad childhood? Something like that. But she didn't want to ruin the mood by telling him anything. Besides, she'd promised herself she would never tell anyone. If word got back to Bart where she was. I meant what I said about hiring you, Sailor. I do need a page's A, desperately actually. Sailor suddenly felt shy. I would work my ass off for you, Bodhi, I admit, but I wouldn't want you to think I'm taking advantage of your kindness. You've already done more for me in the few hours I've known you than anyone else in my lifetime. Bodhi's eyes were troubled. That's just wrong. Sailor, I'm just glad I was there, you don't owe me anything. But seriously please, give me a shot. I'll pay double, hell, triple what Winston was paying you. I know you ran interference with Winston and me when I was on sabbatical. She started to protest and he grinned. Don't give me that, I know it was you. The kind emails about me taking as long as I needed, that was all you. Sailor was bright red now. I know what it's like to have personal stuff going on. Sometimes you just need to get away. Bodhi picked up the bottle of wine and dumped the rest in her glass. Amen to that, sister. So yes. He raised his glass and Sailor picked hers up. Yes, she said simply and tapped her glass against his. He drove her home before he went to pick up Tim from school. I'll pick you up tomorrow just after 9 a.m., he said, and we'll lease you a car as soon as we can. How does that sound? She smiled at him. Sounds great, thank you, Bodhi. And thank you for lunch, for the job, for saving me this morning. 
I hope I can repay your kindness. Bodhi touched his finger to her cheek. You just stay safe, little one. Maurice doesn't know where you live, does he? She shook her head. No, thank God. I'll be fine. See you in the morning. Good night, sailor. He watched her walk up the stairs to her apartment and wave at him as she opened the door. He smiled and waved back before pulling the car back into traffic. Sailor King. When he'd opened the door to Maurice's office that morning and saw her being attacked, his anger had known no bounds. She was so tiny, so fragile, of course, his instincts had kicked in. In a way, he was relieved to be free of Maurice Winston. He'd never liked the man, but he was the best agent in Hollywood. Screw it. Why did he even need an agent? He was a musician, for Christ's sakes. He had a contact in San Francisco, Emily Moore, who had given him her card at a concert the year before and told him to call if he needed representation. Emily was gorgeous too, but completely in love with her boyfriend, Dash Hamilton, one of the partners in the Quartet Record Company. Quartet had been pursuing him too, knowing his contract with Sony was almost up. Maybe it's time for a complete change, he thought. Maybe things should slow down. It wasn't as if he didn't have enough money. Just three months ago, Forbes had placed his net worth just shy of a billion dollars. But some things were worth more than wealth, hell, a lot of things, Bodhi told himself now. His son, first and foremost. He had to try and find a way to get through to Tim. Whether Tim realized it or not, Bodhi had grown to love him. It was just, at this moment, he didn't know whether he liked him. A new life. A new assistant. A new friend. Sailor. Bodhi laughed and shook his head. How quickly life changes. Of course he was a man, and her fragile beauty hadn't passed him by. The long waves of her dark brown hair that almost reached her waist, the big dark eyes, the pink flush of her cheeks. And her smile, finally after the trauma of her near assault, he'd made her laugh at lunch, and her smile had made his day. It lit up her face. She was young, too young for that sort of crap to happen to her. And she's probably too young for you, buddy, so keep your thoughts pure. With a sigh, Bodhi knew the truth of that. If he wanted to keep Sailor in his life, he would have to be professional, keep his thoughts to himself. She deserved that much from him. At dinner, he told Tim about his new assistant, but Tim just shrugged and said, okay. Bodhi wondered if the kid cared less about who was in his life. Hey, how about we go to the beach this weekend? Have you ever been to Venice Beach? Evan used to take me all the time. Of course. Bodhi was really starting to dislike this Evan. Okay then, how about to the Caribbean? I have a place on an island down there. Tim's eyes opened wide and Bodhi felt a rush of joy. Finally, Tim was impressed. For reals? For reals? We can go on Friday after school, come back Sunday. What do you say? Tim studied his father and Bodhi for the millionth time, wondered what was going on in his head. Okay. Bodhi smiled. He wanted to say more, suggest other things they could do, but he didn't want to push his luck. This was enough for now. The Caribbean. Sailor gaped at him as Bodhi laughed at her expression the next morning. That's right. Want to come? All expenses paid, of course. Sailor sat back in the passenger seat, shaking her head in disbelief. Twenty-four hours ago, we didn't even know each other, and now you've hired me, and offered me a dream vacation to a tropical island? This isn't real. Bodhi grinned. Listen, if it freaks you out, just think of it as a working trip. I need to figure out what to do going forwards, and I need you to help me. On a tropical island. She repeated, then laughed. Well, I'd love to, but I don't have a passport. Bodhi's eyebrows shot up. You don't? Ah, ah. Sailor shook her head, her smile fading. Bodhi studied her for a long moment, then turned back to the road. Okay, well, we could get that arranged by Friday, no problem. You have a birth certificate, right? Sailor nodded. 
She'd stolen it from Bart's cabinet the day he'd left her alone in his office, along with anything she could find with her name on. When she'd arrived in L.A., she'd gone to City Hall to legally change her name from the near-unique-sounding Sailor King to the more generic Sarah Halls. At least then, she could use that name legally, but finding it hard to call herself Sarah, she told people her nickname was Sailor, figuring it was safe enough to do so. Have you never traveled, Sailor? She blinked back in the present and shook her head. No, never. Never been on a plane, never gone anywhere. Bodhi looked amazed but then smiled. Then it's decided. It's outrageous you've never traveled. Especially with a name like Sailor. We'll get your passport arranged and you can come with us. Okay? Sailor hesitated, then nodded. Okay, thank you, Bodhi. She gave a short laugh. I am dreaming, I'm sure. Later that day, after they'd spent all day talking about what Bodhi would be looking for in an assistant, and Sailor getting very excited for the challenge, Bodhi picked him up from school and introduced him to Sailor. Sailor grinned at the young boy. Hey, it's good to meet you. She indicated a patch on his jacket of a rooster spewing fire. Hey, you like Red and Link? Tim looked amazed that a grown-up would know who Red and Link were and nodded, half smiling at her. Today we're going to eat hair gel flavored ice cream. Sailor grinned, knowing he wanted her to give the catchphrase of the two internet comedians. Let's talk about that, she quipped back and Tim laughed delightedly. Bodhi looked between them. I have no idea what either of you is talking about. Sailor rolled her eyes and winked at Tim. Grandad, she said in a stage whisper, making Tim giggle. Bodhi grinned at the sound and then looked gratefully at Sailor. Sailors just agreed to come to the island with us on Friday. That okay with you, buddy? Tim actually smiled at his father, a rare occurrence, and nodded eagerly. Bodhi held his hands up to Sailor. See, now you have to come. When Tim had finally been persuaded to go to bed, Bodhi poured Sailor and himself some wine. Girl, how the hell did you do that? He's talked more this evening than in the last six months. He sat down, shaking his head in amazement, and a little sadness and Sailor's heart went out to him. All day, she had been finding out that this megastar, this world-famous billionaire, was nothing more than a simple man at heart. His glorious face, his hard body, his rough velvet voice had made his fortune, but she could see that he craved a simpler life, one out of the spotlight. He'd shown her around his home, and she'd noticed the rooms he got most excited about were the ones where he created things, his recording studio, his workshop where he made beautiful hand-turned furniture, to relax. He told her about the olive groves in Tuscany where he loved to spend summers, away from public view, with his friends, his best friend Claudio and Bodhi's artist mom. She looked through some pencil sketches, and her heart hurt when she saw the preliminary drawings he'd made of his son. These are gorgeous, Bodhi. He looked pleased, giving her a shy grin. You draw? She nodded. Some. Not as good as this, and I haven't done anything for a while. Out of practice. You are more than welcome to come in here, use anything you want, anytime. Bodhi leaned back against the wall, studying her. Sailor, I've been talking about myself all day, all ego. What about you, what's your story? Sailor felt panicky then, and she looked away from his gaze. Not much to tell. Left a bad situation at home, come to Hollywood six months ago. Don't even know why I chose to settle here, it just seemed far enough away. Bodhi nodded. Family stuff? Or boyfriend? Sailor chewed her lip. Just stuff. Gosh, she should have figured out a story by now. It was just, in this town, people rarely cared about who you were or had been. They just needed to know if you could be useful to them. She decided to go with a potted version of the truth. I was raised in a commune of sorts, I never knew who my father was. I was with my mom as a newborn, but she died soon after. I was alone. So, when I got older and decided the commune's rules and regulations were no longer for me, I left and came here. Bodhi seemed satisfied with that answer. Shame you never knew your parents. No wonder you can relate to Tim. Sailor smiled gently. Tim knows both his parents, they're just apart. 
Can I ask? Why did things with Gemma never work out? Bodhi sat down next to her. Sailor, I was in my late twenties and my career was maybe at its peak. Temptation was everywhere. I cheated is the truth of it. A lot. Gemma deserved better. That's why I can't be mad that she never told me about Tim. I can't be mad. But you are? Bodhi nodded slowly. A little. Mostly at myself for being a loser. Sailor was silent for a moment, studying him. He looked tired, his beautiful eyes had dark circles underneath, his whole body slumped. Sailor resisted the temptation to hug him, or to smooth his dark curls away from his face. He was her boss after all, no matter how friendly and inclusive he was. What do you want, Bodhi? Out of life, I mean. You have every material thing a person could need, you have your son back in your life. What else is there? Bodhi met her gaze and smiled sadly. I don't know, sailor, is the honest truth. There's something missing, and I don't know what it is. I know I'm glad I found a new friend if that means anything. Sailor grinned, flushing slightly. Right back at you, boss. God don't call me that. We're collaborators in life. Sailor laughed. I like that. She glanced at her watch. Gosh, it's late. I'd better go. Bodhi got up, and she followed him into the kitchen. He opened a small cabinet and took out a set of keys. Here you go. You know how to drive, right? Sailor nodded, taking the keys. Bodhi's fingers brushed hers, and a small thrill went through her. Will you be okay driving home? She nodded. Of course. He walked her out to the car, and she couldn't help but gasp. It was a mint green Thunderbird, in spotless condition. Sailor shook her head. I can't, Bodhi, this is too much. Sailor, this car was made for you. It's classy, classic, and beautiful. Just like you. There were tears in Sailor's eyes now, and she turned away from him. Bodhi, you just met me, and already you've given me so much. I can't take it, I'm sorry. Then think of it as a loner until you find one you like. He dumped the keys in her hand and steered her towards the car. His hands on her bare shoulders were soft, caressing, and Sailor shivered. Nope, do not get a crush. Bodhi would take no further argument. He kissed her cheek and waved as she started down the long driveway to the road out. As she drove home, Sailor's thoughts were in turmoil. Bodhi was kind, generous, funny, and smart, but there was certainly a little control freak in him. Did she really want that in her life again? As she opened the door to her tiny apartment, she sighed. She didn't really have a choice, did she? And besides, she was excited about the job, as well as spending time with Bodhi and Tim. She'd seen the pain in the little boy's eyes, reflected in his father's who was unable to reach him. If she could help bring them together. What? What's in it for you? She closed her eyes. I just want to feel useful. That I've made a difference, however small. Sailor was his responsibility now, and he could not, would not take advantage of her, no matter how much he couldn't stop thinking about her smooth caramel skin, her dark eyes, that wave of soft hair almost to her waist. He could not compromise their working relationship, Sailor needed this job. There was a fragility to Sailor that he did not quite understand, and he would not be that guy anymore, the one who messed around and didn't think of the other person. No. Sailor was his employee and more than that, his friend. Whatever damage she had, he would help her heal from, as much as she would let him. He got the impression that she hated to be told what to do. Maybe he had pushed it a little far with the car, tonight. But he had been thinking about ways to thank her all evening, and when he thought of the Thunderbird, it fitted her aesthetic so well it seemed natural. Bodhi rolled over on his side and tried to fall asleep. Stop thinking about her. Stop. He didn't fall asleep until it was nearly dawn, and he didn't stop thinking about Sailor. Sailor felt her heart in her mouth as she drove excitedly up the driveway in the Thunderbird. First day of work. She and Bodhi were going to figure out a schedule for the next six months today, and then she could finally get started on her work. She pulled up to the door and got out. 
It was hot today, and a fine sheen of sweat covered her as she left the air-conditioned car and knocked on the door. A few seconds later, the door swung open and Bodhi grinned at her. I forgot to give you a key, didn't I? Hey there, kiddo, first day. He kissed her cheek and she flushed, grinning back. Come have some coffee before we start. He led her into the kitchen, and Sailor felt her heart sink as she saw there was someone else there. A beautiful, no, strike that, a goddess, stood chatting with Tim and sipping a mug of tea. She looked up and smiled at Sailor as they entered the room. She had long chestnut hair straight down past her shoulders, and big friendly hazel eyes almond-shaped. Sailor half-smiled back, unsure of what to feel. Jealous. That's what you are, admit it. She pushed the thought to the back of her mind. Bodhi introduced them. Sailor, this is Soleil, now that's not going to get confusing, is it? He laughed. Soleil is an old friend, my best friend Claudia's sister. Soleil put down her mug and came to give Sailor a hug. Her smile was genuine, her manner relaxed. Ciao, Bella Sailor, she said in broken English accent. I've heard good things about you from these two. I'm very glad to meet you. Sailor, warming to her, hugged her back. And I you. Hey Tim, she said over Soleil's shoulder, and Tim waved his cereal spoon at her, his mouth full. Soleil released her but stood with her arm around Sailor's waist. Now before you start your job, let me warn you. Bodhi is an inveterate flirt. Don't let him run rings around you. She said it in a jokey tone, but Sailor knew she was telling her the truth and grinned at her boss. I figured. Soleil squeezed her. Good girl. I'll get you some coffee. Thanks. Bodhi waved her towards a seat, then glared at his old friend in mock anger. Don't put her off me on her first day, Solly. Besides, I don't flirt with everyone. Solly snorted as she handed Sailor a mug of coffee. You even flirt with me and I'm practically your sister. Never worked though, did it? I have taste. Besides, my heart belongs to another. Sailor watched their playful banner, still a little envious of how easily they could joke around with each other, but also seeing how platonic their relationship was. Tim was watching them too, even smiling at the teasing Soleil was giving his father. Soleil left soon after, giving Sailor another hug. Despite everything I tease him about, he's a good man, she said to Sailor, I'm sure you'll love working for him. Sailor, do you know many people in LA? Bodhi said you'd only been here for six months. Sailor shook her head. No one. Unless you could call the clerk at the 7-Eleven, I friend. Soleil dug a pristine business card out from her purse. Well, now you know someone new. Anytime you need some girl time, call me. Sailor smiled shyly. Thanks, I will. Bodhi grinned at her. She's great, huh? Sailor nodded. Lovely, really lovely. Bodhi grinned. Soleil turning up for breakfast wasn't a regular thing, but when she did, she brought him all the news from back home in Italy. Claudio, it seemed, had lately been dumped by his long-term girlfriend and was screwing his way through the woman of Florence with abandon. Soleil herself didn't have time for relationships. At 31, she was one of the most successful art dealers in the world and traveled constantly. Bodhi had harbored a crush on his friend's younger sister when he was younger, but Soleil, who had known about the attraction, had made it clear that it would never happen between them. Now they had cultivated a friendship which was as important to Bodhi as his relationship with Claudio. He grinned at Sailor. So, I just have to take Tim to school then we can get started. Why don't you explore the house and grounds while we're gone? I'll be a half hour tops. Okay. Sailor wandered around the vast grounds of the mansion as she waited for Bodhi to return. The pool, which glittered blue in the morning sun, was huge, and she wondered if Bodhi would mind if she sometimes did some lengths of it on her lunch break. She felt her body was becoming untoned lately. She hated to go to the gym, but swimming was her thing, letting the water stream past her body. She loved it. She crouched down and dangled her fingers in the cool water. Bliss on a hot June morning in L.A. There was a small guest house across the other side of the pool, and she went over, trying the door and finding it unlocked, she went in. 
It was light, open, and airy inside, constructed to look like a beach house, all white painted wood, hurricane lamps, and white furniture. A whole wall was solid bookcases, and Sailor gave a silent yay as she saw the books were a mix of fiction, nonfiction, and others. She picked out a Stephen King novel and scooched down on the couch to start reading. She missed this, having books on hand to bury herself in. She didn't hear Bodie come home, so absorbed was she in the book. He stood, leaning at the doorway, watching her, a small smile playing around his mouth. Gosh, she was adorable, all that dark hair shoved into a messy ponytail, her blue jeans flared over her Chuck Taylors, her pink t-shirt snug against her breasts and flat belly. Again, he reminded himself that she was his employee. Hey there. Sailor looked up and grinned sheepishly. Sorry. Bookshelves are like catnip to me. Hey, it's all at your disposal, buddy, all of it. Even the guest house itself. You ever need to stay late, you can use this as your own. Hell, you could even move in, rent-free of course if you want. Sailor closed the book and replaced it back on the shelf. There you go again, trying to give me stuff. But she smiled as she said it. Bodhi shrugged. I understand, but it's just stuff, you know? I like to share. Sailor nodded, smiling. Shall we get to work? It was maddening, Bodhi thought, to have her so close beside him, breathing in her clean scent of fresh linen and cotton, her hair escaping from the ponytail. But he wasn't a kid anymore, wasn't that man who would risk everything for a one-night stand. He liked Sailor as a person, regardless of his attraction to her, and throughout that day, he came to understand just how intelligent and efficient she was. He marveled at her ability to brainstorm ideas with him, when by her own admission, she knew nothing about the music business. Bodhi had set up a conference call with Emily Moore in San Francisco, and Sailor had handled it with confidence and grace, not afraid to ask questions when she needed to. Emily, a sweet-natured woman, offered to represent Bodhi officially, and Sailor set up a day to fly up and sign contracts. Come on a day when some of the honchos from Quartet are here, Bodhi. You can meet Dash and Roman, maybe Tomas too if he can drag himself away from Bay. You know the Ninth and Pine are on tour and that Bay is seven months pregnant, right? Lunatic. So Tom may be with her, but Roman and Dash will be here. Sounds good? I'll let you and Sailor discuss dates next week if that's okay. Wonderful. Speak soon, Sailor. When Emily had ended the call, Sailor grinned at Bodie. Just between you and me, I will totally get starstruck if I meet the Ninth and Pine. And yet not starstruck at all with me, Bodhi sighed, with mock self-pity. I'm just hiding it well, Sailor shot back and Bodhi laughed. He stood up and stretched. We got a lot done today, Sailor, I'm feeling re-energized. It'll be good to get back to work, but not until I have this situation with Tim sorted out. I won't neglect him for my work. Sailor smiled at him. See, I know you don't think you're a good dad, but you are. Bodhi was quiet then, and Sailor bit her lip. Sorry, was that inappropriate? Bodhi shook his head. No, it was a sweet thing to say, but I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I can't reach him, Sailor. When you're not here, or when Solly or Claudio isn't around, he ghosts me. He sat down next to her. Can I ask you a question? Anything. Did you know what you were missing? Growing up without parents? Sailor sighed. It wasn't like that really, we were all taken care of. If that's what you call caring for someone, she added, almost to herself, and Bodhi was intrigued. Sailor, just what was this commune like? Are we talking Maharishi Yogi or Jim Jones? Sailor chuckled uncomfortably. Somewhere between the two, look, I really don't want to talk about that. I'm sorry. Bodhi nudged her with his shoulder. It's cool. Look, we need to get your passport arranged by Friday, so let's get it done. Bartholomew Foy stalked back to his office and slammed the door. Six months. Six months since his sailor had run away and nothing. He'd spent millions trying to look for her, all across the country, but wherever she had hidden herself, she'd done an excellent job. As soon as Monica had returned from the store that day, Fuming and obviously scared of what Bart would do to her for losing Sailor, Bart had never known rage like it. 
For years, he had bided his time, waiting for Sailor to reach womanhood. He'd been tempted to take her before she reached 25, dreaming endlessly of her caramel-colored skin, her dark eyes. He remembered her mother, Devi, a single mother Indian immigrant who he'd found on the streets of San Francisco and had fallen for. Devi, although grateful to him, had resisted his charms at first, then as he promised her that she would be taken care of, she had come to him and to his bed. He'd murdered her just after Sailor was born. She'd been seeing another man, outside of the children of love. It was his first killing, but not the last, and now his bloodlust for entirely for Sailor. This time though, unlike with Tilly, he would do the deed himself, to punish her himself, to make her beg for her life before he took it. Ungrateful little skank. A knock at his study door interrupted his dark reverie. What? Salem, his slinky-hipped bodyguard, slipped into the room. Something just pinged in California. One of our moles. She says she might, and I emphasize might, have spotted someone who resembles Sailor at a passport office in Los Angeles. The woman couldn't be sure, but she alerted our Californian branch, and they're following up. Bart tapped his pen on his desk impatiently. That's it? That's all they got? Salem, the one person on his staff who wasn't afraid of Bart, sat down in the chair opposite him. It's more than we've had since Sailor disappeared, Bart. And we have a contact in the passport system, whose is getting back to me later, with anything he can find out. Good. Bart put his pen down and nodded at his bodyguard. Good. Salem, when I get my hands on her. Salem beamed, showing a row of very even, very white teeth. I can only imagine, Bart. Bart's eyes were dark, dangerous. The only thing I'll regret will be that I only get to kill Sailor once. Part 2 Tim was chatting away happily to Sailor as they sat on Bodie's private plane on their way to the Caribbean late Friday night. After her first week as Bodie's assistant, Sailor was exhausted but exhilarated. There was so much to do, to think about, but she loved that Bodie instinctively trusted her to get the job done without interfering. Next week would be even more exciting when they flew up to San Francisco to meet Emily and the quartet people. Sailor and Bodhi had discussed his move to the small but more eclectic and inclusive label. Look who they have on their roster, Sailor enthused, the ninth and pine for one, but look at these others. They've phased out every reality star and TV station brat, and the quality of their music shines through. You deserve this label, Bodhi, and they deserve you. Bodhi grinned at her enthusiasm. You shilling for them now? Sure it's not to get an introduction to the band? Well, that too, she quipped back and they both laughed. I have such a girl crush on Bay Tamba. You're only human. But I think Tom Mayer and their gazillion kids might object. How many now? I know she's pregnant again. Three, including the belly bound one. Sailor studied him. So, the gazillion was a bit of an exaggeration then? He grinned. A little. There was a short pause. Between us, did you want kids? I mean, you kind of got blindsided with Tim, didn't you? Bodhi sighed. Not that isn't an exaggeration. The truth is, no. It was never an imperative in me to have kids. But Sailor, the second I knew Tim was mine, and look at us, I didn't even need a DNA test to prove paternity, something shifted in me, and I knew I would do anything for him. Sailor felt tears spring into her eyes and she looked away. Sailor King, are you crying? She shook her head but laughed as the tears escaped anyway. It's just the love in your voice just then. Tim is a lucky kid, no matter how he's hurting now. Bodhi half smiled but his eyes were troubled. He's hurting. He got left with a man he doesn't know, shoved into a life that most kids only dream about. His mom calls him, what, twice a week? I know she's going through some stuff, but... Sailor stopped herself, hearing the anger rising in her voice. This isn't about you, Sailor. Sorry, she said to him sheepishly. Not my business. Bodhi rubbed her back. You're a part of this family now, Sailor. You say what you feel whenever you feel like saying it. Sailor took a deep breath in and shot him a grateful look. I am sorry, though. 
But Bodhi, I think Tim needs time to be resentful if he wants. He'll come around in his own time. Tim was yawning now, and even though he was a whole ten years old and a big boy now, he crawled onto Sailor's lap and snuggled into her and fell asleep. Sailor, who was barely bigger than Tim herself, locked her arms around the boy, shooting a glance over to Bodhi, hoping his feelings wouldn't be hurt. Bodhi smiled at her, his eyes soft, and she saw no recrimination in his look. Instead, their gazes locked for a long moment before Tim murmured, fidgeting in his sleep, and broke the spell. Bodhi grinned, then got up to go to the bathroom. Sailor kissed the top of Tim's dark head and fantasized that yes, this was her family now. It was the early hours of the morning before they reached the villa on the island, and Bodhi carried his sleeping son to a bedroom off the main living area. Sailor went over to the huge glass sliding door on the opposite wall and slid it open. It led down to a small beach, and Sailor could hear the ocean lapping at the shore. Beautiful. She sighed, happily. I agree, she heard Bodhi and turned around, flushing when she realized he was looking at her and not the ocean. He came to stand beside her, putting his hand on her back. Are you tired? She nodded. Bodhi stroked her hair back from her face. The staff has made up all the beds, and there's air conditioning, thank God. Do you want a drink before bed? Sailor nodded. Okay. Bodhi grabbed a bottle of scotch and two glasses, then nodded out of the door. Let's sit by the ocean, we can hear if Tim starts yelling. The moon was full, so they had plenty of light as they sat side by side, drinking their scotch. Sailor made a face at first, but Bodhi just laughed. Keep sipping, it'll be your friend soon enough. Sure enough, she began to enjoy the sear of the liquid in her throat. She chuckled a little. What? Bodhi was studying her, a smile on his face. Sailor shook her head. If you only knew how much my life has changed in just one week, Bodhi. Hell in six months. Then tell me, he said gently. Sailor chewed on her lip for a while before answering. You were nearer the mark with Jim Jones, she began, not able to look at Bodhi. The commune, hell no, it's a cult, I have to start calling it that. The leader is a man called Bartholomew Foy. Yeah, she said, grinning at Bodhi's face, that's his real name as far as I know. But then again, I don't know if I believe anything about the man except one thing. What's that? Sailor felt sadness swim through her as she recalled the photos of her beloved Tilly being so brutally murdered. He's a monster. She whispered, her voice breaking. And he chose me to be his next bride. When I reached my womanhood. Your womanhood? She gave him a strange smile. In the cult, women aren't permitted to have physical relations until their 25th birthday. That's what it means. And when I reached mine, Bart was determined that I would be his. I disagreed and that's why I left. A clearly horrified Bodhi put his arm around her shoulders and kissed her temple. You don't ever have to be afraid of him again, sailor. I promise you that. She smiled gratefully up at him and again their gazes locked. This time she didn't look away. Bodhi moved closer but stopped himself. I think we need to get some sleep, he said lightly, and Sailor was at once both disappointed and relieved. He pulled her to her feet and held her hand as they walked back into the villa. I meant what I said, Bodhi told her as he showed her where her room was. You are part of this family now, Sailor. And whatever you want goes, okay? You need to know what freedom really is, and I will do anything in my power to protect you as long as you need me to. Thank you, Bodhi. He smiled down at her, and she so desperately wanted to kiss his mouth, it was a physical pain inside her. Good night, Sailor. Good night. Sailor shut the door, and Bodhi went to his own room, his emotions in turmoil. Sailor was a maiden. At twenty-five. And gosh, what the hell kind of messed up upbringing had she had? Bodhi took a cold shower and then slid into bed. He'd nearly broken all of his rules to and kissed her out there on the beach. He had to get her out of his head. But how? He didn't want to go back to the screwing around ways of his youth. And nor did he want to keep Sailor at arm's length. She was as important to him now as his own, shit man, what's wrong with you? You've known her a week. He sat up and tugged his laptop towards him, 
waiting for the browser to load hen typing in Bartholomew Foy. So many results but Bodhi first clicked on the man's photograph. A man in his early fifties, smart but with a sly look on his blandly handsome face. He flicked onto the man's website. The children of love welcomes you in their loving embrace. Gosh, he snorted but then as he scrolled down, his blood ran cold. A photograph of a much younger sailor, her eyes haunted, much thinner than she was now, was on the front page. Underneath, an open letter to her begging her to return to their fold. Bodhi read through it with growing horror. My dearest precious sailor, now that you have been gone from us for all these long months, I cannot bear the sadness that has come over all of us. You have left a chasm in our souls that cannot be replaced by anyone. Please, my darling girl, return to the people who loved you, raised you, nurtured you. Return to me, loveliest sailor, for I will be the husband of your dreams, just as I promised you. Just as I was to your friend and mentor, Tilly. If anyone sees my darling girl, please call us collect on 555-658-845 or email me at bartholomewfoy at childrenoflove.org or speak to one of our advisors at any one of our drop-in centers around the United States. Please help us find our beloved girl. Hashtag find sailor. Bodhi groaned softly. Geez, this man was a psychopath. Bodhi had seen way too many people like this in his line of work. Egotistical control freaks who used passive aggressive tricks like this to control people. Bodhi had no doubt that when that didn't work, Bartholomew Foy would turn to just plain old aggression. He had to find out more about this. One thing Bodhi knew for certain no way would Barty Foy ever, ever lay another hand on Sailor again. Sailor spluttered in indignation as Tim splashed seawater all over her as they played in the shallows. Bodhi stretched out on a sun lounger watched them with amusement, trying not to be too distracted by Sailor's curves and her yellow two-piece which looked striking against her golden skin. Hey old man, she yelled at him, and he grinned. Come play with us. He waved his hand. I don't to disturb your game. Sailor pulled a face then, grinning wickedly, whispered something in Tim's ear. The boy started to laugh, then covered his face to hide his giggles. They were obviously up to something. Sailor waded out of the water and strolled casually up the beach. Bodhi made no apology for admiring her body, and she caught the gleam in his eye. And you can stop that right now, she said tartly, then grinned. Come on, rock god, come show the great whites what a real man looks like. She took his hands and pulled him into a sitting position, but he refused to be pulled to his feet, instead laughing as Sailor, all five two of her, tried to pull his six five up. She must weigh a quarter of what I do, he thought, fondly, then yelped as something very slimy and very cold was slipped down the back of his swim trunks. Sailor let go immediately as he got to his feet, ramming his hand down to his butt and pull out a handful of seaweed from his shorts. Behind him, a giggle and he turned to see Tim, backing off but grinning at him. Sailor skittered over to Tim, both of them laughing at Bodhi, and took his hand. Bodhi looked between them and the handful of seaweed and stifled a laugh. Instead, he arranged his face into a warrior snarl and roared as he took off in hot pursuit of his tormentors. Tim and Sailor shrieked with laughter as he chased them back into the sea. Bodhi grabbed Tim and threw him up onto his shoulders as the child laughed. Bodhi grinned at him. Shall we get Sailor? Shall we? He advanced on Sailor who was giggling uncontrollably and backing off as they drew near. Tim gave a banshee scream, imitating his dad, and they both rushed her, tipping her over into the sea. She emerged, gasping for air and laughing. Bodhi thought he'd never seen a more beautiful sight. Gee, stop, man. Tim stood watching him, and he smiled at his son. Can you swim, Timbo? Tim waved his hand. A little bit. Not very much. Would you like me to teach you? Tim hesitated for a moment, then nodded but not in the ocean, Dad. At home, I would like that better. Bodhi's heart swelled, and he had to smile to hide the tears in his eyes. Wherever you want, sport. Later, after an exhausted Tim was sleeping, and after they'd all enjoyed a good meal of fresh fish and roast vegetables, they sat out on the beach again, the ever-present bottle of scotch between them. Bodhi turned to Sailor with shining eyes. He called me Dad, Sails. 
Sailor nudged his shoulder with hers. I know. I nearly cried. Me too. Bodhi's smile was incredulous. It's all down to you, Sails, all of it. If you hadn't. His voice broke and he cleared his throat, looking away. Sailor hesitated, then leaned down and pressed her lips against his bare shoulder, just briefly. She looked up at him. You saved my life, Bodhi. And no, it wasn't just me. I keep telling you, you're a great dad, a wonderful, warm, giving person. Most unlike a rock star, I must say. She made the joke to try and break the tension between them. Bodhi studied her. If you know how much I want to kiss you right now. Sailor's eyes took on a wary look, and he was sorry he'd said that. I apologize, Sailor. That was inappropriate. No. Her voice was soft. I feel it too, you know? I just, if it went wrong between us, I don't know how I would survive losing you. It's been a week. A week, Bodhi, and I'm feeling things I've never felt before. Things that were taken from me a long time ago, and I don't know if I'm capable of being the woman you need. She sighed, and Bodhi put his arm around her shoulders. She leaned into him, looking up at him. Gosh, she was so beautiful it made his heart hurt. What do you want, sailor? What can I give you to help you? She was silent for a long time, then looked up at him. Bodhi, you know that saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Bodhi nodded slowly. Sailor stood and held her hand out to him and pulled him up. He slid his arms around her waist. What you can give me, Bodhi, is you. In this moment. For this night. You must know I've never been with anyone by now, and I want to give it you. I've never been so sure of anything in my life. But what happens here on the island stays here. We won't let it affect our friendship, our working relationship. That's what you can give me. Bodhi bent his head and pressed his lips to hers, and it was sweeter than he had imagined. His fingers trailed up and down her spine, and she shivered, kissing him back with the same intense passion he was feeling. She was still wearing that yellow bikini, with a sarong tied around her waist. He took her hand and led her to his bedroom, closing the door behind him. Sailor looked nervous for a moment then as he approached, her arms curled around his neck. I'm scared, she whispered. Don't be, don't be scared. He kissed her. You're beautiful, sailor, and funny, and smart, and wonderful. Her eyes were soft with love, but she nodded. Bodhi, I meant what I said. I want to work with you and be your friend, and I don't want this to compromise anything. It won't, I swear. We make a good team, you and me, sails. I love that nickname. Bodhi grinned. You must have been called that before. She shook her head. In the cult, nicknames were frowned upon. And you changed your name legally when you came to California? She nodded. But it never stuck with me, it's just for official documents. Sailor was the one thing that came from my mother. She named me and that's who I am. Bodhi propped himself on his elbow and ran his palm down her belly. Do you remember her? Sailor considered for a moment. I think so, but I'm not entirely sure that it's a real memory or just a fantasy. I had one photograph of her, I looked just like her. What happened to her? Sailor's eyes grew sad. I don't know, no one would ever speak about her to me, Bart's orders, I think. What do you think happened? Did she run away and leave you? There was a long silence. No. I think he murdered her. The shock hit Bodhi full in the chest. What? Sailor met his gaze. I don't know for sure. What I do know is that he did murder his second wife, Tilly. She was my teacher and my best friend. She lived under his control for too long just to take care of us. When she fell in love with someone else, he had her killed. In front of her lover. Jeez. Bodhi felt his heart pounding. You know this for sure? She nodded. He showed me photographs of the murder, just before I was supposed to marry him. The photographs showed two men, I'd never seen them before, but one was holding Tilly down, the other was stabbing her to death. Gosh, Bodhi, the fear, the pain in her eyes, and then the last photo they showed her body on the ground, drenched in blood, and her lover tied to a chair, sobbing. 
I don't know what happened to him, I assume they killed him too. Bodhi was beyond horrified, and he wrapped himself around Sailor. She'd been through hell. Why did he show you the photos? Why would he admit to it? She smiled at him sadly. To show me what would happen to me if I defied him. Gosh no. No. Bodhi squeezed his eyes shut, trying to scourge the images of Sailor being stabbed to death, of her blood being spilled. He felt her touch his face. Don't look so sad. I escaped, I'm here. Bodhi touched his forehead to hers. Sailor, I promise you, I will keep you safe if it's the last thing I do in this world. He'll never touch you again. Do you know if he's looking for you? She gave a humorless laugh. Oh yes. Bartholomew Foy is never defied, not least by a woman. If he finds me, I'm a dead woman, of that I have no doubt. No. No way. That's never going to happen, baby, never. She smiled up at him. You just called me baby. I know. Sailor, I know it's fast, but I have never had such an immediate connection with anyone. I'm not bullshitting. In my world, I understand that me saying that could be misconstrued as a line, but I mean it sincerely. I want to see where this takes us. Sailor nodded. You have a hero complex. She said it softly, with a smile. Bodhi blinked but smiled. You think? She chuckled. A little. I can see it in your face, you want to save me. And you know what? That's okay, as long as you remember I have agency in my own life, and that as much as you want to save me, I want to save you. Can we be equals, Bodhi? Or is this all a little heavy for you, so soon? Because never again will I allow myself to be dictated to by anyone, even by someone I adore. Bodhi was impressed. Sailor, you have an old soul. Of course, anything. And just so you know, I adore you too. Tim is crazy about you, so at least I know I have something in common with him. Sailor laughed. You made leaps and bounds today. Bodhi kissed her. Entirely down to you, beautiful lady. He covered her body with his. And now, allow me to show you just how grateful I am. In the morning, Sailor slipped back to her own room before Tim awoke. She and Bodhi had decided that was best for now. They would be affectionate in front of the boy, ease him into getting used to the budding relationship. If that's what it is, Sailor murmured to herself as she showered and dressed in denim shorts and an oversized white shirt. Her life had changed so much in the last 24 hours, she couldn't help feel shell-shocked, and at the same time happy. She wondered at the new feeling. She couldn't regret anything that had happened between herself and Bodhi, regardless of her reservations. Dad says we're going hiking today, in the forest. There's a waterfall. Sailor sat down, smiling at him and Bodhi, who leaned over and kissed her cheek, whispering in her ear. You're beautiful. She flushed a little, pleasure streaming through her body. She turned to Tim. That sounds like fun. Maybe we should take a picnic with us? Tim nodded eagerly. I have a backpack we can put food in. Maybe some cans of soda? He looked hopefully at Bodhi, who limited his son's sugary drinks. Bodhi laughed at the plaintive glance his son gave him. Hey kiddo, we're on vacation, anything goes. He gave a surreptitious wink to Sailor, who chuckled. As they trekked in the island's thick forests, Bodhi watched his son and Sailor as they chatted easily and explored the island's flora and fauna. He grinned as Sailor skittered away from a tarantula that Tim, showing no fear, picked up and inspected. He's so fluffy, Tim exclaimed, but Sailor grimaced. And he'll be fluffy right back where you found him too, she said, and grinning, Tim put the spider back into the undergrowth. Sailor shuddered. Arachnophobe, hey? I learn something new every day. Bodhi told her, and Sailor shrugged. Snakes, lizards, other bugs don't bother me. It's just spiders and especially ones that big. Geez, you could have put a saddle on that one. She shuddered again and Bodhi grinned, taking her hand. They walked further into the forest until they came to a swimming hole. Another couple was there with their son and Tim got talking to him. Soon both boys were dive-bombing into the swimming hole. 
Sailor and Bodhi got talking to the other couple, but soon Bodhi nodded to Sailor. Shall I go get some beers for us and cold drinks for the boys? The other man nodded. Sounds good, there's a bar just about half a mile through the forest there. Do you want some company? Sailor got to her feet. I'll help you, if you don't mind watching the boys. She addressed the other couple, who both nodded. No problem and thanks. Let me know how much we owe you for the beers. Bodhi grinned. Don't worry about my treat. See you in a few. Timbo. Tim looked up. We're going to get some cold drinks. Mike and Hannah will be watching you for a few minutes, is that okay? Tim nodded. Sure, Dad. He immediately went back to playing with the other boy, Maddie. Sailor nudged Bodhi's shoulder as they set off, hand in hand. Every time he calls you dad, you glow, you know that? Bodhi grinned sheepishly. I do, I have no chill. He stopped and kissed her. You must think I'm a useless rock star. No drugs, no whoring around anymore anyway, and I get high from my kid calling me dad. Sailor kissed him back. The good thing about living in a sect is that I don't know an awful lot about the life of a rock star. Obviously, since I've been out, I've learned much more, but I don't have preconceived ideas about what you should be like. I just know Bodhi, not Bodhi Creed, rock star. He took her face in her hands. With you, I can really be myself for the first time, he whispered. I don't have to pretend I'm anything but a middle-aged man, fumbling around, trying to be the best father, and now the best boyfriend I can be. Sailor blinked. Boyfriend? Was this really happening? Bodhi was studying her. Did I just freak you out? A little, she admitted, but then she smiled. But I liked it. They made their way back to the swimming hole, carrying the drinks, and spent a blissful afternoon chatting with Mike and Hannah and their son. Tim seemed more relaxed than Bodhi had ever seen him, and when, on the way back to the villa in the early evening, Tim took his hand, Bodhi could have cried with happiness. It was with regret that they piled back onto the private jet that evening. Tim was chatting away to Sailor at first, but then he fell asleep, after moaning that Bodhi wouldn't let him skip school in the morning. That was the deal, buddy. Luxury for the weekend, but then it's back to normal. Tim grumbled, but Bodhi could sense the change in their relationship. He put a blanket over his sleeping son and smiled at Sailor. You tire too, baby? A little, but for all the right reasons. He went to sit next to her and wrapped his arms around her. I permit her glad. Look, we both know we're going to have to navigate this thing. The last thing I want is for us being together, causing you any pain or misgivings. There's something else too. The press. Sailor, they hound me when it comes to relationships, and if they even get a whiff of this, they'll come after you. So, we need to figure out how this is going to work. Sailor's eyes were wide. I never even considered that, God. If they print my photo, Bart will know where I am. Yes. That's my biggest fear. So we need to plan. I have an idea, but it may seem weird to you. Sailor drew in a long breath. Hit me with it. I enter into a fake relationship for the press. Now, I know who to ask, and I'm pretty sure she'll go along with it, but it would depend on you. Who? Soleil. Sailor nodded, trying not to be jealous, but she couldn't help it. Soleil was gorgeous. Bodhi saw her reservations in her eyes. Sales, I'm not Soleil's type, I swear. You might be, but I'm most definitely not. Sailor was surprised. She's gay? Very. But she's also very private and doesn't broadcast her relationships. Luckily, art dealers aren't great fodder for gossip, unless you're a Mallory or a Bartoli. I have no idea who they are, she grinned truthfully, and he laughed. Well, see? Anyway, the press is used to seeing me with Solly and Claudio, so the interest will be minimal, but at least they'll think we're together and not focus on you. Sailor sat up and nodded. Well, if Soleil would go along with it, but I wouldn't want to inconvenience her. To keep you safe I would, Bodhi said fervently, but then he relaxed. I was thinking, if anyone asks, we could say you're the family's assistant, Tim's tutor. 
Bodhi was uncertain, but Sailor nodded. That suits me. Bodhi stroked her face. Maybe you should move in. It'll be safer as well as, I'm selfish, I want you near. Sailor chewed on her lip, and Bodhi nodded. You have doubts. It's not that I can't see the sense of it, but I just got my own place after years of being segregated. I do want to be close to you and Tim, I do. Can I think about it? Bodhi nuzzled his nose to hers. Of course. I understand, I do. Look, I have a suggestion for you to think about. You love the guest house, right? As I said before, it's yours, your own place. You want privacy, you just go off and lie in there. I know it's not the same, but you'll be within my compound and safe. Security won't be intrusive, I swear. But only if you want to be there. Don't let me sway you, either way, that's not how we work. Sailor kissed him. You are just the sweetest guy. We're going to make it, I swear, Sailor. I will do anything to make this work. He kissed her then, until they were both panting for breath. Stay tonight. It'll be late when we get home anyway. You can sleep in the guest house if you want, but stay. She fell asleep in his arms and woke up as the plane landed. Sailor's mind was whirling with the events of the past two days and their plans for going forward. Could they make it work? She hoped so with all of her heart. Tim was asleep when Bodhi carried him to his room and Sailor went over to the guest house and dumped her bag in there. Switching on the lamps in the house, she looked around it. Yes, she could imagine living here. Its comforting, slightly shabby beach house feel was a reminder of their heavenly time on the island. In the morning, she awoke in the big double bed in the guest house, alone. On the other pillow, she found a note. Making breakfast for us all. Take your time, come in when you're ready, my darling. He'd drawn a rough love heart at the end, which made Sailor smile. She showered and dressed in a t-shirt and jeans. As she dried her hair, she gazed at her reflection. You are the luckiest girl in the world, Sailor King. She still couldn't reconcile how much her life had changed. When she walked into the kitchen, Bodhi was at the stove, breaking eggs into a skillet. He grinned at her and kissed her cheek. They'd agreed not to kiss in front of Tim, yet. Let him get used to the idea of us first, Sailor had said, and Bodhi agreed. Tim was scarfing down pancakes like they were going extinct. You okay, buddy? Sailor ruffled his hair. Tim grinned. Sailor, Dad said you're going to live in the guest house if you want to. Sailor shot Bodhi a glance, and he winked at her. She snickered to herself, trust Bodhi to get Tim on his side, then smiled at Tim. You okay with that? Sure I am, he said, beaming. I like having you here. So does Dad. He's got that right. Bodhi looked at Sailor with such a look of desire on his face that Sailor felt a flush creeping over her entire body. Dad? Bodhi dumped some eggs on two plates for him and Sailor. Yeah, buddy. Can Sailor take me to school today? Bodhi and Sailor exchanged a look. The Bodhi smiled at his son. Why don't you ask Sailor? Tim looked at her, and she nodded. Of course I'd love to. But, can we take your RAV4? I'd feel too inconspicuous in the Thunderbird. Bodhi stuck his hand in his pocket and pulled out a set of car keys. Go crazy. Actually, don't go crazy, drive safely. They all laughed at him, and then Tim put down his fork. I'll go get my school bag. He hopped off the kitchen stool and disappeared into his bedroom. Bodhi immediately leaned over and kissed Sailor's mouth. Good morning, beautiful. She pressed her lips back to his. Good morning, handsome. They kissed softly, enjoying the feel of the other's lips. Gosh, I want you when you get back from dropping Tim at school. Sailor grinned at him. We do have work to do, Mr. Creed. He groaned in disappointment. Screw work. I'd rather be with you, she said mischievously, and he laughed. Bad girl. She leaned close to him. Bodhi grabbed her head and kissed her passionately. As she drove up to the school, Tim grinned at her. Want to come say hi to some of my friends? Sailor hesitated but figured it couldn't hurt. Tim was obviously keen on showing her off. Sailor was glad she had shoved her long dark hair into a baseball cap. 
She was reminded of the wigs she had stolen from the bridal boutique when she escaped from Monica, the wigs that had gotten her to California safe and unrecognized. It sent a thrill of fear through her, but she shook it off. That life is over. She parked the car and got out with Tim. He ran ahead and started to talking to some friends who stood with their moms. Tim introduced her to his best friend Harry and Harry's mom Diane. Diane greeted her warmly. Are you new to the area? Sailor shook her head. Just to the job, she lied smoothly. I'm Tim's childminder. She's my friend and my daddy's friend, Tim said, nodding his head wisely. Sailor touched his head. Saying that, I need to get back to work. You okay, sport? Tim nodded, already running off with Harry as the school bell rang. Thanks for the ride, Sailor. See you later. Sailor nodded to Diane and with some relief, got back in the car and drove back to the compound. Bodhi was on the phone when she entered, putting his keys down on the kitchen counter. He grinned up at her. Hey, she's here, I'm going to put you on speakerphone. He flicked a button and Sailor heard Soleil greeting her. Hey girl, I hear you're off the market? Sailor flushed but laughed. Apparently. How are you, Soleil? Call me Sally and I'm good, thanks. I'm in Italy at the moment, but back in LA at the weekend to start our little ruse. You sure you're okay with this? Sailor gave Bodhi a nervous glance. Hell yes, I'm delighted. About time someone of quality tickled Bodhi's pickle. I will obviously have to give you the if you hurt him blah 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 talk. Sailor laughed. Obviously, I would expect nothing less. Thank you, Solly, you're the best. Yes, yes, I am, laughed the other woman. I'll see you two crazy kids at the weekend. She clicked off, and then Bodhi grinned at Sailor. She's in. This is happening. Suddenly Sailor started to tremble. This man, this gorgeous man, was hers. How could that be possible? Sailor. Bodhi came to her, gently pulling her into his arms. It's me and you now, okay? She nodded, gazing up into his achingly beautiful face. His lips were against hers then. I'm going to take you to my bed now, Sailor King, work can wait, and he led her into his bedroom. Are you sure? Diane nodded. I mean, she had her hair up, but I'm pretty sure. Those doe eyes are unmistakable. Bartholomew Foy was pleased. Thank you, Diane, you have proved most helpful. Diane smiled at him and left the room, closing the door behind her. Bart looked at Salem, who was grinning nastily. They had flown to L.A. as soon as the call from Diane, one of the highest members of the Californian chapter of the Children of Love, had called in the sighting. So, Sailor's working for Bodhi Creed? Well, well, well. Salem chuckled. Should be easy enough to find and kill her if she's bringing the kid to school every day. Indeed. Bart was lost in thought. But, I have a better idea. Sailor betrayed us all, so it's only right that we make her suffer before I kill her. This Creed jerk, what do we know? Salem sighed. Sometimes his boss truly was clueless about the world outside the sect. He's untouchable, boss. He has a compound up in the Hollywood Hills, security guards, the whole shebang. When Sailor's there, she'll be untouchable too. Bart tapped his chin with his finger. Is she sleeping with him, I wonder? Sailor? Sail looked skeptical. I doubt it. We'll soon find out if she is. Until then, maybe we should keep a low profile. Our contact at the passport office said her name is Sarah Halls now. See where Sarah Halls uses her credit card, plot out a timetable of what she does and when she does it. See if we can't get a mole on Creed's security team. Will do. Boss, what's your end game here? Bart laughed softly. Haven't I made it obvious? Sailor, my beautiful precious sailor, doesn't get to see her 26th birthday. Sailor sat in the cab with Bodhi as the vehicle moved through the crowded streets of San Francisco. They were on their way to Quartet's SF office, and Sailor was so excited that she thought she might throw up any minute. Her good mood rubbed off on Bodhi, who held her hand as they traveled. You do know that Bay won't be there today, right? Sailor grinned at him. Spoilsport. 
but I would have met her by osmosis, been in the same room of some of her friends. Groupie. You know it. She giggled as he kissed her. At the airy and minimalistic offices, they were shown to the boardroom, and soon after, a smiling blonde woman came in, casually but expensively dressed in designer jeans and a gorgeous lilac top. She shook both their hands and introduced herself as Emily Moore to Sailor. Bodie has already raved about you, she said, sitting down, so this would be a piece of cake. Sailor smiled at her. I hope so, I've already told him Quartet is the best home for his music, but what do I know? Bodhi chuckled. She's madly in love with Bay, so ignore her. She's biased. Emily laughed. Well, Bay has that effect, and actually you're in luck. She's in town at the moment, so if you're both free for dinner tonight. Sailor thought she might faint and Bodhi laughed. We can be. Tim's staying over at a friend's tonight. Then it's settled. Now, Dash is unfortunately tied up with another artist today, but Roman will be along to sweeten the deal in a while. Shall we start? After a morning of discussing contracts and recording sessions, Sailor's energy was high. Even though she knew so little, just listening to the passion with which Bodhi talked about music, and hearing the ways the company could benefit from Bodhi's talent and input, got her blood pumping. Music had been her saving grace in the cult, her only way of escape, until she actually did escape, and it would always be a guiding force, but until now, she never dreamed she would actually be involved in the industry, albeit as Bodhi's assistant. Roman Ford joined them eventually, and Sailor liked him immediately. He was a quiet, serious man, but when he smiled, she could see into his personality. She knew he was in a relationship with Kim Clayton, another member of the Ninth and Pine, and listened with interest when he spoke about the band and the company, to Bodhi. We absolutely are a family business here, Bodhi. We don't take on anyone we don't find to fit with our aesthetic. On the other hand, when we do spot that in an artist, we pursue them aggressively, as you've probably noticed from this one. He nodded his head towards Emily, who grinned, unrepentant. Bodhi laughed. I had an inkling. Listen, I've been with Sony since the beginning, and I'm nothing if not loyal, but both they and I know it's the end of our story together. I've not felt so motivated by a company's attitude to my work as I have today. I'm in if you'll take me. Roman smiled. Good. Now, I hear you're joining us for dinner tonight? Bodhi nodded, looking to Sailor who smiled broadly. Absolutely. Hey, you know if we can get a hotel room around here on short notice? Emily nodded. It's no problem. She hesitated. One or two rooms? Sailor flushed bright red and Bodhi smiled. If the press asks too. Between us, we'll only need the one. Emily's smile was soft. Gotcha. She squeezed Sailor's hand and then got up. We'll get that arranged right now, so you can go rest up before dinner. Sailor was suddenly panicked. I don't have any clothes or toiletries or spare under. She trailed off, blushing furiously as Roman, trying to not grin, cleared his throat. Bodhi put his arm around her. Sweetheart, we can go shopping, don't worry about it. Two hours later, in the penthouse suite of their hotel, Sailor groaned. I looked like such a yokel. Bodhi was grinning as he dumped their shopping bags on the bed. You did not, it was adorable. She groaned and he pulled her into his arms. Sailor, they loved you. I think they liked you better than they liked me. I know I do. She chuckled. You're just saying that. Aga. Don't ever move from this place, he said softly, you're perfect. Gosh, she wanted to tell him that she was in love with him, but it was way, way too soon for that. But it was true. She knew it bone deep. She was in love with Bodhi Creed. Sailor nearly keeled over as Bay Tamba, obviously very pregnant but radiant with beauty, hugged her. It's so good to meet you, the other woman told her and grinned. Here, sit next to me, I think Tomas is getting tired of me. Tomas Mayer, another one of Quartet's CEOs and Bay's husband rolled his eyes. Yup, I often get tired of you, Bubba. That's how you got in that condition. He grinned at his wife and sat on her other side, his hand stroking her back. 
Sailor smiled, a little nervous. Bay Tambo was a superstar now, the lead singer of the Ninth and Pine, but as the meal progressed, she couldn't be more down to earth. Sailor was even more in love by the time Bay excused herself to go to the bathroom. She looks so well, Bodhi said to Tomas, who smiled, but his smile didn't reach his eyes. Dash, Emily's boyfriend, a very pretty young man, frowned. What is it, Tom? Tim sighed, and Sailor suddenly noticed the strain on his face. Stu Lawson just escaped from prison today. Emily gave a distressed gasp. Gosh no, dot how the hell did that happen? Tomas nodded, his eyes heavy. The police won't tell me any more details than that. They've kept it out of the press for their own reasons, and I haven't told Bay yet. Sailor didn't know what they were talking about. She looked at Bodhi, who gave her a slight shake of his head and bent his head to whisper in her ear. I'll tell you later. Emily was speaking to Tom. Did you ever tell her about the letters? Tom shook his head, then looked up and smiled as Bay came back to the table. She seemed to notice the change in atmosphere. What's up? Tom grinned. Nothing, it's just we missed you. Bay laughed, and Dash pretended to gag. Bay swatted his head but seemed satisfied with Tom's answer. He pulled her onto his lap and kissed her, and Sailor saw the love in his eyes. It was the same way Bodhi looked at her. Gosh, am I projecting? Is it because I so desperately want him to love me? She felt Bodhi's hand close around hers. As they left the restaurant, Bay took Sailor's cell phone and programmed her own number in. Call me anytime, Sailor. I mean it. Back at the hotel, Bodhi poured them both some champagne. A few years ago, when the band had first signed to quartet, they had a manager called Stu Lawson. He was Kim's boyfriend at the time, and he was abusive, he beat her, constantly. He and Bay always had a fractious relationship. Long story short, Kim left him, Bay fired him, and Stu shot Bay three times and left her for dead. He abducted and almost killed Kim, too. Bay nearly didn't make it. Sailor was shocked to her core. Gosh, I had no idea. Bodhi half smiled. You really were sheltered, huh? Sailor nodded. We were only allowed certain news, and now I think about it, the only crime stories we were ever allowed to know about were the ones either committed by a woman, to show us how evil we were as a gender, or by men who said that the woman drove him to it. Bodhi looked angry. Geez. Seriously, Sales, if I ever get my hands on Bart Foy. She took his hand. I don't want to talk about him. Not after such a lovely day. Bodhi leaned over and kissed her. Good plan, it has been a great day, and it's about to get better. You are my world, sailor, my world. When she had finally fallen asleep in his arms, Bodhi Creed made a decision. He thought about how Tom had looked in the restaurant, telling them that his love's life may once again be in danger. It was how he had felt when Sailor told him that if Bart Foy found her, she would be a dead woman. That wasn't going to happen because Bodhi Creed was going to take Bart Foy and the Children of Love down. Tim squinted at Sailor as she sat at the edge of the pool, a stack of paperwork and her laptop beside her. Sales, when are you going to stop working and come play with us? Sailor grinned at him. Bodhi was trying to teach Tim to swim, but apparently they both found her way too distracting. When I'm done, impatient boy. Boys, she added, grinning at Tim's father who was eyeing her lasciviously. Timbo, when you can swim an entire length without your dad holding your swim trunks, I'll come in. A whole length? Come on, Tim groaned, flopping backward in the water and pouting. It had been a month since their trip to San Francisco, and every day, as far as Sailor was concerned, her life got better. Tim and Bodhi were really bonding now, and since Bodhi had started teaching Tim to swim, albeit between fooling around, Tim was gaining confidence. Sailor was staying most nights at the guest house now. Most of her stuff had naturally migrated over from the tiny studio apartment. Bodhi had asked on, on one of his nightly visits to her bed, why she didn't give up the apartment. Sailor had grinned and told him, because I like that I have the choice where to sleep. It means a lot to me. And Bodhi got it, and never once tried to persuade her to give the studio up. Every minute they spent in bed, Sailor began to feel more feminine, 
more confident. Bodhi worshipped her body as if he couldn't have any other woman in the world, when clearly he could. It still blew Sailor's mind. And she loved working for him, with him, she corrected, as Bodhi had insisted they were a partnership, not boss employee. Getting more involved with organizing his next tour, not for a year or so or until Tim was completely settled, he'd insisted. Talking to Emily and often Bay too, Sailor began to feel as if she were growing competent in his world too. She loved chatting with both women, and sometimes Tom who would call out things when Bay had her on speakerphone, mostly making fun of his huge wife. Bay was close to giving birth now, their third child. Bay and Tom's twin daughters, Esme and Millie, were already five and causing their parents' hair to turn gray, Bay claimed, but Sailor could hear the love in her voice. Bay told her that she had some experience with rock star parents. Kim's mother and father were Charlie and Mac Clayton, who were huge in the 80s and weren't present for most of Kim's childhood. It affected Kim's confidence to a large degree, Bay told Sailor. I sometimes think it was the reason she stayed with Stu for so long, Bay told her, and Sailor was surprised that she was so open about the man who had tried to kill her. Bodhi told me what happened. I'm so sorry, Bay. Bay sighed. It was a long time ago, Sales. I'm not saying I'll ever forget it, but it's behind me. Sailor hesitated. I have some experience with abusive men. I'm sorry to hear that. Do you want to talk about it? And to her amazement, Sailor told Bay everything, about Tilly, about her mother, about Bart. Bay was shocked, and Sailor could hear how upset she was, even over the phone. Oh gosh, Sales, I'm so sorry. Thank you, but I only told you because I want to be there for you if you ever need someone who knows, you know? She heard Bay stifle a sob. Forgive me, Sales, my hormones are making me squirrely. Thank you though, and I hope it goes without saying, the same goes for you. Any time. Sailor heard a young girl's voice them. Mama, why are you crying? Baby hormones, sweeties. Go find your sister, and I'll make you a snack. Esme, Bay said to Sailor, seriously that girl is the reincarnation of Sherlock Holmes, never misses a trick. I'm hoping the snack will distract her from telling Tom I was crying. Always worked for me, Bay chuckled, and Sailor was glad to hear her more cheerful. Food is the way to go, always, she agreed, and after they had said goodbye, she went into the kitchen to make Tim a snack for when he got home. More and more, she had fallen into the role of mother, and she found she liked it. Sometimes, she had to remind herself that she wasn't his mom, that he had a real mom who still called him every week, still loved him. So she had to be careful but gosh she adored the kid and he adored her. She heard Bodhi calling for her and went to find him. He was in the bedroom, trying to decide on a tie. Tonight was the first time he was on a date with Soleil, an arts benefit in Hollywood, and now Sailor admired him in a suit. Gosh you're a handsome man, she grinned up at him. Go with the blue. It brings out the green in those peepers of yours. He grinned at her and kissed her, picking up the blue tie. Are you sure you're going to be okay with Tim, alone here? She helped him put on the tie. Hell yes. We're going to eat MSG and watched R-rated movies all night. Then we'll play with your guitars at full volume, wake the neighbors. Bodhi laughed. You are a bad, bad girl. Sailor started to sing Fiona Apple's Criminal. I've been a bad, bad girl, I've been careless with a delicate man. She danced around as he tried to grab her. Eventually, he got hold of her and kissed her. And you can sing, damn it. How come you never told me? She snorted. Yeah, if I had a ton of auto-tune. No, seriously, sing some more for me. Sailor stuck out her tongue and then sang Puff the Magic Dragon, deliberately out of key. Bode laughed, shaking his head. Well played. But we will be returning to this topic. Ha! You'd have to get me good and drunk before I sing for you, big guy. Soleil hugged Sailor. Now look, if you see photos of us kissing, just remember A, I'll be pretending it's you, and B, I'll be throwing up almost immediately afterward. Sailor laughed out loud as Bodhi rolled his eyes. Stop hitting on my girlfriend, Solly. Soleil grinned widely and Sailor gave Bodhi a mock look. No, don't stop hitting on his girlfriend, Solly. 
She grabbed Soleil and landed a big kiss on her soft lips. Soleil was shocked at first then laughed. You're right, sailor, The Hills Have Eyes is on Netflix. He said nonchalantly then giggled when Bodhi's eyes bugged out. Chill dad, we're just teasing you. You see what I have to put up with? Bodhi said to Sali, who was cackling with laughter. Come on, Sol, before these two drive me crazy. Sailor and Tim had a great evening, lounging on Bodhi's huge sofas, chatting and watching one of Sailor's favorite movies, Clueless. Sailor explained to Tim that it was a modern version of Jane Austen's Emma. Tim looked blank and Sailor rolled her eyes. Don't they teach you anything at that school? Wait a sec, and she went over to her guest house, her home now, and grabbed a copy of the book from her shelf. As she was walking back to the main house, she heard someone call her name and turned. It was Udo, one of Bodhi's security team. Everything all right, Ms. Halls? They had agreed she would be Sarah Halls, to everyone except those very close to them. Sailor smiled at him. Yes, thanks Udo, just grabbing a book for Tim. Udo nodded. Have a good night, ma'am. Thanks, Udo. Tim was waiting by the glass door, and she handed him the book. There you go. You have any problems reading it, let me know. Tim thanked her, but he seemed distracted. You okay, slugger? She put a hand on his dark head. I don't like that guy. Who? Udo. Tim nodded. He gives me the creeps. Sailor frowned and closed the door behind her. Let's go sit, Timbo. When they were back on the couch, Sailor studied the boy. Why don't you like him? Has he said or done anything to you? Sailor's heart was in her mouth. Because if he has, you can tell me or your dad and we'll make things right, darling. You never have to worry about him again. Has anything happened? Tim shook his head. No. Nothing like that, it's just, he looks at you and I don't like it. He looks at me. Tim looked away, his face flushing. He thinks you're pretty. Sailor, relieved, hit a grin. Well, he has terrible taste, what can you do? Don't worry about it, buddy. Tim didn't look satisfied with that. Sailor? Yeah, babe? Tim hesitated for a moment. Are you my daddy's girlfriend? Sailor felt a rush of heat on her face, but she nodded. Yes, darling, I am. But it's a secret, you know? Because otherwise people and the papers will never leave us alone. Auntie Sally is pretending to be your dad's girlfriend to fool them. So if you don't mind, don't tell anyone that your dad and I are together, please. Do you think you can do that? Tim nodded. Sure. He smiled. I am glad you're his girlfriend, Sailor, I love you. Sailor felt tears in her eyes. I love you too, buddy. She gave him a high five. Now what film shall we watch next? Bodhi kissed Soleil's cheek. Thanks for tonight, Solly, you really are the best. Soleil grinned, her beautiful face lighting up. Any chance for shenanigans, you know me. Hey listen, for what it's worth, I adore Sailor. She's the one for you, I know it in my bones. Don't mess it up. Bodhi chuckled softly. I know, and don't worry. There's no way. Sally studied him. You're already in love, aren't you? He nodded, completely unfazed. Entirely. My family is complete, I have no doubt. Sally hugged him. I'm so glad. Listen, I have a very, very pretty nurse waiting for me at my hotel, so if you don't mind. Listen, in a couple of weeks we're flying out to Florence, want a ride? Sally nodded. Claudio's already invited me. Hell yes saves me flying business class with douchebags. Call me in the morning. I will. And thanks again for tonight. No problems. Good night. She grinned at him and got into her Mercedes. Go in there and screw a gorgeous girl. I know that's what I'm going to do tonight. Bodhi was still laughing when he waved her off, then strolled down to the security guard's cabin. He stuck his head in the door. Hey Udo, you got stuck with night duty this week, huh? Udo smiled. I did, Mr. Creed. All's quiet this evening. Thanks, Udo. And call me Bodhi for God's sake. 
I'm already feeling old. Mr. Creed was my dad. Yes, sir. Udo. Sorry. Yes, Bodhi. Bodhi grinned. Good man. Good night. Night. Bodhi walked into the house to find Sailor and Tim asleep on the couch, Sailor's arms around the boy and his head resting on her shoulder. Bodhi couldn't help taking a sneaky photo, they looked too adorable. The flash didn't wake Tim, but Sailor opened an eye and grinned. Sorry, Bodhi whispered, bending to kiss her, I couldn't resist. Which gives me an idea, but perhaps we should put Tim to bed first. Sailor smiled, and Bodhi lifted Tim into his arms and carried him to bed. Tim didn't even stir. I slipped him a mickey, Sailor whispered with a grin, he should be well out. Bodhi chuckled at her joke. He takes after his paw, I could sleep like that when I was young. Not now. He turned to her and stroked her face. I have better things to do than sleep nowadays. He brushed his lips against hers lightly. Stay with me tonight in my bed. Sailor tangled her fingers in his dark curls. Tim knows about us. He asked me outright if I was your girlfriend, and I told him I was. He seemed to be happy about it. Bodhi grinned down at her. Another way he takes after his dad. So you'll stay. It's time Tim gets used to you being here full time. Sailor nodded and Bodhi led her to his room, closing the door behind him. Luckily his room was on the other side of the house to Tim's. Sailor pushed his tuxedo jacket from his shoulders. I almost don't want you to take this off, she said, her eyes lazy with desire. You make it look better than any other man in the world. Gosh, you're incredible. Soleil kissed Hedda, her date, and got up to go to the bathroom. She paused in the doorway, knowing the light from the bathroom would silhouette her perfect shape, and looked back over her shoulder. Don't you dare move. Hedda smiled. Gosh, Soleil was gorgeous and a mind-blowing. She wondered how many men had set their sights on the beautiful art dealer only to be crushed when they released she wasn't straight. Hedda waited until Soleil closed the bathroom door before she grabbed her cell phone and tapped out a quick message. She's here. In a second, the reply came back. Good. Stay close. Hedda smiled and dropped the phone back into her purse. Hedda hoped that Bartholomew Foy only wanted Soleil to get to Sailor and Bodhi. She really hoped that Soleil wouldn't be considered a loose end. Part 3 Sailor's excitement about flying across the Atlantic Ocean was infectious. Both Bodhi and Tim were grinning as she gaped out of the jet window at the ocean below. How come you've never gone on holiday abroad, Sailor? Did your mom and dad not take you? Sailor and Bodhi exchanged a look, then Sailor smiled at Tim. No, Pumpkin, I didn't have parents, I lived in a kind of um special place, where kids without parents sometimes grow up. Tim looked thoughtful. Like a children's home? Sailor hesitated. Something like that. Hey kiddo, Bodhi rescued her, who do you think Auntie Sally is on the phone to for this long? Tim grinned as Soleil, cell phone clamped to her ear, stuck out her tongue. One of her girlfriends, Tim said wisely, but Solly shook her head, giving him a smile but holding up a finger to ask for a moment more. Sailor sat back into Bodhi's arms and felt him press his lips to her temple. They were on the way to Italy to stay with Solly's brother, Claudio, Bodhi's best friend. Claudio was an artist and worked mainly from a farmhouse in the middle of the Tuscan countryside. Bodhi's mother, despairing that Bodhi preferred music to art as he grew up, had mentored Claudio from a young age, and now they frequently collaborated. While Vittoria Creed was mainly retired now, Claudio's stock was rising fast in the art world, mainly thanks to his sister's tireless work on his behalf. Claudio liked art, his friends and screwing, he didn't like networking. Soleil handled that side of things, arranging exhibitions, making sure Claudio's name was on everyone's lips. Sailor couldn't wait until they landed. She'd never dreamed she'd be going to Europe. Even after she'd escaped the cult, she had thought it an impossible goal. She hadn't anticipated she would fall in love with a billionaire. Money was been the one thing she was uncomfortable with in her relationship with Bodhi. 
He had continued to pay her salary and frequent huge bonuses even after they had become a couple, and Sailor didn't know how she felt about that. When Bodhi had told her he had put her name on his bank account, she got scared. Bodhi no, it's too much, too soon. But he wouldn't hear any argument. It's just money, Sales. There's so much more important things in life, like how much I love you. Money doesn't come into it. That's because you have it, Sailor had thought, but stayed silent. She had talked to Bay Tamba about knowing, knowing she had married the already rich Tom Mayer. Bay had sympathized. Girl, believe me, I know how you feel. It went against all my sensibilities to accept that Tom is rich, and by default then, so was I. It never goes away, but I found little ways to try and redress the balance. When the girls came along, that all shifted to the back of my mind. I didn't care how much we spent on them, I wanted to give them the best start. That being said, they still have to do chores for pocket money, and we've tried to teach them the value of money. They're pretty sensible, they take after Tom like that. Sailor had laughed. I'd love to meet them one day. You definitely will. Sailor heard Bay shift and groaned a little. You okay? Bay laughed. Yep, just the size of a house. Any day now, this little slugger's going to make an appearance. Excited? Like you wouldn't believe. Sailor thought about Bay now, knowing by the time they got back from their month in Italy that Bay would have had the baby. Bodhi nudged her. Spacing out? She grinned up at him. Thinking about Bay. You know that saying, you should never meet your heroes? She disapproves that theory. And then there's you. She kissed his mouth gently. You were my hero the moment I met you, Bodhi Creed. His eyes were soft with love. And you were mine, Sales. He bent his head and put his mouth next to her ear. You know, Claudio has made up a bedroom for us in a converted workshop at the far end of his property. Very secluded and almost soundproofed. You have no idea of the things I'm going to do to you there. Sailor shivered and shot a glance at Tim and Solly, but they were both deep in conversation with each other. And I, she said in a low, sultry voice, have brought some toys we can play with. Bodhi's eyes widened. Naughty girl. Sailor grinned. I am what you made me, Creed. It was late by the time their town car pulled up outside the farmhouse, and Claudio Fonseca came to meet them. Sailor watched as first Solly hugged her brother, then he and Bodhi gave each other a bear hug. Bodhi introduced him to Sailor and Tim, who smiled shy. Claudio was a stunningly handsome man, swarthy skin, dark hazel eyes, shaggy dark hair. Not as tall as Bodhi, nor in Sailor's opinion as gorgeous, he nevertheless towered over her and Tim, and when he picked the sleepy Tim up, Tim cuddled him as if he'd known him forever, and Sailor saw a little surprise in Bodhi's eyes. They put Tim straight to bed and sat in the kitchen as Claudio put together a sandwich for each of them. He even made a ham salad sandwich look artistic, laying lettuce, tomato on the crusty bread and slathering it in mayo. Sailor almost drooled at the taste. Bodhi's hand was stroking her back as he chatted away to Claudio, sometimes dropping into Italian when Claudio, whose English wasn't as good as his sister's, looked confused. It was past midnight when they were finally shown their bedroom, and Sailor grinned as she saw it. It looked like somewhere from a different century, rustic in the extreme. It had been remodeled from an old outbuilding, one large room with a small kitchen and bathroom fitted, large open windows that were shuttered. A huge bed swathed in white mosquito netting was a one end. A nightstand, which consisted of an old metal table with flaking paint, was stuffed with books, and on top an old-style lamp with filaments on top. Sailor sighed happily. This is beautiful, she said and went to study one of Claudio's abstracts that hung in the living area. A riot of colors and shapes and Sailor found it magnetic. Claudio came to stand beside her as Bodhi hauled their cases into the bedroom area. Claudio studied Sailor. You like? She nodded. Very much. I don't know why, but it makes me happy to see all those colors, especially the ones that should clash next to each other. Claudio nodded, pleased. That's what I intended. I sincerely believe that color can help with mental health or even just improve your mood. Sailor smiled at him. 
You've certainly achieved that, Claudio, and not just in this painting. This whole place is a reminder of simplicity, of beauty. I can't imagine anyone being unhappy here. Claudio touched her arm. Thank you, that means a lot. Now, he looked up as Bodhi joined them, I'll leave you two alone. You need anything, just call or help yourself. See you in the morning. When they were alone, Bodhi kissed Sailor tenderly. You tired, baby? She nodded but looked up into his eyes with her own soft and full of desire. I am, but I might need a nightcap before I'm able to fully relax, you know? Bodhi got her meaning immediately and grinned. Well, he said, lifting her into his arms and carrying he to the bed to sleep in each other's arms. Bay shook Tom's shoulder gently. Tom? Babe? Tom blinked his eyes open to see her standing by the bed, and she grinned at him, pointing at her belly. We have lift off. They called Kim and Roman to come look after the girls, while Tom took his wife to the hospital. As they chatted easily in the car, neither noticed the beat-up Camaro following them. Tom had insisted that she have a birthing suite at the best private hospital, and Bay didn't argue. Just like she told Sailor, when it came to their children, she wanted the best. The nurses and midwives greeted them like old friends. After Esme and Millie had been born, Tom had given the maternity wards a huge donation, so relieved that the birth had gone smoothly. They had been worried that since Bay's shooting, she might not be able to carry to full term, but now, as they waited for the birth of their son, Bay had proved again that she was invincible. As the nurses performed tests and doctor examined her, Tom stroked her hair from her face. The contractions were painful, but Bay had learned to breathe through them. She gripped his big hand tightly when one hit her. OWW, 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 she grinned as her muscles cramped and her pelvis shifted. Remind me again why we decided to have another? Tom kissed her forehead. Because we're masochists. Oh right, yeah, that's it, oh good, that one's over. Bay breathed a sigh of relief and relaxed back against the pillows. Well, you're about halfway dilated, he said, so hang on in there. Want an epidural? Bay shook her head. Like he said, we're masochists. It was hours then, and in the morning, Tom went to call Kim and updated her and talked to the girls on the phone. Bay settled on the bed, trying to get comfortable. She closed her eyes, knowing she wouldn't sleep because the contractions were getting closer, but trying to relax the rest of her body. Deep breathing helped immeasurably, and as she was focusing on it, she didn't hear or see the person, dressed in hospital scrubs with a face mask, slip into her room. Stuart Lawson gazed down at the woman he had always been obsessed with, who he'd shot in cold blood all those years ago. If anything, the years had made Bay lovelier than ever, and pregnancy certainly suited her. A shame he would have to kill her now. He grinned behind the mask. Who are you kidding? You've dreamed of this moment. He grasped the scalpel he'd stolen from the supply closet and drew it out of his pocket. Another nurse nudged her way into the room and started to chat to him. Bay opened her eyes and Stu turned away and left the room as quickly as he could. Damn it. But there was also a sense of relief. He didn't want to kill the child. Bay, yes, he could kill her over and over again with great enjoyment, but a baby? No. He would wait until the kid was born. She would be here, unguarded for a couple of days, at least after the birth. Stu changed back into his clothes, keeping the scrubs in his backpack and went outside. As he lit a cigarette, he pulled out his phone and called the one number programmed into it. Bartholomew Foy answered with a curt. Is she dead? Stu felt stung. No. I couldn't do it with the kid inside her. Sentimental fool. We agreed you would kill Ms. Tamba as both a warning to Sailor and Creed, and as a thank you for us springing you from your incarceration, Mr. Lawson. And I will kill her, I swear. Just, the kid didn't do anything to me. Bart sighed. Did you not consider that by killing them both, the impact would be greater? I don't get how your Sailor girl will know it's you, why she's even connected to Bay. My sources tell me they are now friends. Sailor is very sensitive, when Bay Tamba dies, it will draw her out into the open. Stu sighed. He couldn't argue. 
He had no idea how Bart Foy knew about him, or why he was helping him. It seemed tenuous to him, but then maybe Foy just liked killing women. He could understand that. Fine. But after Bay gives birth. Do you want me to kill Sailor for you? No. Sailor is mine, Bart's voice took on such a dark tone that even Stu shivered at it. He wouldn't want to be Sailor King when Bart caught up with her. For now, just make sure Bay Tamba is dead before the end of the week. The phone went dead, and Stu sighed, glancing back up at the hospital, before trudging back to the car Bart had leased for him. Buddy Tomas Mayer was born at 11.13 a.m. the next morning. An hour later, when they were alone and holding their son in her arms, Bay looked up at Tom with tears on her beautiful face, grinning widely. He looks just like you. Tom, close to tears himself, kissed her forehead, then the baby's. Poor kid. Buddy squirmed a little, then yawned. Bay laughed. Yep, definitely you. That was your patented, after Thanksgiving dinner yawn. Tom laughed and leaned his head against his wife's. You did it again, Bijanthi Tamba Mayer. You have given me the world. I love you. Tom stroked Bay's hair and she leaned into his touch. Did you talk to the girls? Tom nodded. They're so excited. I sent them a photo of Buddy, and they already love him. Kim said she'll bring them in once you get some rest. I think she's told everybody in the world, I've already had so many messages. Sailor called from Italy and sent her love. Sweet girl. Bay winced a little as Buddy sucked hard on her nipple. Forgot how weird this feels. Tom grinned at her, his expression mischievous, and she burst out laughing. Dirty-minded boy. I know how sweet they taste. He kissed her softly. Gosh, I love you. And I love you, Tomas Mayer. We really made it, huh? She didn't see the wary look come into his eyes, and soon she was falling asleep herself, the baby sated and exhausted. With Tom's hand stroking her hair, Bay drifted off, totally relaxed, overwhelmingly happy, with her beautiful son in her arms. Tom waited until Bay was asleep, then slipped from the room. He called Roman, asking if Kim was in the room with him. When Roman said no, Tom sighed. Listen, I'm going to up Bay's protection. We'll be okay here at the hospital, I think, they have pretty good security, but when we take Buddy home, geez Roman, why did this have to happen now? Have you heard anything on Lawson's whereabouts? No, I'm sorry Tom, my detectives haven't found anything. It's like he's disappeared off the face of the earth. Roman sighed. Have you told Bay? No, and I don't want her to be stressed at a time like this. Tom, I'm not sure that's the right decision. Bay's a strong woman, if she finds out Stu is out and you knew, one thing does strike me. I think he has help on the outside. That brought Tom to attention. What? I don't know, it's just Lawson isn't the brightest button, it's very hard for someone to disappear so totally without help. Who the hell would aid that jerk? He had no one on the outside except Kim, back in the day, and she'd hardly help him. Roman was silent for a moment. Did you read the letters? From Lawson's cell? Yes. I really wished I hadn't, his bloodlust for my wife is what keeps me up nights. For someone as dim as Lawson, he sure has a varied imagination when it comes to the many ways he would like to murder Bay. Gosh, even saying that makes me want to throw up. He won't get near her, Tom, I swear it. Keep my girls safe, won't you? Do you even have to ask? Concentrate on Bay and Buddy, man, we've got this. Sailor was trembling so much that Bodhi had to take her hands in his. He smiled down at her as they watched the small car wind its way up the hill to the farmhouse, creating a dust storm behind it. Baby, it's just my mom, not the Grim Reaper. Sailor wasn't comforted. What if she hates me on sight? Worse, what if she hates Tim? What if she thinks I'm using you both? Bodhi rolled his eyes. She won't, you know why? Because you're not. She can see the truth of things, beautiful girl, I swear. As for her hating Tim, he's my son. I guarantee half of that car's trunk will be full of gifts for him. She loves me, she'll love my family. Sailor flushed with pleasure but still grumbled. Mama's boy. Bodhi laughed as he led her from their little hideout and out into the yard to meet his mother. 
You betcha. Victoria Creed stepped from the car, and immediately Sailor felt herself relax. A petite woman slim-framed, with short stylish white hair cut short and spectacles on her nose, she had a kindly face and a ready smile. Victoria hugged her son and smiled down at her grandson as he shook her hand, shyly but seriously. She turned towards her car and whistled, and a large dog bounded out of the car and over to them. He was so large that Tim took a step back, but the dog sniffed him and licked his face making Tim laugh. And mom, this is Sailor. Sailor, my mom, Vittoria. Sailor could see Vittoria sizing her up with the same huge green eyes that she had passed on to her son. Sailor, her heart thumping, met her gaze steadily. It's lovely to meet you, she said in broken Italian, and Vittoria smiled, kissing Sailor's cheeks. Sweetie, I speak English, but thank you for trying. I appreciate it. Vittoria turned to Claudio and Soleil, who were waiting. And you two, still trouble. Soleil, you grow more beautiful every day. Claudio, you've showered. That's a good step. They all laughed, and Claudio ushered them all inside. In the kitchen, his cook had made a huge breakfast buffet, and soon they were all talking over each other and grabbing food. Sailor was happy just to watch this crazy Italian family. Vittoria squeezed her arm on the way around the buffet table, and Sailor smiled back, relieved that the woman didn't take against her right off the bat. She knew Vittoria would want to talk to her alone, however, and after breakfast, she wasn't surprised when Vittoria asked her if she would like a walk down to the olive grove. Bodhi started to object, giving his mother a warning glance, but Sailor agreed readily. Sure enough, as Vittoria took her arm, Sailor knew the question that was coming. So, Sailor, I understand you worked for Bodhi's agent? Sailor nodded. Vittoria, I know what you must think, and so, I am ready and willing to tell you everything you need to know to prove that I couldn't care less about Bodhi's status or celebrity, and definitely not his money. I love your son completely, totally. I would live under a bridge with him. Vittoria nodded to herself. Sailor, you must think I'm an interfering old woman, but I just want to know you. Bodhi had his demons when he was younger. He didn't deal with his father's death well. You know all of this? Sailor nodded. The way Bodhi talked about his dad made her heart hurt. I wish I could have known him. You're a sweet girl, Vittoria patted her hand. Bodhi, he spiraled down and I blame myself for that, for leaving and coming back to Italy without him. It was my mistake and so you see now, I am perhaps overly vigilant. She smiled softly. He may be nearly forty but he's still my little boy. Vittoria, I swear to you. I will never hurt Bodhi. I couldn't, it's not in me. He has given me a life I thought impossible, and I will try every day to repay him. Victoria stopped and studied her for a long moment. I believe you, Sailor King. It's in your eyes. You love him. Yes. Victoria began to walk again. Bodhi told me about your situation, where you grew up. You were brave to escape it. Sailor said nothing to that, uncomfortable. Vittoria looked at her. That wasn't a criticism, sailor. I cannot imagine the horrors you went through there. But I can see how you might think that I latched onto Bodhi because of it. Can you? There was no reproach in Vittoria's voice, and sailor knew she could be totally honest with the older woman. I can see how some people might use him to better their situation. I'm not one of those people. Good. I like you, Sailor King, I can be as straightforward as I like. None of that silly my feelings are hurt nonsense. You are a straight shooter like me. Sailor was glad of the approval in Vittoria's voice. Did you like Gemma? She knew it was bold to ask the mother about the ex-girlfriend, but Sailor wanted to know what kind of woman Gemma was. Vittoria gave her a conspiratorial grin, but sighed. Gemma was very different to you, Sailor. Highly strung, very elegant, high maintenance. Skittish like a thoroughbred racehorse. Vittoria smiled at Sailor. I think you are more like me. A tomboy, is that the word? Sailor grinned and nodded. It is, and yes, that sounds like me. 
I'm not nearly as elegant as you, though. Vittoria laughed. Believe me, I'm usually covered in paint and pastel dust, my hair sticking up in every direction. Just ask Claudio. Do you like him? He's lovely, a little withdrawn. Knowing Soleil first, I had imagined him to be as extrovert as she is, but he's not. Vittoria shook her head. Claudio is going through a heartbreak at the moment. His girlfriend, Giovanna, left him just as he was about to propose. She'd been having an affair. So, he's a little fractured at the moment. But yes, he's never been as effusive as Solly, the dear girl. You are friends, yes? Sailor nodded. I adore her, and she's doing Bodhi and I a tremendous favor by posing as his partner in public. Vittoria nodded. She's a good girl, I've always thought of Claudio and Solly as my children, and Solly and I especially have something in common. She gave a sailor a meaningful look, and sailor got it after a beat. Really? Vittoria laughed. Really? I didn't know myself until well after Bodhi's father died. For the last two years, I have been very happily dating a wonderful woman called Christina. Does Bodhi know? Vittoria shook her head. I've been waiting for the right moment. As I said, Bodhi was very close to his father. Sailor considered for a moment. Knowing Bodhi, he would just be glad you're happy. You think so? Sailor nodded. But it's none of my business. Vittoria hugged her. You are part of this family now, Sailor. It is your business, and thank you for being so supportive. Sailor grinned. And if Bodhi gets angry about it, I'll kick his ass. Vittoria laughed. That's my girl. Shall we go and rejoin everyone? Vittoria spent most of the rest of the afternoon bonding with her grandson, who took to her straight away, already in love with her large dog, whose name was Tag. He's a Leonberger crossed with a Bernese mountain dog, Vittoria told Tim. The dog was as tall as the ten-year-old was, and Bodhi rolled his eyes. Do you ride him place you want to go, Mom? He's huge. How on earth do you control him? Bribery mostly, she shot back to the amusement of the others. It worked on you as a kid. True story, Bodhi grinned and Tim laughed at his father's expression. Bodhi ruffled his hair and Tim hugged his dad hard. Sailor's eyes filled with tears at the joy in Bodhi's eyes. His relationship with Tim had really blossomed. A little while later, while Tim regaled his grandmother with tales of his school, Bodhi pulled Sailor onto his lap and kissed her. My mom give you the full interrogation. Sailor grinned. Yup. I think I passed because after that we planned sedition against you. Bodhi laughed. Then I'd say you made a good impression. What did you think? I love her. There's no bullshit there, I do. Bodhi kissed her again. I love you, Sailor King. Hey you two, Vittoria came over holding Tim's hand, we've had an idea. Solly and Claudio are coming back with me to Florence for a couple of days, and Tim was wondering if he could come too, give you two some time alone. Tim nodded and Bodhi grinned. You sure, sport? Tim nodded his head. Oh yes, it'll be fun, and Grandma says I can sleep with Tag on my bed. He looked absurdly excited about the prospect. Bodhi nodded. Okay then. Thanks Ma, we could use the time. Sailor felt she must be blushing to her roots. She knew exactly how they would be spending the time, and by the smirks on Solly and Claudio's faces, they had guessed too. The next morning, Tim hugged both his father and Sailor goodbye. See you in a couple of days, buddy boy. Tim hugged his father hard. Love you, Dad. Bodhi really couldn't stop the tears then. Love you too, Timbo. Sailor smiled up at him as they waved the others goodbye. Mushy face. Bodhi laughed, wiping his damp cheeks. Yep, can't deny it. She gazed down at him, never having enough of the sight of him. When they'd had the girls, it was such a tumultuous time, there hadn't been any time for quiet reflection. Now, with Tom at home with Esme and Millie, probably being run ragged by his daughters, Bay could enjoy the quiet hours with her son. She glanced at the clock. 3 a.m. She didn't mind the middle-of-the-night feeds, 
She enjoyed the silence of the hospital and the view over Seattle at night. She stared out at the city now, over to the top of the needle, squinting to see if she could see the outline of Rainier in the dark. She heard the door squeak open behind her and turned. A nurse, dressed in scrubs, went to pick her chart with her vital signs up. They, her brain still full of baby hormones, didn't even question it, so used to people coming in and out at all times. Hi. Quiet night? The nurse said nothing and Bay frowned. She tried again. Hey. She touched the arm of the nurse and he or she whirled around and Bay saw his eyes. And recognized them immediately. Her heart nearly failed and she knew one thing. She would not let Stu Lawson harm her child. She threw herself over Buddy's crib, but Stu grabbed her hair and yanked her backward, throwing her across the room. They hardly had time to open her mouth to scream before Stu was on her, slashing at her with a scalpel. They kicked him away, ignoring the slice of the blade across her skin of her thigh as Stu lost balance. They screamed for help as Stu, his eyes crazed, lunged for Buddy's cradle, and Bay, giving the banshee cry of the lioness, launched herself at him, her hands clawing at him. Stu grabbed and shoved her against the wall as two burly security guards rushed in and grabbed him, hauling him away from Bay and out into the hall, still screaming. Bay immediately went to her son who was bawling and scooped him into her arms, breathing hard, checking her son for any wounds. There was blood spattered across his coverlet, but thankfully she could find nothing wrong. A fleet of doctors and nurses came in and one stepped forward, his face pale. Nurse Edwards, please take Mrs. Mayer's son and make sure he is fine. Bay shook her head. No, he's fine, he's fine, he's okay. The doctor nodded to the nurse who came to take Buddy, but Bay shook her head. No. I want him. He's fine. The doctor stepped toward her. Bay, honey, Buddy may be okay, but you're not. Sweetie, right now you have adrenaline coursing through your system. When it goes away, which it will any second, you will start to feel pain. A lot of pain. When you do, you may pass out, and I don't want you holding Buddy when you do. Please. Give him to Nurse Edwards. Bay started at him, and sure enough, now the attack was over, she began to feel something like pain creeping over her. She handed her son to the nurse, and then looked down at herself. Her nightdress was soaked in blood from numerous slashes across it, but what she noticed was the blood streaming down her leg from the thigh wound. Damn. It was deep. The thick dark blood was pumping down her leg and pooling where she stood. Arterial blood. Oh no no. Bay felt a wave of dizziness, and the doctor caught her as she passed out. The doctor and nurses got Bay onto her bed, and the doctor examined her. Shit. She has a deep laceration to the right thigh. Possible femoral artery rupture. Let's get her down to surgery now before she bleeds out. Someone please call Tomas Mayer and the police, and then tell me what went on here tonight. Tom Mayer had finally gotten off to sleep when the call came, and then his heart nearly failed. Bay and Buddy had been attacked. Buddy was okay, but Bay was in surgery with serious stab wounds. Please no, not again. He knew it was Stu Lawson, who else would it be? He, Tom, had failed Bay when she was at her most vulnerable. Why hadn't he insisted on a security guard at her hospital room? Because then you would have to tell her you kept Stu Lawson's escape from her. Oh gosh, my darling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He woke the girls and called Kim and Roman. They were horrified and told him they would meet him at the hospital. Tom strapped the girls into their car seats, praying he wouldn't be too late, that he wouldn't have to explain to his girls that their mommy had been killed by a very bad man and that their daddy hadn't been able to stop him. Sailor stretched her body out in the morning sun and opened her eyes. Bodie was at the stove, flipping delicious smelling pancakes onto a plate. Sailor got up, filched Bodie's shirt from the bottom of the bed, wrapping it around herself, and padded silently behind him, slipping her arms around his waist. She still had a hard time believing this beautiful big man was hers. I love you. Bodhi turned around, and with a shock it wasn't Bodhi but Bart. He smiled nastily. I'm glad to hear it, sailor, but it's a little too late for that. In his hand, a large, lethal-looking knife, and he drove it deep into her stomach. As she fell to the floor, dying, she saw Bodhi laying across from her, his throat cut, the light in his eyes fading. Sailor. 
Baby, wake up. Sailor finally stopped screaming as Bodhi wrapped his arms around her. Baby, you were dreaming, having a nightmare. Slowly, she managed to calm herself. Bodhi looked at her with deep concern in his eyes. Are you all right? Sailor drew in a deep breath. Sorry, darling, I'm so sorry. Gosh, a bad dream doesn't cover it. She rubbed her hands over her face. Geez, I haven't had one of them for months. Bodhi stroked her hair. Do you want to talk to me about it? She smiled wanly. What else would it be about but Bart? I'm constantly waiting for him to find me, to hurt me or worse hurt you. I couldn't bear it if I was responsible for anything happening to anyone I love. I would rather die, Bodhi. Bodhi winced. Don't say that, baby. It's true, though. I tell you something, if Bart comes for me, I won't go without trying to take him with me. I used to think the worst thing a person could do was to kill another human. But I would kill Bart Foy in a heartbeat. For what he has done, for what he might do. Bodhi felt his heart sink at her words. His beautiful love should never have been put in the position where she had to choose whether to kill or be killed. No. This was wrong. He would not allow Sailor to be hurt anymore by Bart Foy or his followers. Sweetie, when we get back to the U.S., we'll stop being passive and start being proactive. What do you have in mind? Sailor was calm now and Bodhi kissed her temple. First, and I know you'll hate this, but added security. You don't go out in public without a bodyguard. Sailor sighed and Bodhi looked at her questioningly. What is it? It's just, I lived for years not being able to move freely, always having a minder with me. It feels like deja vu. Except in this case, we'll be protecting rather than restraining. There was a tiny edge to Bodhi's voice, and she smiled at him ruefully. I know, baby. Let's talk about what else we can do. Bodhi shifted so he was facing her. When you think of other cults, what's the thing they hate the most? Negative publicity. Bodhi nodded. Right. Documentaries, testimonies from ex-cult members. Look at that series that was just on the television, exposing that Hollywood cult. They hated it. So, you're saying we should make a documentary? I am. We involve a top journalist, someone with gravitas, and we round up ex-cult members to testify. Sailor chewed her lip. If we can find any alive. There are very few who leave, and nearly all of them end up dead. Then we get the police involved and look into those deaths. Maybe the FBI. You can tell them what you saw in Foy's office. If he's under investigation, he will have destroyed those photos. Why the hell didn't I take one as leverage if nothing else? Dang it. You were scared. Sailor nodded, but she looked determined. Let's do it. Let's bring that jerk down. And keep you safe. She smiled at him. That too. Bodhi leaned over to kiss her. Are you hungry? A little. She stroked him hair, trying to force the image of him dying out of her head. I don't want pancakes, though. Eggs? Perfect. They ate outside, balancing their plates on their knees. It is heaven here, Sailor said. No television, no internet, no phone signal, just this. She indicated the beautiful rolling hills, the palatial but rustic buildings, the olive groves. Bodhi ate a forkful of eggs. Could you see yourself living here? Sailor looked at him in surprise, then nodded. I could. You. Bodhi smiled. It's been in the back of my mind for years just to retire and then come back here, a simpler life. Lately, I've been thinking about it more. If you'll forgive an old man's fantasy, I could see us here, our own little kids running around, dogs, horses, us making everything we need together. Quietude. Peace. I take it back, Sailor said, tears filling her eyes, this isn't heaven. That right there, what you described, that's my heaven. Bodhi grinned shyly. Yeah. Gosh, yes. He reached over to stroke his hand over her hair. Sailor King, you make me so happy. I don't want to freak you out or anything, but one day, I want to marry you. 
Don't worry, I'm not asking yet, but I will ask, someday. Sailor flushed with pleasure. And one day, I'll say yes. I promise. Bodhi took her plate from her and set it down on the ground. He pulled her to her feet and led her down the hill. Sailor chuckled at his mischievous face. Where are we going? Bodhi laughed. They saw a cloud of dust making its way up the hill. Someone's coming. Bodhi frowned. Soleil and Claudio weren't due back for another day. They walked back to the house and waited for the car. Sure enough, it was Soleil and Claudio, along with Tim. Tim got out of the car and ran to hug his father and sailor. Soleil greeted them, her usually cheerful face somber. She glanced at Claudio who nodded and took Tim back inside for something to eat. Hey guys, Solly said, I'm sorry we had to break into your time but something's happened back home and I thought you should know. What is it? Solly looked at Sailor, her face sad. Bay Tamba was attacked in hospital. She's in a pretty bad way. Sailor covered her mouth in horror. Oh gosh, what happened? Solly drew in a deep breath. Stuart Lawson. He attacked her with a scalpel. She was protecting the baby, oh, by the way, she had a boy a few nights ago, and thankfully the baby's not hurt. Bay was cut, and her femoral artery was severed. They had to operate for hours, and she's in intensive care again. Bodhi put his arms around Sailor, who was sobbing. Did you hear it from the news? Solly shook her head. The FBI called me to try and get in touch with you. Stuart Lawson's singing like a bird. Seems like Bartholomew Foy arranged his escape, hit him, gave him the opportunity to kill Bay. Sailor gaped at her, tears still pouring down her face. Bart? Why the hell would he want Bay dead? Soleil looked at Sailor, deep sympathy in her eyes. According to Stu, to punish you. He knew you were friends, God knows how. Bodhi, you have a spy in your team. Damn. Bodhi was angry now. He tightened his arms around Sailor, who was sobbing even harder now. Bay had been attacked because of her. No. No, she couldn't bear it. Bodhi, we have to go home, she said, trying to calm herself, but Bodhi was raging. No, no way, it will be like putting you in the firing range. No one else is getting hurt because of me, Bodhi, I won't permit it. Not gonna happen, sweetheart. Stop telling me how to live my life. Sailor lost it then. It's my decision, Bodhi, not yours. I'm responsible for this, gosh, Bodhi, she'd just given birth. How do you think Tomas feels? The girls? Because of me, their mommy is. She couldn't get the words out. What's done is done, Bodhi's voice was cold. Sacrificing yourself won't change that. It's not your choice, Sailor snapped. We're going back to the States tonight. I need to be there for Bay. Bodhi threw his hands up in the air. You barely know her. Sailor went very still. I've known her only two weeks less than I know you, Bodhi. Bay is my family now too. Make the arrangements. End of conversation. And she stalked back into the main farmhouse, barely holding it together. She found an empty bathroom and sank to the cool tile floor, burying her head in her hands and sobbing out her heartbreak. Outside a shell-shocked Bodhi turned a pale face to Soleil. He shook his head. This is a bad idea, Solly. A bad, bad idea. Soleil squeezed his arm. But you know you have to do it, right? Bodhi nodded, squeezing his eyes shut. Gosh, if he kills her, Solly. He won't, Bodhi. Look, how about I move in with you all and we can run interference? We fire your entire team and bring in a security detail. I will personally take Tim to school and back. You and Sailor try and have a normal life together. Bodhi looked at his friend with gratitude. What about your life, Saul? She grinned. Hey, I'm a lot younger than you, I can wait. I can work from Los Angeles as easily as anywhere. I have some stuff going on with Grady Mallory and Maceo Bartoli, but they can handle it from where they are. Bodhi hugged her. Thanks all. You're welcome. Look, let me make the arrangements to fly back tonight. Go and find Sailor and make up with her. Now is not the time for you two to be fighting. 
Girls, when we see mommy, don't jump all over her, Tomas Mayer told his daughters gently. She's very sore, and she may be a little groggy. Can we kiss her? Tomas looked in the rearview mirror and smiled at Esme. I think she would like that very much. He turned back to the road, feeling his body easing from the tension and grief that had colored the last few days. After hours in surgery, Bay had pulled through and was now on the way to recovery, but the terror he had felt when he was told, he would never forget it. Stuart Lawson was now in FBI custody and singing like bird. His escape from prison had been orchestrated by a man called Bartholomew Foy, who Tomas had then researched and found out exactly who he was. It was the shock of discovering the hashtag find sailor hashtag, the thing which linked him to Bay. He had her attacked to show Sailor what he was capable of. Tomas felt murderous and a little pissed at Sailor King, which he knew wasn't fair, but hell, his beloved Bay had almost died. Again. Stu Lawson would have tried to kill Bay without Barty Foy. Tom repeated it to himself, but still, the thought came that if it weren't for Barty Foy, Stu Lawson would never have gotten out of jail. To his relief, Bay was awake and overjoyed to see the twins hugging both the girls. His wife was still pale, but the life had come back into her eyes again as she held her son and kissed her girls. Esme and Millie were obsessed with their baby brother. Bay, when she awoke from the surgery, had asked for her son to stay with her, wanting to breastfeed him even as she recovered, and after some discussion with her doctor, he had given permission. She handed Buddy to his father before kissing Tom's lips. Doc says I can come home at the weekend, girls, she told her daughters, and they looked excited. Tom stroked a hand over Bay's forehead. You sure you're up to it, baby? She nodded vehemently. Gosh, yes. I'm counting the days. How's the thigh? Bay smiled at him. The wound is healing nicely, but you should see the bruise. I'm slightly proud of it. Tom swallowed a lump in his throat. You're a warrior, baby. Not many people would have had the strength to fight back. Bay looked steadily at him. Tom, honey, I have to ask. Did you know? Did you know he was out? Tom met her gaze. I did. I didn't want you stressed in the last few weeks of your pregnancy. I never dreamed that you wouldn't be safe here. Bay sighed. I understand why you made that decision, but please, don't keep anything from me like that again. I won't. Forgive me? Bay grinned slightly. I'll think about it. You'll have to make it up to me in about six weeks' time. Tom laughed and Millie looked up. What are you laughing about, Daddy? Just your mommy being a naughty girl. Millie shrugged. Okay. Bay slid her hand into Tom's. Sailor called me. They're coming back. She was upset, kept blaming herself. She saw Tom's expression and gave him a stern look. Tom, this is not her fault, so I don't want to hear otherwise. Can you imagine how that poor girl had been living? What I don't get, Tom said, lowering his voice, is why you. Why of all her friends did he target you? That's an easy one. Sailor doesn't have a lot of people, and most of them are under Bodhi's protection. I'm on the periphery and no one would suspect Bart Foy coming after me. Plus, using Stu, he had a way to deny any involvement. I have to hand it to Bart Foy, he did his research. Tom thought about this for a long minute, then nodded. I guess you're right. Anyway, Sailor is coming to see me tomorrow so we can have a chat then. I'm sure the hospital will be delighted with the amount of security around then. Bay nodded out of the door where Tom's security team guarded her door. Bay smiled. Like a fortress. You bet your sweet butt. Tom amended at the last minute, cutting his eyes at his children, and Bay laughed. Nice save, Mr. Mayor, nice save. The tension between Sailor and Bodhi hadn't lightened as they flew home, and now, two days later, breakfast was a silent thing. Soleil and Tim would glance at each other and try to start a conversation, but both Bodhi and Sailor were subdued. Soleil took Tim to school, and the couple were left alone in the house. Sailor watched the new security team patrolling the property, and felt tears come to the surface. She wiped one away with an impatient hand, then felt Bodhi slide his arms around her waist and kiss the tears away. I'm sorry, Sales. 
I was insensitive. I'm just damn scared you'll get hurt. Sailor leaned back into his embrace, needing to feel his strength, his big body against her own. I'm sorry I yelled. It's just, Uwash Bodhi, I feel so responsible. You're not the monster here, he said gently, and she turned in his arms, tilting her face up for a kiss. I know. I just hate the thought of anyone else being hurt because of me. She put her hands on his face, studying him. You look tired. I missed you the last couple of days. She smiled gently. I was right next to you in bed, baby. I felt the distance. She nodded, her eyes growing serious. Me too. Let's never do that again. Bodhi kissed her gently. Sailor took his hand and led him back to their bedroom. Let's get those times back, she said softly and closed the door behind her. Soleil looked over at Tim as they sat in the heavy Los Angeles traffic on the way to his school. The boy had been quiet, picking up on the tension between his father and Sailor. Timbo. You okay? Tim looked at her with concern in his eyes. Solly, are my dad and Sailor going to split up? Soleil shook her head. No, sweetie, they're just upset about what happened to Bay. But everything's going to be all right again. Bay is getting better, and your dad and Sailor will be okay. We have new bodyguards. You do. Good. That's good. Solly frowned. Tim, do they ever bother you? Not the new ones, but the old ones. Did you ever notice any weird behavior? Tim considered. Only Udo. He was creepy. He liked to look at Sailor all the time. I think he thought she was pretty. Soleil nodded, deep in thought. Udo, huh? Yeah, he was a little creepy. Good thing he's gone now, right? Yeah. Do you think Dad will marry Sailor? Soleil was relieved he seemed happier. Maybe, I don't know. They love each other very much. Tim nodded. Why hasn't Daddy gotten married before? Well, maybe he was waiting for Sailor. But he didn't know her. Tim looked confused and Soleil grinned at him. Maybe, deep inside, he knew he was waiting that someone like Sailor was out there, and so he held off getting married. Are you sad he didn't marry your mom? No. I don't think they loved each other, not like mom loved Evan or dad loved Sailor. What happened with your mom and Evan? Tim shrugged. She used to get these moods and yell at him. He ignored it for a while but then he got, what's the word? Angry. Depressed. Depressed. He was sad. One day, he told me he couldn't live with us anymore because mommy asked him to leave. Tim looked a little tearful, and Soleil hurriedly changed the subject. Well, if you ask me, I think your dad will marry Sailor. I hope so. Tim was smiling again. At school, he kissed Soleil's cheek and ran off to be with his friends. Soleil sighed. She'd never wanted kids, but there was something about this particular kid that made her heart hurt. She glanced at her watch. Still early and she wanted to give Bodhi and Sailor some privacy. Soleil drove to her favorite L.A. coffeehouse and flirted with the female barista. Hedda, her date a few weeks back, hadn't called her for a while, and Soleil decided she wasn't that concerned. Hedda had been fun, but the nurse's hours had been inconvenient and... Something clicked in Soleil's head. Hedda had been a pediatric nurse. Soleil called the hospital where she said she worked. The staff there hadn't heard of a Hedda Shaw. Shit. Soleil grabbed her iPad and checked which hospital Bay Tamba had given birth at in Seattle, and called them. After some negotiation, she was put through to the nurse's station on Bay's floor. Soleil recognized Hedda's voice immediately. She hung up the phone without speaking. So Hedda had lied about where she worked. It couldn't be a coincidence that she worked in the neonatal unit where Bay had been attacked. Sailor had wanted to travel up to Seattle to see Bay. Maybe she, Soleil, should take her. Maybe then she could check out Hedda, maybe freak her out enough to get some information. It was worth a shot. Bodhi was reaching for his phone. We'll find out where she lives and stick bugs on everything. If she's working with Foy, we'll find out. Sailor felt relief flooding through her. 
A lead at last, she said, beaming. Thank you, Solly. That's the best news. Sailor leaned her head against his shoulder, and Bodhi handed Soleil his game controller. Here, see if you can make anything of this damned game. Soleil settled in beside Tim, and soon they were yelling and laughing as they played. Bodhi kissed Sailor's forehead and gazed down at her. I love you, he mouthed, and she smiled. I love you too, she whispered and pressed her lips against his. Bay wrapped Sailor in a huge hug, then ushered her into the seat next to her bed. Sailor was glad to see that her friend looked better than Sailor had expected, if a little pale. Her post-baby body was already slimming down. Bay grinned when she saw Sailor's scrutiny. Breastfeeding. Best diet in the world. Bay winced a little, favoring her left leg as she sat on the edge of her bed. Sailor squeezed her hand. Are you in pain? Some. Could have been a lot worse. Bay nodded over to her son, sleeping soundly in his crib. The terror of Stu being in the same room as Buddy, Sailor, I would have happily died to protect my son, I was damned if Stu Lawson was going to get away with it. Sailor swallowed. I can't begin to tell you how sorry I am. I'm sorry you got dragged into my crap bay. Don't be silly. Stu would have come after me anyway. Some men, gosh, some men think they have a God-given right to say whether a woman lives or dies. Scumbags. They sounded angry and hurt and Sailor's eyes filled with tears. I know. I just don't know what to do. They rubbed her belly unconsciously as she chewed on her bottom lip. Me either. It's a bigger problem than either you or me, girl. We just have to deal with this situation. I suspect you feel the same as me. No ivory towers and 24-7 security details, they don't help with feeling safe. She sighed. Honestly, I'm just exhausted of everything. I just want to go away with Tom and the kids and disappear for a while. Kim and Pete are desperate for a break too. Maybe we should go on hiatus for a year or so. Sailor nodded. I know Bodhi has benefited from not working for a while, so maybe it is good. Not like you can't afford it. Well, exactly. They smiled at her. I was never someone who wanted to be famous, you know. It was the music, that's the thing I loved, and playing for people. The other stuff can go hang, the fame, the press, the ridiculous pedestals people put us on. We're just musicians, not gods. Sailor grinned at her. Speaking from the other side of the fence, you were all gods to me. They laughed. Well, I can relate. I still can't get used to having Pearl Jam on speed dial. Sailor's eye widened. Really? Really? Bay was slightly smug and they both laughed. Hey. Tom Mayer stood at the door, watching them. Bay's smile spread wider. Hey, baby. Look who's here. Sailor's heart thumped as she stood to greet Tom, scared he would rebuff her. Instead, his eyes softened and he hugged her. I'm so sorry, Tom, Sailor whispered to him as he kissed her cheek. Tom nodded, half smiled, then turned to his wife. Scooch on over, beauty, he said, and sat down next to her, his hand on her thigh. How are you this morning? Bay leaned into him, and Sailor's chest hurt at the love between them. She hoped that she and Bodhi would still look at each other when they had been together as long as Bay and Tom had. She got up, meaning to give them privacy, but Bay shot her a look. Where do you think you're going? Sailor smiled shyly. I don't want to take up all your time. Girl, sit down. You only just got here, and you haven't met Buddy properly yet. Tom, tell her. Tom took Sailor's hand. Stay, Sailor. It's early. Please stay. Hedda Shaw grabbed the adult diaper pads and turned to walk out of the maternity ward's huge supply closet. She started when she realized someone was standing in the doorway. With the light behind her, she didn't recognize the figure at first, until she spoke. Hey there. Hedda shielded her eyes. Soleil. Solly smiled and stepped into the room, letting the door swing shut behind. I thought I saw you, I didn't realize you transferred. Soleil was smiling, but Hedda heard the edge in her voice. Soleil stepped forward and Hedda swallowed hard. Um, yeah, sorry, it was last minute, why are you here, Soleil? Visiting a dear friend. 
Baytamba, you know her? Hedda nodded slowly. Oh damn. Of course, she just had a baby. Soleil put her head on one side. And was just nearly murdered. That's surely worth a mention too, right? In a secure hospital, guess someone really dropped the ball on keeping the patients safe, huh? It's unfortunate, but it happens. In a locked ward? Hedda looked away from her gaze. She knows, Hedda's eye drifted to the boxes where they kept scalpels. Could she get to one before Soleil went for her? I wouldn't, Hedda. Soleil's voice was like ice. Now, I think it's strange that Stuart Lawson was able to gain access to Bay's room so easily, and just after you transferred too. Coincidence? I don't think so. Hedda risked it and lunged for the scalpels, but Soleil was too fast and too strong. Hedda squeak in terror as Soleil pushed her against the wall, ripping her throat and got in her face. You little skank, how long have you been working for Bartholomew Foy? How much is he paying you to help Lawson kill Bay? Hedda shook her head, terrified. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't give a crap about your apology. I care about the people I love. Bart Foy is going down, Hedda, and you can either go with him as an accessory to murder or you can help us. Because believe me, there's no way I'm letting you get away with what you did. Think about it. You have my number. And one last thing, you're being watched, so don't try to run. If you do, you'll have to deal with me. Soleil released her grip and stalked out. To Hedda, as Soleil opened the door, she looked like a beautiful avenging angel, only Soleil was most definitely not on her side. Shit, shit. Hedda sank to the floor, trembling uncontrollably. Bart Foy scared her witless, but Soleil had just proved that she too was not someone Hedda wanted for an enemy. It was only then the weight of what she had done hit Hedda Shaw, and with no other option and no idea what to do, she began to cry. Sailor and Soleil left the hospital just after noon, and Soleil insisted on showing Sailor around the city. Sailor loved the cool vibe of the place, down to earth and laid back. They went to the top of the Space Needle and looked out over to the Olympic Mountains and Mount Rainier. They ate chowder from the concession stand, sitting at one of the little tables on the viewing deck. They chatted amiably until Solly's phone buzzed. Hey, it's Claudio. Ciao, Fratelli. Sailor smiled as Soleil chatted away in Italian, so quickly Sailor couldn't even begin to translate the little she knew. She concentrated instead on the delicious chowder and the incredible view. Yeah, she could imagine living here. Not as hot or busy or as fast-paced as L.A., she wondered idly if Bodhi would be up for moving, then checked herself. Despite the intensity of their relationship, she really didn't think they were ready to discuss moving his whole life entirely on a whim of hers. Sailor rocked back a little, realizing despite his great generosity, she really didn't have parity with Bodhi in their relationship, and not just financially. The thought depressed her. I was meant to do something, she thought now. Hey. Soleil had finished her call. You'll never guess where Claudio is right now. Seattle. Aha, she nodded as Sailor looked surprised. He had a last-minute meeting with Grady Mallory at the art museum and flew in yesterday. He wants to know if we can be free for dinner tonight? Of course, Sailor was delighted. She had liked Claudio Fonseca very much. Claudio threw his arms around both of them as they arrived at the restaurant. Claudio's companion, Grady Mallory, watched with a grin on his handsome face as his friend made a fuss of his sister and her friend. Then Claudio introduced him to Sailor. Soleil was clearly already acquainted with the other man. Over dinner, Sailor discovered Grady was a Seattle native, part of the very rich, very famous Mallory family, and had recently had a new baby with his wife, Floriana. He showed Sailor the photo of his new daughter. She was adorable, and Sailor told him so. You have any more children? Two, Grady said proudly, Flory loves being pregnant for some reason. Sailor grinned. I wouldn't know about that, but you two sure do produce gorgeous offspring. Grady grinned his thanks. The rest of the dinner was fun, as Sailor and Grady watched Claudio and Soleil bicker and tease each other in the way only siblings could. Later, Grady asked Sailor about her art and Sailor looked surprised. 
I told him, Soleil interrupted, smirking. Both Bodhi and I have seen what she can do, Grady, although she is very good at hiding it. Sailor was surprised. Yes, she loved drawing and would often sit sketching in the evenings while Bodhi and Tim played computer games, but she hadn't noticed Soleil taking a particular interest in her art. Grady nodded. Listen, have you heard of the Kia Chen Mallory Foundation? Sailor shook her head. It's named for my sister-in-law, and through it, Kia, Flory and I all work towards giving emerging artists a helping hand. We're very much looking for tutors for a Los Angeles office we're thinking of opening. Would you be interested? Sailor's cheeks flushed. Grady, look, that's very kind, but I'm nowhere near qualified. I just sketch for a hobby. Grady smiled and took out a business card. Well then, keep in touch, maybe there's some other area you'd like to get involved in. As Sailor and Soleil were being walked back to the hotel by Claudio, Sailor couldn't stop thinking about Grady's offer. Maybe she could be useful, and she could actually use a focus right now. Suddenly she felt a new energy inside of her. As much as she loved Bodhi and their life together, she needed something of her own to feel a connection to the earth. If their relationship was made public, she wanted to be more in this life than just Bodhi Creed's girlfriend. She was so absorbed in her thoughts, she didn't see Soleil on her phone and Claudio dropping back to walk with Sailor. Hey, kiddo. How do you like Seattle? She smiled up at him. She had liked Claudio from the first, his fun-loving side coming out when his sister or Bodhi was with him. She also felt she could talk to him about anything. I love it, so beautiful. You know, Bodhi was raised here for much of his childhood. That's where we met him. Our father was working with Boeing at the time, as was Bodhi's dad, and they became friends so when he brought us over on school vacations, we would all hang out. I never knew that, Sailor said, smiling. That's cool. He's my brother, Claudio said, and almost too late, Sailor realized that he was giving her the don't hurt my brother talk, albeit in a very sweet, subtle way. She nudged his shoulder with hers. Don't worry, Claudio, I'd rather die than hurt Bodhi or Tim or any of you. You are my family now, and you'll never know how grateful I am for you all. Claudio, seemingly satisfied with this, kissed her cheek. Good girl. If it's any help, I've never seen Bodhi so wiped out by love. It's a beautiful thing. Sailor was touched. Claudio, I can promise you, we will all be happy together if I have anything to do with it. She had no idea how soon that promise would be broken. Part 4 Bart Foy has gone very, very quiet, Bodhi announced at breakfast a few weeks later. The feds leaned on him about Stuart Lawson, but he covered his tracks very well. Sailor looked at him unhappily. That doesn't surprise me. Soleil spooned the last of her yogurt into her mouth. How do you know all of this? I have a contact at the bureau. Soleil grinned. Fancy. Bodhi grinned, but Sailor didn't smile. It's when he goes quiet that I start to panic. She lowered her voice so Tim, who was running around packing his backpack for school, wouldn't hear. Back in the commune, it meant someone had stepped out of line and that bad times were coming. Dark times. She felt tearful, and Bodhi stroked her cheek. What is it? Sailor just shook her head. Just a hidden enemy, you know? It's harder to stay ahead of them. Ahead of who? Tim had rejoined them without Sailor seeing, and for a second, she floundered for an answer. Emails, Soleil rescued Sailor, then mussed Tim's hair. Come on, kiddo. Let's get going. Sailor looked at her gratefully, and Solly winked. Listen, I have a meeting after I drop Tim off, so you two will have the place to yourselves for a while. To um, work, you know. She winked at both of them, then laughed as she left the house with her young ward. Bye, gorgeous people. Bye, nutjob, Bodhi called out after her and Sailor laughed, feeling her spirits lift. When they were alone, Bodhi leaned over to kiss Sailor. Sales, I've been thinking, it might be time for me to get back to work. Record some new stuff, do some press, and I'm think maybe we could kill two birds with one stone. How's that? I think we need to go public with our relationship. Sailor gaped at him. Why? 
because the more Bart Foy realizes that you are protected, that you are loved, the less likely he is to risk coming after you. He might think you're anonymous enough that he could, and I hate these words coming out of my mouth, that he could kill you and no, one would think anything of a young biracial woman being murdered in this town. God knows how many people straight off the bus from everywhere go missing, especially young women. This could be where my fame, for want of a better word, could actually be of help. From what I can see, Bart Foy won't risk being exposed as a murderer or a charlatan. I don't mean this to sound egotistical, and of course, you are much, much more than just my lover, but being Bodhi Creed's girlfriend automatically gives you an extra layer of public protection. No one can touch us. Sailor chewed this over. Conversely, she said, Bart could think I might expose him in a bigger arena and come after me. Bodhi's smile faded and he sighed. Gosh, Sales, if I could get my hands on him. She stroked his face. I know, baby. And I think you might be right, at least, we could consider it because I have an idea. Maybe if I did an interview with you and not mention names, but make it clear where I come from, what I've seen. Bart will know I'm ready and willing to talk about him. He might panic. He might make a mistake and then we've got him. Bodhi looked unhappy. Using yourself as bait is not an answer. We have to use what is available to us, Bodhi. Until the threat of Bart Foy is gone, then I don't know how to really feel free. Be free. I don't want a death threat to follow me around forever. Bodhi took her in his arms. I know. I know. He sighed, pressing his lips to her temple. We'll work it out. We'll work something out. She tilted her head up for a kiss. In the meantime, I've been thinking about Grady Mallory's offer. Bodhi looked surprised. You have. That's great news. I still don't think I'm right to be an art tutor, she said, sitting down on the couch with him. But I know what I'm good at and that's organization, scheduling, all the dull stuff. She grinned at Bodhi. I know, it's anathema to you, but it gives me a sense of control. If the foundation is opening a branch in Los Angeles, then they'll need someone like that. Bodhi smiled at her enthusiasm. I see you as much more than a paper pusher, sailor. Well, maybe I could handle the charitable part, arrange benefits, or marketing, something like that. I don't have an awful lot of experience in anything, as you know, she grinned at his wicked smile, except some things, Mr. Creed, I think I'm becoming an expert. I would agree with that. Fair enough. She snuggled into his arms. So, what did you have in mind for today? Recording sessions? His fingers were trailing up and down her spine. I was thinking of going into the recording studio, but not recording. Maybe Bodhi's right. Maybe no, one can touch us. In the next few hours, she would be shown in the most painful way possible, just how wrong they both were. You got the words wrong again, Tim complained, and Soleil rolled her eyes, going back over the song they were singing together again. As usual, the Los Angeles traffic had ground to a halt, and the clock was edging ever nearer to nine. Tim didn't seem bothered by being late, but it made her feel like a bad aunt, so she deliberately set off a few minutes earlier, only to be hamstrung by a road traffic accident up ahead. Dang it, she said, for once not cursing in Tim's presence. That made her feel like a bad aunt, too. She glanced over to Tim. He was so different from the shy, sullen boy she'd met almost a year ago. He had thrived under Bodhi, sailors, and she had to admit, even her own care. Hey kiddo, you talked to your mom this week? Tim nodded. She says she's feeling a lot better now. I talked to Evan too. You did. That's good. Yeah. I didn't tell dad that. I don't think he likes Evan. Soleil smiled at Tim. He just doesn't know him, buddy. I think your dad's just a little jealous that Evan got to bring you up for so many years. Okay. But that's not Evan's fault. No, it's not. And it's not your dad's, it's just how things are. Tim was silent for a long time. I think it's my mom's fault. I feel kind of angry with her. Soleil shook her head. No, Timbo. Sometimes we make decisions based on what is the best at the time. Your mom made a choice. 
whether it was the best one or not, it was her choice. That's all anyone could do. I don't want to go back to live with her. That shocked Soleil, and she swallowed a sudden lump in her throat. Why not, pal? Because I think I make her sad. That's why she went away. Tim's word broke Soleil's heart. No, sweetheart, you didn't make her sad. And look at it this way, because your mom was sad, and that happens to us from time to time, you got to know your dad and Sailor and me. And your grandma and Claudio and Tag, of course. Tim smiled at the mention of his canine friend back in Italy. I'd like a dog. Talk to your dad, I'm sure he'd get you one. Tim nodded happily. I like living with dad and Sailor and you. Will you live with us forever? Soleil touched, grinned at him. Sure you want me to? You know those missing Pop-Tarts? That was me. Tim laughed. I knew they hadn't been stolen. Soleil peered out at the traffic in frustration. Timbo, I'm going to get off the freeway here and go a different way. It might make us a little late but not more than this damn traffic will. Okay with you? Sure. Soleil pulled the car onto the off-ramp and off the freeway, not noticing the blackout SV follow suit behind them. They drove around the back streets for a while, until they were only a few blocks from Tim's school. So, what you got on today, kid? Soleil didn't finish her sentence, as her car was side-slammed by the black SV. It cornered their vehicle, slamming into it again and again, and didn't let up until both Soleil and Tim were both stunned and concussed. Then Tim's door was wrenched open, and he was grabbed by a large man. Tim started to scream, and Soleil, yelling, was about to get out of her seat when she was grabbed and pinned back against her seat by someone who jumped in the back of her car. A hand was clamped over her mouth. A tall man, dragging Tim around to Soleil's door, held Tim's head, so he was staring directly at Soleil. Now watch, Timmy. Watch what happens when you disobey me. Soleil, unable to move, saw Udo slip into the passenger seat. In his hand, a switchblade knife. Soleil tried to free herself as Udo cut open her shirt, but when she knew it was too late, she bit the hand covering her mouth. As the man behind her cursed, she turned to Tim with desperation in her eyes. Don't watch, Timmy, close your eyes. Bart Foy smiled at her. No, do watch, Timmy, this will be fun. Udo stabbed Soleil repeatedly as Tim screamed. Solly gasped as the knife cut through her belly again and again, viciously, Udo smiling the entire time before Bart told him to stop. Bart released a sobbing, hysterical Tim to his guard, and stepped up to the dying woman. Soleil moaned, her wounds pumping her precious blood out of her body. If you live long enough, beautiful girl, tell Sailor that this can happen to her bastard lover's son or it can happen to her. It's her choice. Bart ran a fingertip down Soleil's face as she bled out. A shame. What a lovely woman. He looked at Udo who handed him the knife, and with one brutal movement, Bart plunged the blade into Soleil's stomach one last time. She vomited as she heard Tim screaming getting further away. Soleil now left alone, her hands freed, knew she was dying. She clutched the wounds on her abdomen and threw herself out of the car onto the hot asphalt, causing a scene, desperately to get her message across before she died. She heard voices, alarms, sirens, the sound of people rushing to her aid. The pain was unimaginable. It's too late, it's too late. I'm dead. As the first helper reached her, she pulled his head close and repeated what Bart had said to her. Tell them, tell them I'm sorry Bodhi Sailor Tim saved him. Geez, the cycle courier bent over the bloodied, brutalized girl on the road and tried to give her first aid. Another woman rushed over. I've called 911. The cyclist gave the stricken woman chest compressions as the woman blew oxygen into the girl's lungs. She told him to stop a moment, felt for a pulse, then shook her head. She's gone. She's gone. A cop car pulled up then and two cops rushed over. The cyclist, trembling, shook his head. She's dead. One of the cops was staring down at Soleil's dead body intently, and then he cursed loudly. What? That's Bodhi Creed's girlfriend. Geez, that's his girlfriend. The other cop looked shocked. Damn it, call it in. And someone get over to Bodhi Creed's house. This is going to be all over the news. 
as the first cop called in the murder, he examined Soleil's car and paled. Gosh, look. He held up a child's knapsack. She had a kid in the car, where's the kid? Where's the damn kid? Bodhi and Sailor sat on the couch, too shocked and devastated to say anything. The detective watched them carefully. You understand what I'm saying? Bodhi turned pained eyes to him. Soleil is dead and my son is missing. Missing. The detective, Jim Wallace, nodded. Obviously this has just happened, so we're gathering information. Before she died, Ms. Fonseca told a witness that she was given a message for you, Miss King. Something like, this will happen to the boy, or it will happen to you. Your choice. Does that mean anything? Sailor, haunted, nodded. She explained everything about her escape from Bartholomew Foy and the cult, how Bay Tamba had been dragged into it, and now Solly. Oh gosh, Solly, I'm sorry. He likes to kill women, detective. That's the crux of the matter. He wants to kill me. That's why he's holding Tim, so that I'll go to him. She turned to Bodhi. Bodhi, I have to go to him. It's Tim's only chance. No. Both Bodhi and Jim Wallace were vehement in their response. That's not an option, Miss King, continued Jim Wallace as Bodhi dropped his face into his hands. We will find Tim, I promise you. You don't know Bart, Sailor said in despair. He has no humanity, no morality, and his people are everywhere. He probably has some in law enforcement. I don't doubt it, Jim said grimly, but I can promise you for sure he will not get away with this. His cell phone rang, and he excused himself. Bodhi put his arms around Sailor, so lays dead. His voice was breaking, and he leaned his head against her. And my son, gosh. Sailor couldn't help the tears. I can't believe it, she whispered. I'm so sorry, Bodhi. If I hadn't. Don't finish that sentence, he said, his eyes closed. I couldn't live without you, Sailor. This is when it ends, you know. This is when Bart Foy is brought to his knees. Sailor nodded. Even if it costs me everything, Bodhi, I will get Tim back for you. Bodhi opened his eyes and gazed at her. We do this together, okay? Don't you dare sacrifice yourself. Bart Foy doesn't get to kill anyone else. He shook his head in disbelief. I have to call Claudio, tell him. How the hell am I going to do that? Jim Wallace came back a short time later. Mr. Creed, I'm sorry to have to ask you to do this, but we need someone to identify Ms. Fonseca's body. Bodhi nodded, his face drained of color. Of course. I have to call her brother, I think he's still in Seattle, he'll want to come and claim her body once the medical examiner releases it. Of course. Look, we're going to keep some people here for protection and to keep the press away. Someone must have called them almost as soon as it happened. Some journalists are outside now, but we're keeping them away from the gate. Would you come with us now, Mr. Creed, before they start thronging? Sailor told him she would wait for him at home, and he went to grab a sweater. Sailor pulled Jim Wallace aside. How did she die, Detective Wallace? Please tell me. Bart, he has a favorite method. Jim Wallace hesitated, then sighed. Miss Fonseca was stabbed repeatedly, Miss King. In the abdomen? He nodded and Sailor sighed. Yes. That's Bart's M.O. That's what turns him on. I just hope to God that Tim didn't see it happen. I hope so too. Bodhi gazed down at the face of his much-loved friend. In death, Soleil was just as beautiful, but the sparkle, her light, her humor, her energy, now Bodhi knew what the term snuffed out really meant. Gosh, Solly, I'm so sorry, he whispered again and again. Her eyes were closed, and Bodhi couldn't understand how he'd never see them dance with laughter again. How could Soleil of all people be dead? Funny, smart, seductive, loving Solly. His tears dripped onto her face as he kissed her cold forehead, and he heard the medical examiner coughed. Jim Wallace touched his arm. I'm sorry, Mr. Creed, but you know, chain of evidence. Bodhi nodded. Of course. He shook his head, still unable to believe Soleil was dead. He turned to Jim Wallace. We need to call Claudio Fonseca now before the press put this online. They were too late. 
Sailor took the call from a near hysterical Claudio, who screamed at her that it was her fault Soleil was dead, and why the hell hadn't they called him immediately, and how could his beloved sister be dead? Sailor took it all, every word of abuse, feeling like she deserved it. Finally, when Claudio, sobbing, had calmed down, he asked to speak to Bodhi. He's not here, Claudio, he's at the medical examiner's office, identifying Solly's body. Another wave of ranting and cursing in Italian. Sailor waited for him to finish, feeling as if she were in the body of someone else. Numb. Claudio, Tim is missing. They took Tim. If you think you're the only one blaming me for this, you're wrong. The phone went dead. Sailor put her cell phone down gently and, stealing herself, switched on the television. Sure enough, Soleil's murder was breaking news on every channel. A photograph of Bodhi Creed's now dead girlfriend was flashed up, along with a photograph of Tim. Too late, Sailor realized they had forgotten someone in the terror, the horror of Tim's abduction. Someone who, if they had seen this broadcast, would now be in hysterics. Tim's mother. Gemma. Her legs shaking, Sailor went to find a police officer. There was a commotion at the front door, and for a terrible moment, Sailor thought the press had got in. A moment later, a smartly dressed man with short brown hair and a kind but serious face approached her. Miss King? Sailor nodded, glancing at the officer behind the newcomer, who nodded. The visitor saw her hesitation and reached into his pocket for his ID. Miss King, my name is Evan Teal, I'm an FBI agent and... Sailor recognized the pain in his eyes and immediately knew just who he was. And the man who brought up Tim. Evan Teal nodded, and Sailor did the only thing she could think of to do in this situation. She hugged him. Evan hugged her back tightly. In this situation, they were family even if they had never met before. When they released each other, Sailor led him to sit on the couch with her. Evan ran a hand through his short brown curls. Sailor, please, just tell me everything. Everything. I called Gemma, she's on her way down, so for everyone's benefit, let's get it all out in the open. Sailor had braced herself for the torrent of rage coming her way, but when Claudio and Gemma arrived at the same time, she realized she had underestimated. The grief and anger were all consuming and entirely directed at her, so much so that by the time Bodhi arrived home, Sailor had been corned by both of them and was almost cringing at the force of their barrage. What is going on? Bodhi batted Claudio and Gemma out of the way and stepped in front of Sailor. Enough. Both Claudio and Gemma were silent then. Bodhi turned to Sailor. You okay, baby? She nodded, too stunned to speak. Bodhi turned back to his friend, and the mother of his beloved Tim. Stop it, he said gently, both of you. This isn't Sailor's fault. This is the work of a very, very sick man. Claudio, I can't begin to tell you how sorry I am, Soleil didn't deserve this. She was murdered because I stupidly believed she and Tim were safe, that Sailor was the only one at risk. I should have insisted on them taking a bodyguard, but, from what I understand, they were ambushed by a few people. And my son? Gemma's voice broke. Our son, our son has been taken, yes. But I believe he is alive. Bart Foy wants Sailor, so he'll keep Tim alive as long as he hasn't got her. Gemma sneered at him. So, give her to him, what is she to me? What is she worth when Tim's life is on the line? Sailor closed her eyes. Nothing. I am worth nothing. When Bodhi spoke, the steel in his voice was obvious. She is the love of my life, Gemma. Just as Tim is. Don't ever, ever talk like that about Sailor again. Do you understand me? Gemma turned away, then exclaimed as Evan Teal re-entered the room. Evan! She flew across the room into his arms. Evan looked uncomfortable, glancing over Gemma's shoulder at Bodhi, then Sailor. When Gemma released him, he stepped forward and offered Bodhi his hand. Evan Teal. Bodhi shook it. Bodhi Creed. Thanks for being here, Evan. Thanks for looking after. His voice broke and Sailor went to him, ignoring Claudio's glowering look. She stroked Bodhi's back and he wrapped his arms around her, burying his face in her hair. 
She could feel his silent sobs rack his body. Okay, said Evan calmly after a few minutes, let's all be calm now and work this problem through. Shall we sit? They were about to sit when another detective came in and grabbed the remote. You have to see this. He flicked on the television and immediately an image of Soleil, bleeding out on the asphalt where she was found flicked up on the screen. Claudio collapsed to the floor, batting Bodhi's hand away, and as they watched Dee in mounting horror, the newscaster told the world about the murder, the kidnapping. A photograph of Tim, obviously taken from a distance at his school. Where did they get that? Bodhi was incensed but then a moment later, something far worse was shown. A video, taken from an awkward angle above a familiar scene. Three people. In bed. Sailor gasped in horror as the television news broadcast the pictures of her being in bed with both Soleil and Bodhi to millions of viewers worldwide. For a long moment they all froze, then Claudio lunged for Bodhi. Sailor sat in the darkened guesthouse, watching Claudio and Bodhi argue violently in the main house. After Claudio had seen the video of his beloved sister with his friend and the woman he blamed for her death, he had gone mad, pounding on Bodhi who just seemed to take it. After Evan and another cop hauled Claudio off of him, Bodhi had simply got to his feet and turned to her. Go wait in the guesthouse, baby. You don't need to hear this. She had fled but now she felt wretched. Gosh, was it worth it? All this horror, this pain? Sailor pulled her legs up to her chest and rested her face on her knees. How the hell were they going to get Tim back if she, Sailor, was to remain safe? She couldn't see a way. Take me, she willed Bart, come take me, kill me and leave them all alone. She kept seeing the image of Soleil, beautiful, amazing Soleil, stabbed to death. It should have been me. She started as a cell phone began to ring, and she frowned. Her own cell phone was back in the main house, and there was no landline. Sailor got up, trying to trace the sound of the phone. She walked around, confused, until she traced it to the bookcase. She pulled out a heavy copy of Othello and opened it. The book had been hollowed out and inside a ringing cell phone. She took the call. My darling sailor. Her blood like ice, sailor heard Bart's voice for the first time in nearly a year. It sent horror shooting through her, her stomach clenched, her heart beat faster. You bastard. Where's Tim? What have you done to him? Bart laughed softly. He's fine, a little, how shall I say this, a little subdued, a little traumatized. It was his first time seeing a killing. Sailor's throat closed up and her knees gave way. She sank to the floor. You made him watch you kill Soleil? You. She didn't have the words. What a beautiful woman, what a pleasure to kill her. Now don't collapse on me, Sailor, you need to listen to me. Sit back on that couch. He was watching her. Of course. That's how they got the footage of her, Bodhi and Soleil. She glanced around the room and Bart laughed. Hello, pretty girl. Yes, sailor, I can see you. I've been watching you for months now, messing with that sleazy rock star and the now dead skank. Well, 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 you broke the rules, sailor. You gave away what's mine. You will have to be punished. Sailor went to the corner of the room and scooched down in it, so that people in the main house wouldn't be able to see her distress. Please, Bart, don't hurt him. I beg you. Don't hurt him. Sailor, you have my word that I will not harm the child if you do exactly what I say. If you give yourself to me. Anything, anything. Please just tell me what I have to do. Bart laughed softly. That's my sailor girl. Now listen. After a still raging Claudio had left to go see his sister's body and make arrangements, Evan, who Bodhi had warmed to immensely, took a weeping Gemma back to her hotel. I'll come back in the morning, Bodhi, if I may. I want to be as much help as I can. Bodhi shook his hand, holding his gaze. Thank you, Evan. Not just for today, but for bringing my son up to be a wonderful man. I can never thank you enough. Evan smiled a little shyly. I loved him, and it was entirely my pleasure. I'm glad you have bonded so well. He loves you, Bodhi, he really does. Bodhi tried to hold back the tears, but was unable. Thank you, Evan. 
We will get him back safely, Bodhi, if it's the last thing I do. I swear that to you. Bodhi nodded but couldn't speak. After they had left, Gemma still refusing to speak to Bodhi, Bodhi went to the guest house to find Sailor curled up on the sofa, her eyes haunted. Bodhi sat beside her and wrapped his arms around her. Well, my beautiful girl, now it's a waiting game. The FBI want to wait for Bart to get in touch. We already know what he wants, but he's not going to get it. Sailor said nothing but buried her face in his neck. Bodhi could feel her trembling. Try not to dwell on what Claudio and Gemma said to you, it came from a place of grief. They were right. This is my fault. No, Bodhi's voice was harsh and he made her look him in the eye. It's not. It's the work of a madman, a psychopath. You did nothing wrong, do you hear me? I would not change a moment of time I spent with you. Nor would Tim, nor would Soleil. I am so in love with you, sailor. You are my world as much as Tim, as much as Soleil was. Gosh. It hurts to hear her name in the past tense, Sailor said, her voice breaking. I can't believe she's dead. When I saw that photograph of her body, Bodhi, it was like seeing those photographs of Tilly all over again. The way she was killed, exactly the same. Bart has taken every important female figure in my life away from me. My mother, Tilly, Soleil. I can't help feeling that if I had just given him what he wants. That's bullshit. Bodhi was up now, pacing. Sailor, I see you murdered every night in nightmares, I can't stop them. Stabbed to death like Soleil was, I cannot handle you talking like that. If I lost you. Bodhi sighed, the sadness inside him weighing him down. He stared up at the ceiling, and his attention was caught by the tiniest red light blinking. He sat up and cursed. The jerk had put cameras everywhere. Bodhi was about to reach up and rip the camera out of its hiding place behind the slatted door of the closet when he heard a crash, and Sailor cry out. He darted into the kitchen where he saw her on the floor, moaning, holding her left arm, which he could see straight away was broken. What happened? I was trying to reach the other skillet, the one that's on the top of the cabinet. Sailor winced as Bodhi gently held her broken arm. I slipped. Oh damn. Come on. He swept her up into his arms easily. You need to get to the hospital. Cedars is closest. Sailor, gasping with pain, stopped him. Could you grab my jeans? I can't go to the hospital in my underwear? Bodhi half smiled. The doctors wouldn't mind. Okay, just stay here for a moment. As Bodhi went to the bedroom, Sailor very deliberately looked at the top of the oven to the extractor hood and said, Cedar Sinai. Cedar Sinai. Bodhi was back almost immediately. You okay? She nodded and he helped her pull on her jeans and sweater, then dressed himself quickly. They walked out to the garage, his security detail jumping to attention. We need to get to Cedars, Sailor has broken her arm. Okay on it. Bodhi helped Sailor into the back of the SUV, but then turned back to another man. Greg, sweep the entire property for cameras and any other surveillance devices. That jerk Foy has been watching us, that's how they got the video of us. Right, boss? Bodhi got into the car with Sailor, helping her put her seatbelt on. What a stupid idiot I am, she said, apologetically. This is the last thing you need. Could have happened to anyone, baby. Let's get you fixed up. Bart Foy watched the video feed in satisfaction. Sailor had executed his plan perfectly. He got a little extra thrill at seeing her hurt, which would be nothing to how he would feel later, her blood on his hands, her lifeless body in his arms. Soon so soon. He turned to the man waiting. Blindfold the kid. We need to get to Cedar Sinai. Sailor watched the doctor as he wound the last piece of plaster-soaked bandage around her arm. Now, it's going to be painful for quite a while. Thankfully, it's a straight break, so you should be okay in time. Are you in much pain? Sailor nodded. A little. The doctor smiled at her. I'll go get you some pain relief. Would you like me to ask Mr. Creed to come in now? Sailor swallowed hard. Not just yet, I need some time. The doctor patted her good arm. Of course. I'll be right back. 
As soon as he left, Sailor grabbed every sharp implement she could find, a scalpel, scissors, and darted to the door. She could see Bodhi at the end of the hall, talking to the doctor. Quickly, she sped across the hall to the elevator and pressed the call button. She flattened herself against the wall as she waited, then darted in and pressed the button to the basement. In the elevator, she shoved the scalpel and scissors down the side of her still malleable cast. As the elevator reached the basement, she slipped out and waited. Sailor. She heard Tim's voice as he was dragged into the light by Bart. Salem, Bart's main henchman, aimed a gun at her, and Sailor also saw Udo, the security guard Tim had been scared of. Tim looked unharmed, but his eyes were haunted, and he was obviously terrified. Send Tim over, and as soon as he's in the elevator, I'm yours. Sailor managed to keep her voice steady. Bart looked amused but nodded to Udo. The big man walked Tim over to her, and as they reached her, Tim threw his arms around Sailor and burst into tears. They killed Auntie Sally, he sobbed, and she hugged him tightly, her own tears flowing. I know, baby, I know. Look, Timmy, when you get in the elevator, press number nine and don't get out or speak to anyone else. Your dad is up there. Tell him, her voice broke, tell him I'm sorry and that I love you both so much. So much. I'm not leaving you, Tim began to wail, but Sailor, barely keeping herself calm, pushed him gently into the elevator. You have to, baby, please. I love you. Sailor. She couldn't bear it any longer and pushed the close door button. I love you so much, she repeated as she heard him wailing and screaming her name. She watched as the elevator climbed to floor nine, then felt a pistol being pushed against the small of her back. Time to go, Sailor, Bart said with a slight edge in his voice, and nodding, she was led to his car and to her certain death. Bodhi got alarmed when the doctor who was treating Sailor came to see him. Has Miss King come by here? I can't find her. Bodhi's heart began thumping. No, she was in the treatment room. Did you leave her alone? Yes, to get some pain medication. Where is she? Bodhi felt the panic rise up inside of him, but the next moment he heard the scream of a child, a child screaming for his daddy, and saw Tim rushing towards him. Bodhi ran to sweep Tim up in his arms and hug him tightly. Oh gosh, Timbo, Timbo, I love you, I love you. Daddy, my daddy. Tim held onto Bodhi's neck so tightly he was almost strangling him, but Bodhi didn't care. There was chaos all around him. Daddy, Tim was sobbing, tears and snot dripping down his face, Sailor. Sailor came and she said to find you and the bad man had a gun and he took her, Daddy, Daddy. Bodhi's blood ran cold and he closed his eyes. Of course. Of course. Sailor had sacrificed herself for Tim. Why hadn't he realized? She'd broken her own arm to get here. Oh gosh. The doctor ushered them into a private room and began to examine Tim. The child wriggled, never taking his eyes off his father. Daddy, they put a blindfold on me to come here, but it came loose, and I could see, Daddy. I could see the way to where they took me. Bodhi gaped at his son as the boy recited the journey back to where Bodhi hoped against hope they would be able to find Sailor before Bart Foy carried out his promise to end her life. They hadn't gone far, Sailor realized, as they drove out of the city. They hadn't blindfolded her. Why would they need to blindfold a dead woman? They arrived at a disused airplane hangar just outside the city. She was alone with Bart now. He pulled up a chair and sat in front of her. Gently, he undid the buttons on the front of her dress and pulled the fabric apart, exposing her belly. Sailor felt strangely disconnected. She was about to be murdered, horrifically, painfully, and yet. She could only feel relieved that Tim was safe. Maybe those few deliriously happy months she had spent with Bodhi and Tim were her reward for going to her death so easily. Bart smiled at her. So, we're here at last, and now I will begin the process of ending your life, sailor. As I can hear the sirens, I won't make a long speech. He had a switchblade knife. Udo used this to kill your beautiful friend. Sailor drew in a sharp intake of breath as Bart placed the tip of the knife in the hollow of her navel. Sailor, I'm not going to lie and tell you your death will be quick and painless. Quite the opposite. I'm going to gut you, darling, slowly and he pushed the blade deep into her belly. 
Sailor couldn't believe the pain, it was like nothing she had ever experienced before. Every severed nerve ending screamed with agony, and as Bart yanked the knife out, blood began to pump from the wound, soaking her skin, her underwear. Sailor felt her head whirl, her body react to the assault. Bart watched her with obvious enjoyment. See my lovely sailor? I remember doing this to your mother. She was almost as beautiful as you. He stabbed her again, and Sailor cried out as the knife sunk into her stomach. Your mother begged me for her life. But I told her she betrayed me. She betrayed you, Sailor. She was going to take you away from your rightful place. He sunk the knife into her belly again, and Sailor began to feel lightheaded, her chest constricting as she began to lose consciousness. She could smell her blood as it pumped from her wounds. Bart leaned in and kissed her mouth. She was going to take you away from me, your future husband, Sailor. He smiled as he stabbed her one last time, an inch above her navel. She was going to take you away from me, your father, Sailor. Sailor's eyes opened in horror and suddenly, being butchered by this man's knife wasn't the most horrific thing in her life. You're lying, she gasped and Bart laughed. You know I'm not, lovely one. My sailor, my daughter. He cut the ropes binding her and laid her on the floor. Sailor, struggling to breathe now, tried to press her hand against the wounds, tried to stem the blood but she knew it was useless now. Bart stroked her face tenderly and picked up a camera. Just some photographs to send to your beloved Bodhi Creed. Sailor closed her eyes. It was over. All over. She would die here and... She was hovering at the very edge of life, when from what seemed far away there were voices, shouting, angry, desperate. She could barely open her eyes, but when she did, it was in short blinks. 1. Bodhi's beautiful face, tears streaming down his face, begging her to live. I have brought you so much pain, my love. 2. Bart Foy's face, her father's face creasing with rage. 3. Bodhi's face, roaring with anger, with a vengeance, as he pumped bullets into Bart's head, and her father's smile being blown off his face. 4. Bodhi, oh gosh Bodhi, my love, my life, goodbye. Then all was darkness, all was nothing. Three months later, Bodhi held the letter that he had read over and over since that terrible day. The letter his guard had found in the kitchen drawer in the guest house as he swept for bugs. My darling, darling Bodhi. By now, you will know what I have done, and I ask for your forgiveness. There was never any other option if we were to get Tim back safely, and I want you to know that if I'm dead, it was all worth it if Tim is back in your arms. I love you. You have given me everything, and I am so sorry that my presence has been so destructive. I'm sorry for Soleil's death, I loved her so much as we all did, and I hate that she died because of me. She didn't deserve to die like that. Bodhi, all I ask is that you remember how much I loved you with my whole heart, and I also ask that you go on and love like that again. Don't grieve too long. Remember, but don't grieve. If Tim is safe, then I died for a good reason, the best reason. I can't think of anything else to say but thank you, and I love you so, so much, my precious darling Bodhi. Always, your sailor. Bodhi squeezed his eyes shut. She's gone. She's gone. He had to keep saying that to himself, to believe it. He put the letter down and took up the other one. The one she had written in the hospital. The hospital where they had fought to save her life, to repair her body, to heal the horrific injuries Bart Foy, her biological father, had inflicted on her. She was in a coma for a week, then as she began to emerge from it, the doctor had come to him, hope in his eyes. She's turned a corner. And Bodhi had only known relief like that once before, when his son had come back to him. But then, a week later, after some very groggy conversations, and a feeling she was holding back on him, Sailor had disappeared from the hospital, whisked away in the middle of the night by a mysterious benefactor. The hospital had apologized to Bodhi, but as Sailor had no official next of kin, they had been bound from telling him. Her surgeon handed him the second letter she had written him. My love, my Bodhi. Forgive me. After everything we have been through, I feel this is the only way for me. I bring you bad luck, my love, and now, knowing Bart Foy was my father, 
I can't face the future knowing I might have some of his traits. I'm so confused, my love. I have to go away, and I have asked a friend to help me in this. Please, please don't try and find me. Your life and Tim's life will be better without me. I love you. Sailor. It was rambling, the handwriting shaky, and Bodhi knew she hadn't been thinking straight, but it still hurt. And now, after three months, Sailor had managed to keep herself hidden away, away from all of the detectives he'd paid hundreds of thousands to find her. Hidden, alone. He had no idea where she was. Until now. This morning, Grady Mallory had come to him and revealed himself as Sailor's mysterious benefactor. Bodhi had been angry, but Grady had calmly explained that he only did what Sailor asked him. Bodhi stared at the man. So, why are you telling me now? Because I'm making a choice, a choice to do what I think is right. What I think Sailor actually wants, now she can think straight. She's been having counseling, we arranged it for her. Also, Flory found out, and she's been kicking my ass about it. Bodhi's mouth hitched up in a half-smile at that. Where is Sailor? Grady hesitated, then nodded. I'll take you to her. Bodhi's head had whirled, joy, anger, nervousness. He shook Tim awake and insisted the boy join them. Sailor can't get too mad if Tim's there as well. He told Grady in a low voice, and Grady chuckled. Chicken. You know it. Grady drove them into the middle of Oregon's Mount Hood National Forest, to Lost Lake. Bodhi glanced over at Grady when he saw the sign. Really? Just coincidence, I promise. My family has a cabin here. Grady chuckled as Bodhi rolled his eyes. He drove up to a cabin situated on the lake, and they got out. Grady knocked at the cabin, but then nodded. I thought so. She likes to walk to the jetty on the lake and sit with her feet in the water. He showed Bodhi the way but then held back. You need some privacy. Holding Tim's hand, Bodhi walked around the front of the cabin and toward the lake. In the distance, along a wooden jetty, he saw a figure standing at the end, her long dark hair blowing in the breeze. His heart filled with love as he saw her. Tim shook his hand free and began to run, and Bodhi led him. Sailor. Sailor. She turned, and Bodhi stopped, the shock so big he couldn't breathe for a second. Sailor put a hand over the small bump on her belly, but bent down to hug Tim tightly as he reached her. Bodhi put one foot in front of the other, but didn't know how he would be able to reach them. Pregnant. How was this possible? She had been stabbed, for Christ's sakes, the surgeon hadn't mentioned a pregnancy. There was only one answer. It wasn't his. Bodhi stopped walking, his heart breaking all over again. Tim was leading Sailor by the hand down the jetty towards him, and for Bodhi, it was a moment of panic. What do I do? What do I say? Sailor had never looked more beautiful, her caramel skin glowing, her eyes haunted but soft with love. Hello, Bodhi. He stared back at her, a million questions going through his mind. She smiled gently and nodded, reading his mind. It's yours, Bodhi. Your child. I don't know how everybody missed it, but I was pregnant, just, when they took me to the hospital. Less than a month, which is why the embryo survived the stabbing. I'm four months gone. Bodhi couldn't speak, and it took a single, simple sentence from his son to make him come to his senses. Tim looked up at Sailor, his eyes shining with excitement. So, I'm going to be a big brother? Sailor laughed, tears dropping down her face. Yes, sweetie, the best big brother ever. Finally, Bodhi was able to move, and he took her in his arms. Why did you run away? I didn't think I was good enough for you, Sailor said, her voice breaking. Bodhi, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I've been living out here regretting running away ever since, but I didn't know how to make it right. I'm so glad you're here, so so happy. And Bodhi kissed her passionately, not caring that Tim was watching. I love you, Sailor King, and our baby. We are a family and don't you ever forget it. We face things together, good or bad. She nodded and Bodhi kissed her again, his heart swelling with relief and love and joy. He put his hand on her belly. After all you went through, is this safe? She nodded. I have a good doctor in Portland. 
She looked down at Tim. Look, shall we go inside? I can make us some cocoa. That breeze is a bit stiff. Tim nodded eagerly, and she took his hand and Bodie's, and they walked back to her cabin, collecting a grinning, not at all sorry Grady on the way. One year later, Sailor grappled with her very wriggly daughter as she tried to change her diaper. Solly Creed, if you don't start behaving, I swear. Swear to God what? Bodie was laughing as she struggled with her daughter. Sailor glared at him. Could you put the GoPro down, Rockstar, and help me? This photo op was your idea. They were in San Francisco for the launch of Bodie's first album in a few years, and as they got ready at their hotel, they could already hear the crowds of fans chanting his name. Bodie took his daughter from Sailor's arms, and immediately the girl calmed down, gurgling with pleasure, grinning at her father. Daddy's girl, Sailor grumbled but laughed, as Bodie grimaced at the dirty diaper he was being allowed to change. Hey, I had to carry that little monster for nine months. You can change a diaper. Later, as they made their way to the launch in the cab, Tim perched on Bodie's knee, Solly asleep in her mother's arms, Bodie looked over at Sailor. Hey, beautiful. You know that question I was going to ask you a while back? Sailor grinned, knowing exactly what he was going to ask her, put her finger to her lips. Later, she said, when the kids are asleep. Why? Sailor leaned in to whisper in Bodhi's ear. Because I have a very, very special way of saying yes, Bodhi Creed, and believe me, you're not going to want to miss that. The End Rockstar Untamed Extended Epilogue Tuscany, Italy August Sailor King stood at the doorway to the villa that she and Bodhi had purchased a little over a year ago. She breathed in the sultry, warm air of the Tuscany hills, listening to the quiet murmur of their guests as they waited for her in the makeshift aisle under the pergola. Today, exactly five years after she'd escaped from the children of love and her psychotic, incestuous father, Bartholomew Foy, she would marry the man who had shown her what real, true, deep love was. The man who the world knew and adored, but who would give up every bit of his fame, his success, his wealth, for her and their children. Tim, Bodhi's son from a previous relationship, was now 15 years old and a devoted big brother to his four-year-old sister Soleil, sailor and Bodhi's child. Soleil was eager to get going, to throw flower petals along the aisle in front of her mother, but Sailor held her back for a moment, wanting to take stock. Tim had offered to walk her down the aisle, but she had told him that Bodhi needed him to be his best man. She didn't mind that she wouldn't be led down the aisle by a man. She let out a long breath, feeling the tension in her body dissipate. They had made it. The wedding had been planned for so long, postponed and rescheduled until Bodhi could figure out a way to fulfill his recording contract with Quartet and go on tour, and then take another long sabbatical with his family. So now they were here, in their beautiful home, where no press could find them, no rabid fans could turn up on their doorstep. Their haven, their paradise. She heard a noise behind her and turned, her hand flying up to her mouth when she saw who was behind her. The surprise and joy flooded through her, and tears started to drop down her face. I thought you weren't going to come, I thought, oh my gosh. And she ran into his arms. Los Angeles, California. The previous December. Mama. Yes, Freckle. Why is my name sorry? Sailor grinned at her daughter. Solly, not sorry. It's short for Soleil Freckle. We named you after your auntie, remember? Solly was rolling around on Sailor and Bodie's bed, teasing their little cavalier King Charles Spaniel, Dude. Dude licked Solly's face and she giggled. Dude don't lick, Sailor scooped the puppy and kissed its furry head. She laid down next to her daughter and tickled her. Are you excited about going on the plane, little one? Seeing Nana? Solly nodded. Already at four years old, Solly was a seasoned passenger on Bodhi's private jet. And tonight, they would all fly over to Italy to spend Christmas in their new home. Tim, almost as tall as Bodhi now, and top of his class at school, was already bragging to his friends about learning Italian, and how many of the beautiful girls he already knew there. Where are my gorgeous girls? 
Sailor and Sally heard Bodhi's voice as he called, and grinning, Sailor pulled the comforter over them. Let's hide from Dada Freckle and surprise him. She heard Bodhi come into the bedroom and give a low chuckle. Now where are my girls? Hey dude, what did you do with them? Eat them? Snuffle them? Now wait. I think you ate them because I see a chubby little leggy. He pulled on Sally's exposed leg and she burst into giggles, pushing back the comforter and yelling to him. He swept her up into her arms. Were you hiding from me? You cheeky monkey. Sally was laughing hard now, easily amused by their silly game. Sailor stuck her head out from under the comforter and grinned up at her fiancé. All Sally's idea, so blame her. Sally looked outraged. No mama, and Bodhi and Sailor laughed. Sailor crawled out of bed and straightened her clothes, stopping to kiss Bodhi hello. He grinned down at her, and she smiled back, drinking in his gloriously handsome face, his huge green eyes which both of his children had inherited, and his scruffy stubble which saved him from being too beautiful, and instead made his machismo shine out from him. We all packed and ready to go? he asked, swinging Solly in his arms. Sailor grinned. All set. And Tim promised me he'd packed last night. So as soon as he gets home from school, we're good to go. Good. Ah, he said, flopping down into a chair and balancing Sally on one knee, he pulled Sailor onto the other one. The chair gave an ominous groan and Sailor giggled. Bodhi shrugged. It'll be fine. He buried his face in Sailor's neck, his lips against her throat. Gosh, I need this vacation. We need this vacation. He looked at her meaningfully and she grinned. Your mother has been very kind in volunteering to take the kids for a week. I can get Christmas really organized. And we can get some special alone time. Sailor laughed. You have a one-track mind. When it comes to you, hell yes. He kissed her mouth, lingering over the embrace. Sailor closed her eyes, savoring the feel of his lips on hers. It never got old, that feeling of desire that flooded through her when he touched her. I love you, baby. His voice was a whisper, and she nodded. I love you too, big guy. They cuddled in silence for a while, relaxing. Sally fell asleep in her father's arms. Sailor tucked her head onto Bodhi's shoulder, feeling utterly blissed out. Her family, her chaotic, unexpected family, was the reason she breathed in and out, the reason she existed. After the horrors of the past, they had found a place in life which made them all happy. Bodhi had just finished a world tour three intense months of dates in the biggest stadiums and arenas in the world, and he was exhausted but elated. I just love performing, baby. It's the second best feeling in the world. The second best, she'd asked with a grin as they'd talked in bed after the last gig. He chuckled. Stop fishing for compliments, woman, you know this is the best feeling in the world. And they had made love long into the night. The flight to Italy was long with a stop in Paris, and by the time they reached Florence, all four of them were exhausted. Vittoria, Bodhi's sprightly artist mother, greeted them all with hugs and kisses, looking as excited as Dude was to see them after the flight. Vittoria gathered up Sally in one arm and Dude in the other and bore them off. Christina, Vittoria's life partner, hugged Bodhi and Sailor and rolled her eyes at his mother's retreating back. Honestly, she's been unbearable today. Christina laughed as she looped her arm around Tim's shoulders. Like an excited puppy. Gosh, Timbo, you've grown so much, and is that stubble? Bodhi grinned, and Tim looked pleased, despite the stubble being about three hairs on his chin. Sailor felt her tiredness slip away as they got into Vittoria's huge SUV, chatting and laughing. Vittoria and Christina had been together for six years now, and Bodhi had completely accepted his mother's female lover into his life without even a blink. Sailor smiled at him now, she knew how much he missed his mom and the place where he was born. They stayed overnight at Vittoria and Christina's huge city center apartment. Tim struggled to stay up late like a man, but by 10 o'clock, Sailor had to gently shoo him to his bedroom, then went to check on her daughter. Sally, her dark curls messy on the pillow, had been out for the count since after they'd had dinner, and Sailor herself felt weary now. Tomorrow, she and Bodhi would drive out to their new home and prepare it for his mother to bring the kids for Christmas. 
A week to ourselves, Sailor thought now with a smile. It really had been too long. She closed Solly's door and padded quietly back to the living room. She stopped when she heard Bodhi ask his mother a question. Have you seen Claudio? The pain in Bodhi's voice was obvious. Sailor felt sadness shoot through her. Claudio Fonseca had been Bodhi's best friend from childhood, his brother, virtually, and they had been inseparable right up until the day when Claudio's beautiful, wonderful sister Soleil was murdered by the man who was obsessed with Sailor. Claudio blamed Sailor for Soleil's death, and his and Bodhi's friendship was ruptured beyond repair. Sailor felt the weight of guilt on her shoulders for it, but Bodhi insisted that Soleil's death was not Sailor's fault. One day, Claudio will see that and then he will be back, he'd said confidently. But Claudio had cut everyone out of his life who was connected to Bodhi, even his mentor, Vittoria, who had guided him to be one of the most successful young artists in the world. Sailor leaned against the wall outside the living room and sighed, rubbing her eyes. She heard Vittoria's soft voice. No, darling. I'm sorry. I went to his apartment but there was a for sale sign up there. His place out in the country, I'm not sure. I didn't want to intrude if he was there working, or... I don't know. It's been five years, Mom. I know, sweetheart. But Claudio didn't have anyone else but Soleil. I called Maceo Bartoli to find out if he'd heard anything, but he hadn't. Vittoria sighed. Darling, I think it's time you accepted that Claudio no longer wants to be a part of this family. I'm sorry. Later, as they held each other in bed, Sailor could see the sadness in Bodhi's eyes. Do you want to talk about it, baby? But he shook his head, pressing his lips against hers. Both of them were way too tired to do anything else, but they kissed for a while before sleeping. In the morning, a tearful Sailor hugged her children goodbye, and then she and Bodhi set out on the three-hour drive to their new Italian home. Bodhi held her hand as he drove, looking and smiling at her frequently. Big softy, he said fondly and Sailor laughed, wiping her cheeks dry. Sorry, I've just never been without Solly for one night, let alone seven. She smiled then. Just think of the things we could get up to. Two hours later, they arrived at the villa. Secluded, surrounded on one side by cypress trees which snaked down the long driveway, the views over the Tuscan hills were breathtaking. Bodhi, though, only had eyes for one thing. He opened the main door to the villa and let them both into the cool, shaded lobby, beautiful original tiles on the floor, stone arches showing the way in the main house. He dumped their bags and reached for his love. Sailor went into his arms, grinning, knowing what he wanted. Bodhi kissed her lips. And that's only the start of it. She smiled up at him, then scrambled to her feet, offering him her hands. Come on, Creed. Let's get settled in and I'll make us some lunch. Then we'll discuss the rest of your evil seduction plans. Bodhi stroked his hand down her side as she stood in the doorway of the villa, then slid his arms around her waist. Sailor leaned back into him. The evening was settling in, and Bodhi had lit the sconces out on the driveway and down the garden. It's just heaven, Sailor sighed, and Bodhi nuzzled the back of her neck. Could you imagine living here, permanently? She turned in his arms and studied his face. Really? He nodded. Baby? I know you hate Los Angeles. And to be honest, with everything that happened there, I'm tired of the life of a rock star. My contract with Quartet is up after the next album. Sailor chewed her lip. You want out? I want out. Gosh, how much does one man need? I have all the money in the world to support you and the kids, and I just don't need the fame anymore. I'm tired of being Bodhi Creed. I want to be Mr. Sailor King and live in blissful obscurity. Sailor stroked a dark curl back behind his ear. Honey, I think you should do what feels right and whatever that is, I'm there for you 100%. Are you sure you won't get bored? Bodhi grinned. With you and the kids here? No way. Plus, I get to do all the artisanal things that my mom has begged me to do all my life, make furniture, paint. I'll always love music. It's my blood, but now I just want to do it for us, for myself, as a hobby. 
But he added, taking her face in his hands, I realize that you spent nearly half a century shut away somewhere secluded. Totally different scenario, Sailor said with a frown, then her face softened. But it's sweet of you to consider that. Bodhi, the life you describe here, the life we could have. Gosh, it would be like a dream. We'd have to work something out with Gemma. She won't want to have Tim this far away. Bodhi looked a little sheepish. Tim and I have had conversations about it recently. Just casual, nothing heavy, but I wanted to know where his mind was. Come tell me about it outside. I want to enjoy the evening. They sat on the wall running around the grounds. Bodhi leaned over to kiss her. She looked adorable in her white cotton dress, her dark hair messy and tumbling down her back. Bodhi hooked a strand over her ear, and she turned her head to kiss his hand. Tell me about Tim. Well first let me say, that kid is a brain box and way older than his years. Probably not surprising, given what he's been through, what he's witnessed. Sailor nodded, her smile fading, and Bodhi knew he'd hit a nerve. Tim had been abducted by her murderous father, who had forced Tim to watch his Aunt Soleil, being stabbed to death in front of him. Tim had counseling, of course, but it had aged the child. In some ways, it killed both Bodhi and Sailor that a good part of Tim's childhood had been taken from him, and after Tim had been rescued, he'd had to deal with Sailor's almost murder. Then his mother, Gemma, had launched a legal case to reclaim her son. Tim, in the courtroom, had stated without hesitation that he wanted to stay with his father and sailor. The judge had ruled in Bodhi's favor. Tim, of late, had begun to rebuild his relationship with his mother, mostly via video link and email. Gemma had moved to Boston after losing the case and never contacted Bodhi directly. It was Tim's ex-stepfather, Evan, who had come through for them on many occasions, acting as an intermediary with Gemma, and now Evan and Bodhi had become close friends. Bodhi stroked Sailor's face. Don't look so worried, gorgeous one. Tim's pretty clear what he wants to do with his life. He wants to go to college. Harvard. He's already two grades ahead, and they're begging him to go there. Unheard of. So... Tim says he's going to live with his mom during the semester, then spend holidays with us here. Sailor was surprised. Really? Kids had it all thought out for months, apparently. He knew before I did that we'd end up here. Sailor sighed. Gosh, we'll miss him so much. Bodhi nodded, his eyes sad. I know. Solly especially, I think. But then, we could always give her a little playmate. Sailor chuckled. I was waiting for that subject to come up. You think it's time? I do. But obviously, it's up to you. Sailor didn't answer him, just nodded, smiling. Bodhi studied her. Reservations? She hesitated for just a beat. Not exactly. Rather, I'd like to get the wedding out of the way first, then the move. Maybe when we're settled. My first pregnancy was so stressful at the start, which I know was mostly of my own doing, but this time, I want to enjoy every moment. Except for the pain part, obviously. Bodhi grinned. Obviously. Well, I get that, and I think you're right. He caught a lock of her long dark hair, and curled it around his finger. We made it, sweetheart. That's what I keep thinking. We made it. Sailor smiled. He was right. They had gone through hell and come out the other side. Their lives were perfect, almost. Sailor stroked Bodhi's hair. You never talked about identifying her body. Bodhi stared up at the ceiling. Her face looked beautiful, just like she was sleeping. If it hadn't been for the blood, and then when Bart Foy stabbed you and I saw the wounds repeated on you. Gosh, I thought I would go crazy. But you saved me and you killed Bart. I always meant to ask, did you feel changed after you killed him? I thought that I would, but honestly, all I felt was relief. Relief that it was over for you, that he could never hurt you again. Then, when his henchmen were arrested and put away for life, we could begin all over again. Bodhi turned his head to smile at her. And we made it. Sailor smiled and kissed him, but something inside her was shifting, a need to make things right for Bodhi totally. He noticed she was thoughtful. You okay? Sailor nodded. 
Very. Very okay. You make me so happy, Bodhi. I could never make you as happy as you make me. Bodhi chuckled. So not true, baby. Listen, I'm starving. Shall we go grab something to eat? Let's do it. She grabbed her robe and shrugged into it, then followed him to the kitchen, lost in thought. There was a way she could show Bodhi that she could make him happier, but it would take courage on her part, a lot of courage. There was only one thing which seemed to make Bodhi unhappy now, and that was his estrangement from Claudio. I can make it better, she told herself. I can bridge this chasm. And satisfied, she joined her lover in their kitchen. It's wobbling. That's because you're shaking it. I am not. You standing on the stepladder is making me nervous, Sales. Bodhi lifted her down from where she had placed the star at the top of their Christmas tree. She giggled as he swung her up into his arms. Merry Christmas, baby. Not for another two days, Bodhi said and sighed, albeit with a grin. Vittoria and Christina were bringing the children back today, and although their parents missed them terribly, it had been nice to be alone for a few days. Sailor kissed him as he stood her on his feet. I'm going to go to Vinci with your mother to get the kids' gifts. Bodhi looked surprised. Really? They haven't got enough? Sailor smiled sheepishly. Okay, you got me. I'm going to get your gift. In that case, he grinned and swatted her butt with his hand. You really don't have to. She rolled her eyes. Yes, I do, because I already know by now you have got me some ridiculous lavish present. Bodhi shrugged, unrepentant. You gave me my daughter and you. That's enough for me. Yeah, 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 she said, trying to hide her blush. She glanced out of the window, seeing a dust storm following a car in the distance. They were so secluded that any car was a rare sight. She glanced at her watch. They're early. About three hours early. They both watched the car, but it seemed to disappear into the hills. Sailor shrugged. Well, guess it wasn't them. Bodhi Creed, you are insatiable, she continued as he began to unbutton her dress. He grinned. They showered together and were preparing lunch when Sailor heard a car starting. She went to the door. Bodhi? Yeah, babe? Someone was here. She pointed to the deep track marks in the dirt outside, then in the distance they saw the same car as before, driving at full speed away from the villa. Bodhi looked angry. What the heck? Sailor drew in a shaky breath. Maybe, she said slowly, it was someone who got lost and made their way here by accident. Bodhi didn't look appeased. Or maybe it's some jerk intruding on our privacy. She put a hand on his shoulder. It would easy to think that, especially with our history, but let's err on the side of caution. She could see Bodhi struggling with that, but eventually he nodded. Fine. The next time they say a vehicle approaching, there was no mystery. Solly jumped out of her grandmother's SUV and ran into her mother's arms, her brother following her. Sailor hugged them both tightly. Oh, I have missed you both so much. Tim hugged his dad. Hey, Pa, he grinned, then kissed Sailor. Hey, Mom. Sailor rocked back a little at that. He'd never called her mom before. She hid the tears in her eyes by waving them all in for the huge dinner she had made for them all. The place looks amazing, Vittoria nodded approvingly as they all dived into the pasta Sailor had made, along with fresh vegetables and oozy, cheesy garlic bread. Bodhi poured wine for the adults, grape juice for the kids, ignoring Tim rolling his eyes. Sailor looked at her stepson. He looked so happy, so energetic, that she couldn't resist teasing him. Have you been up to no good, Timothy? She grinned as she said it, and Tim flushed, a wry smile on his face. He has a woman, Victoria said in a stage whisper. Grandma. The others laughed as Tim squirmed, but he couldn't keep the happiness off his face. Her name is Louisa and we're just friends, he glared at his grandmother, who gave him a cheesy grin. They sat at the dinner table for hours, until Solly fell asleep in her mother's arms and Sailor stood to put her to bed. Vittoria came with her. Are you okay, Sailor? Sailor was surprised. Of course. 
Why do you ask? She tucked Sally into her new bed and stroked her daughter's dark curls. You looked thoughtful at dinner, kind of distracted. Vittoria smiled down at her granddaughter as she slept. She's so beautiful, she was so well behaved as well. Sailor grinned. Lucky you. She can be a little monster. But she said it fondly. So what's on your mind? Sailor smiled. Apart from Tim calling me mom. Vittoria chuckled softly. He talked it over with me. Apparently, he had wanted to do it for a few months. He says he thinks of you as his mom as much as he does Gemma. He just didn't know how you'd react. I loved it, Sailor admitted, her voice soft. I wish he were mine sometimes, as unfair to Gemma as that sounds. You are his mother, Vittoria said, a note of anger creeping into her voice, but then she caught herself and let out a sigh. Tim loves you so much. And I love him. If he hadn't told Bodhi where Bart Foy had taken me all those years ago, I wouldn't be here. But it's not just that on your mind. Sailor shook her head, hesitating slightly before speaking again. It's Claudio, Vittoria. I hate that there's this breach, this chasm, between him and Bodhi. I know Claudio blames me for Soleil's murder, and that's his prerogative, but they were like brothers. It hangs over Bodhi all of the time. Vittoria nodded sadly. It does. I want to go see him, try and heal this division. Vittoria looked skeptical. Sweetheart, I don't know. Sailor held her gaze. I want to at least try. It can't get worse than it is right now. Vittoria couldn't dissuade Sailor, and so, the next morning, Sailor set off for Vinci, her heart thumping as she actually drove toward Claudio's farmhouse. She'd borrowed the GPS from Bodhi's car and programmed in the directions, and now, as she approached his home, she felt sick with nerves. She pulled up in front of the house and knocked on the door. No answer. She knew that Claudio spent most of his time in his workshop, painting, and so she walked slowly around the property, passing the little outhouse that he'd converted into a guesthouse. The last time she and Bodhi had been here was before Soleil was murdered and before Sailor nearly died. Sailor shivered now. She could hear a radio on in Claudio's workshop. Her heart in her mouth, she pushed open the door a little. Claudio, dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, was slapping paint onto a canvas in angry strokes, singing roughly along, his voice agitated and stressed. As she watched, he cursed loudly and picked up a box cutter and slashed the canvas to pieces. She couldn't help the gasp of horror as he destroyed his work, and he whirled around. When he saw her, his already maddened eyes flashed with fury. What are you doing here? Sailor stood her ground. I've come to talk to you. Claudio gave a rough, mirthless laugh. What makes you think I want to talk to you, skank? Not satisfied with killing my sister, you want to go at me? Is that it? You think you can make things better? Too late, Sailor realized how drunk he was, and as he bore down on her, she saw the box gutter was still in his hand, and terror flooded through her. She closed her eyes and waited for the pain. Bodhi listened to his son trying to teach his daughter how to play chess. He grinned when he saw Tim rolling his eyes. She's a little young for that yet, maybe? Tim shook his head. Evan taught me when I was three, Dad. Bodhi hid a grin. He no longer felt any resentment towards Evan Teal when Tim regaled him of how the other man had brought him up, he just felt gratitude. Yeah, but you're a nerd, Bodhi teased his son who shrugged good-naturedly. Yup, and proud of it. Bodhi laughed and turned back to the computer. Internet access was sketchy at best out here in the countryside, but he'd finally managed to get online. He opened his emails and groaned. This wasn't good. Multiple emails from Emily Moore, his manager back in the States. All were titled, Urgent. Call me. He grabbed his cell phone and went out into the garden. Whatever Emily had to say, it couldn't be good. Hey Em, what's up? Emily sounded breathless. Gosh Bodhi, I'm so glad you called. Look, there's no easy way to say this. The press has new photos of you and Sailor. Adrenaline coursed through Bodhi's system. What? What photos? Emily cleared her throat, clearly uncomfortable. Explicit photos. 
of you and Sailor at your place in Italy. The tabloids are running them today. They'll be international by later this afternoon. They're using the excuse that it's the anniversary of Tim's abduction, and those videos of you, Sailor, and Soleil, which of course, they're rerunning. Damn. Bodhi rubbed his hand over his eyes. How the hell did they get them? Too late, he remembered the mystery car. Ah shit. He told Emily about it, and she hissed in frustration. Bodhi shook his head. Not this again. How the hell did they find out about this place? Emily sighed. I honestly have no idea. We've questioned our staff, the few who knew about it, and only one is AWOL at the moment, so it could have been him. If it was him, I can't tell you how sorry I am. It's not your fault. Look, he said after a few moments. What is it they've got? Pictures of me being with my fiancé? Hardly salacious, and to drag up what happened five years ago. Jeez. Scumbags. He had calmed down now. The invasion of privacy was disgusting, but nothing unusual in his line of work. He just felt bad for Sailor being dragged into it again. Look, it'll blow over. I'll try and keep the kids off the internet and find someone here who can build a security fence around this place. Damn it, I was hoping to finally give Sailor a home without walls. Emily apologized again, and after he'd ended the call, he went back in to tell his mother what had happened. Vittoria shrugged. It's happened before and you survived. So, what harm can it do now? She felt the tip of the box gutter against her throat and wondered if it would hurt much when Claudio sliced her open. Open your eyes, he said gruffly, and she did. What the hell are you, of all people, doing in my home? Haven't I made it abundantly clear you are not welcome? He moved a step back and put the knife down. Sailor breathed again, but Claudio still looked enraged. She could smell the alcohol coming off him in waves. Today of all days, he muttered to himself, and with a shock, Sailor realized what a miscalculation she had made. It was Soleil's birthday. Claudio's brilliant, beautiful, wonderful sister would have been 40 years old today. Sailor took a deep breath in. I'm sorry, Claudio. I miss Soleil too, very much. He raised a hand and pointed at her, his anger volcanic. You don't get to say her name. You took everything from me. I'm sorry. Stop saying you're sorry. Get out of here. She shook her head, terrified but determined. No matter what abuse Claudio subjected her to, she would not leave without exhausting every hope that she could of reconciling him with Bodhi, if not herself. Claudio stalked over to her and grabbed her wrist, tugging her out of the workshop and toward her car. But then he seemed to change his mind and dragged her into the house, locking the door behind him. Does he know you're here? Sailor shook her head, and Claudio grinned nastily. Then no one will come looking for you. Vittoria knows. The look in his eyes was scaring her. She knows I'm here. Claudio chewed his lip. So what? So what if they come for me? I could still kill you, Sailor King. I've nothing to lose by it. You're not a murderer, Claudio. Claudio grabbed the hair at the back of her head and forced her into the kitchen, throwing her onto a chair and looking around. Who says? Who says I couldn't kill you? Sailor tried to keep her voice steady, but it was difficult. You're drunk, you're hurting. You have every right to be angry at me, every right. But please, don't leave my little girl without a mother. Her voice broke at the end of the sentence. Claudio remained unmoved. Soleil never got the chance to be a mother, he barked at her. So why should you? Sailor closed her eyes. She didn't really believe he would kill her, he was just hurting so badly that he was lashing out. She studied him as he paced. His hair had grown wild, his handsome face marked and lined with grief, his hazel eyes stricken. So much pain. Sailor cursed Bartholomew Foy all over again. Claudio seemed to read her mind. It was your father who ordered her murder, he said, his voice calming now, almost cold. An eye for an eye seems a good idea right now. Sailor was silent. Maybe if she let him rant himself out. 
Then Claudio did something that made her stomach curl with terror. He grabbed a dishcloth, tore into strips, and bound her hands behind her to the chair. The police told me someone held her back while the killer stabbed her. She couldn't defend herself, so why should you be able? The feeling of being tied to chair made Sailor's body tremble. Memories flooded back. Her father. The knife. The pain. She couldn't help the whimper of fear that escaped her. Claudio pulled up a chair and sat in front of her. Sailor only reined in her screams because he wasn't armed. Claudio studied her before he spoke. Sailor smelled whiskey and cigarettes on his breath. You are beautiful. When I first met you, I admit, I had a crush. I know Soleil liked you. Hell, there was proof all over the news that she liked you, wasn't there? You slept with her. Did you actually desire her too, or were you just using her to get your rocks off? I loved her, Sailor said softly, figuring honesty was the only thing which could save her now. I loved her. Maybe not in the same way I love Bodhi, but yes, I wanted her that day and she wanted me. It was one of the happiest days of my life, and when Soleil died, a part of me died too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do to bring her back, but I can't. If I had known Bart Foy. Your father? Sailor choked on the words. My father, in biology only, if I had known he would kill her. I would have swapped places with her in a heartbeat. I loved her, Claudio. Claudio got up suddenly, pacing around the room, and Sailor saw that she had gotten through to him. A little. After a few tense minutes, he sat down. Tell me. Sailor was confused. Tell you what? Everything. From as far back as you can remember. Tell me everything about how you were raised, what Barty Foy was like. Sailor let out a shuddery breath. He was doing it to torture her. Okay then, let him, she thought. She told him everything, about her mother, about Tilly, about her destiny to be his wife. He wanted me in bed. Claudio, and as he always wanted to be seen as pure and a good man, I have no doubt that he would have murdered me eventually, to stop me talking about his incestuous violence. Am I supposed to feel sorry for you? Claudio's voice was like ice. Sailor shook her head. No. You asked me to tell you, and I'm telling you. The day I met Bodhi, I had escaped from Bart but was working for his agent, Maurice Winston. Winston tried to hurt me, and Bodhi saved me. It seems so prosaic to say it, but we really did fall in love quickly. He wanted to protect me. Which is why he asked Solly to pose as his girlfriend? To protect your whereabouts? Sailor nodded. And she agreed without hesitation. Claudio looked down at his hands and was silent for a long time. All Sailor could hear was his ragged breathing and the sound of her blood rushing in her ears. When Claudio looked up again, there were tears in his angry eyes. They stabbed her twenty-seven times. Twenty-seven. The medical examiner said twenty-two of those stab wounds were fatal in and of themselves. He gutted my sister. By the time the doctor officially declared her dead, she had bled out entirely. Solly didn't stand a chance. I know, Sailor said in a whisper. I'm so sorry, Claudio. His face hardened. So, who could blame me for doing the same to you, Sailor? And he got up and grabbed a lethal-looking bread knife. Sailor closed her eyes and waited to die. Somehow, in her heart, she knew this had been inevitable, that her happiness was temporary, that she was destined to die young. Oh my God, Bodhi, Solly, Tim. I love you, I love you. Goodbye. She felt Claudio rip open the bodice of her dress. Bodhi tried Sailor's cell phone again, his heart beating faster and faster. Why wasn't she answering? He cursed, not seeing his mother behind him, holding Solly. Damn, damn, repeated Solly cheerfully until her grandmother shushed her. Vittoria studied her son. What is it? Bodhi took his daughter and hugged her before answering. Solly wriggled in his arms. I can't get hold of Sailor. I would have thought her phone would be on, especially in a city. Vittoria looked guilty, and Bodhi squinted his eyes at her. What? What's going on? Vittoria hesitated, then sighed. 
Look, I promised I wouldn't tell, but Sailor's not in the city. A thrill of fear went through Bodhi. What? What the hell are you talking about? Victoria cut her eyes at Solly, who was now singing, Hell screw, hell screw. Bodhi took his daughter back inside and gave her to Tim. Look after your sister for a minute, would you? Going back outside, Bodhi glared at his mother. What's going on? And don't lie. You have a terrible poker face. Victoria sighed. She's gone to see Claudio. Bodhi paled, and for a moment he thought he might collapse. No. God, Mom, no, why? She wants to heal the friendship between you both. Bodhi went cold. Shit, Mom, no, Claudio isn't in a good headspace right now. Geez, I have to go. Vittoria followed him in. What is it, Bodhi? Why are you so scared? Don't you know Claudio blames Sailor for Soleil's murder? Yes, I know, but how do you know? Because I've had a private investigator on him for these last years, Bodhi said, almost panicking now. And Maceo Bartoli called me after he went to see him. His paintings, he hasn't shown in years and you know why. Because every single one of his paintings is him killing Sailor. All of them. Maceo Bartoli sounded sick to his stomach when he called me. I've had Claudio watch to protect my fiancé, and now she's delivered herself straight to him. Vittoria looked alarmed. Gosh, Bodhi, here, take my SUV. Go, go. Bodhi nodded. Keep trying her cell phone, he said, and if she answers, tell her to get the hell out of there. I hope to God we're not too late. Claudio ripped open Sailor's dress, with every intention of plunging the knife he gripped into her, but then he was brought up cold. Shock. The pattern of jagged silver scars across her belly reminded him. Sailor had been stabbed too. She had given herself up for certain death to protect Tim, to make some good come out of a terrible situation. Claudio stared at her scarred belly, rising and falling as she took shallow breaths, obviously anticipating the pain. You are not a murderer. Claudio dropped the knife with a clang and sank onto the floor, resting his head on Sailor's knees. Gosh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He began to weep, reaching behind her to untie her hands. What the hell was he thinking? How did him killing Sailor help anything? He began to sob in earnest, throwing himself away from her into the corner of the room, his head in his hands. Sally, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He'd never gotten over seeing her dead, pale, silent on the mortuary table. He'd ripped off the cloth covering her so he could see what Foy had done to her. Those patterns of wounds. He'd never forgotten. Now, seeing Sailor's scars, he realized he'd been blaming the wrong person all along. He felt Sailor sit beside him. At first, he wanted to move away, but when she wrapped her arms around his head and pulled it into her chest to comfort him, his own arms snaked around her waist, and he held her tightly as they both cried. After a while, they were both silent, but carried on holding each other. I'm so sorry, Claudio, Sailor murmured, her lips against his hair. I'm so so sorry. I would do anything to bring her back, anything. Claudio looked up, wiping the tears from his face, then sweeping a finger on Sailor's cheek to wipe away the dampness there. I know, me too. I just get past it, Sailor. I can't. I wish I could tell you a way of dealing with the grief, but the truth is, I've never known either. When Tilly died, I thought I would spend the rest of my life screaming, it hurt so bad. Is that what you feel? Claudio nodded. Every waking moment, and I don't think I've slept much in the last five years. He sighed, closing his eyes, felt Sailor cup his cheek in her palm, leaning into it. I'm sorry, Sailor. Don't apologize, there's no need. There isn't a day since Soleil's death when I haven't felt responsible. But you're not. I see that now. What he did to you. Your own father was monstrous. He was no more my father than he was a human being, Claudio, she said fiercely. I was dying and yet when I saw Bodhi kill him, all I felt was relief. Relief that even if I died, and I was convinced I was already dead, that Bart Foy couldn't do this to anyone else. If I'd had the chance, I would have done it myself. But sadly, I didn't have much time to plan it. 
Bodhi said you broke your own arm to get to the hospital. She nodded, half smiling. Not one of my best ideas, but it did the trick. I hid a scalpel and some scissors in the cast, but they found them. Claudio smiled and brushed the hair away from her face. You sacrificed yourself for Tim. What else could I have done? I had to end it one way or another. He gazed at her for a long time. Sailor had become perhaps even more of a beautiful woman as she outgrew her puppy fat, although she still retained the curves that made men weep, Claudio thought. He felt ashamed. This young woman had been through hell, and he had just almost killed her for no reason. You said you have a daughter? She nodded. I was two weeks pregnant when Bart hurt me. She's a little badass. She survived it, and now she's four and running us ragged. She takes after her mom. Sailor smiled a little hesitantly. Her name is Soleil, she said softly, and Claudio felt a thrill of pleasure rip through him. Thank you, he whispered, tears on his cheeks again. He gathered himself. Do you have a photograph? Sailor nodded and got up to find her purse. She saw she had a raft of calls from Bodhi, but restrained herself from calling him. Talking to Claudio was the priority now. She found some photos of Solly and handed him her phone. Claudio smiled as he looked at her daughter. She's beautiful, he said softly. Sailor stood next to him and put her head on his shoulder. She would love to know you. Claudio handed her the phone, his face stricken with grief. I can't. Just think about is all I ask, Sailor said, and pressed her lips to his forehead. Claudio rubbed his face, looked deep in thought for a long moment. Sailor, I would like your help with something. Anything. He held up his hand. It may shock you or upset you, but I think it has to be done. Okay. She had no idea where he was going with this. Claudio beckoned her. Come with me. He led her back to his workshop and shoved open the door wide. He motioned for her to follow him to the back of the room. A stack of canvas lay there, and Sailor saw that there were maybe fifteen or twenty, covered with a tarpaulin. Claudio hesitated, then removed the tarp. Sailor rocked back. The first canvas was unmistakably her, dead, butchered. She gave a small cry and backed off. Claudio raised his hand. Please. Don't be afraid. I'm not showing you to hurt you. These paintings, they are the result of my fear, my grief. I mean you no harm, sailor, I swear. I would like you to help me burn these. I don't want to be reminded of my, unjustified, feelings now. Let's burn these and put an end to it. Sailor stared at him for a long moment and then nodded. She helped him carry all of the canvases out into the yard, and they piled them up. She tried not to look at them, but sometimes she would catch a glimpse and be sickened. Claudio saw her face and she saw he was ashamed. When they had set the pile alight, they stayed to watch them burn. I will seek counseling, Claudio promised her, putting his arm around her shoulders. And I'm sorry, sailor, I truly am. Then come and see your godchild, she urged him. Come see your best friend. Bodhi is still devastated over your estrangement. Please. Claudio looked away from her. I can't, he said, too much time has passed. Don't you think, Claudio, that if you and I can reach this place, you and Bodhi can too? Sailor felt despairing. If Claudio didn't reconcile with Bodhi, then what had she just gone through this for? Sailor felt tears threatened and Claudio took her face in his hands. Beautiful Sailor, I am sorry. For what I thought, for what I did. For assaulting you today. Please forgive me. I do forgive you. Sailor was weeping now, I just can't bear to see you both so miserable without each other. I deserve the misery, he said, and walked her back to her car. Sailor opened the door but shut it again quickly. We're getting married. Next August, here in Italy. If you won't come before then, please, come be with us at our wedding. At least, she was desperate now, at least promise me you'll think about. Claudio held her gaze. I will. I will think about it, I swear. Sailor gave him one last hug and got into her car. As she drove down the hillside, she could see the fire blazing, a figure standing in front of it, still watching her drive away. 
she couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment, even though there was still hope there. She wanted so badly to reunite her lover with his best friend. Her cell phone rang and Sailor remembered she hadn't called Bodhi back. She pulled the car over to the side of the road and answered it. Hi, baby. Geez, she heard Bodhi's voice, the terror in it. Are you okay? Are you hurt? Of course not, honey. Calm down, breathe. I'm sorry I didn't call you back right away. He obviously knew where she had gone. She heard his ragged breathing as he steadied himself. Ghost Sailor, the images in my head. Sailor thought back to Claudio's paintings, but shook the images away. Bodhi need never know about them. Why are you concerned? she asked lightly. It's only Claudio. When he spoke, there was ice in his voice. Don't lie to me, Sailor. You've never done that before, it's not like you. I know what Claudio had been thinking these last years. Did he hurt you? Sailor bit her lip. Did she lie again? No, but it was a difficult conversation. At least that was true. And I failed. We reached an understanding, but he won't. Her voice choked up then, and she began to cry. I'm so sorry, Bodhi. I thought I could make him see, make him want to reconcile with you. Oh, sweetheart. His voice was soft now. I love you for trying, but this all has to come from Claudio. Sailor wiped her tears with the sleeve of her sweater. And I didn't go to Vinci to get you a gift. Bodhi laughed. Hey, pretty girl, look up ahead. She looked up to see Vittoria's SUV driving toward her, her lover behind the wheel. She had never been so glad to see him, and when he parked in front of her and got out, she went straight into his arms. You came to get me. Of course I did. He kissed her tenderly. Man, you are the bravest person I know, and you keep proving it over and over. She flushed but looked at him with serious eyes. You knew. About the paintings? He nodded. I did. Did he show you them? Yes. And then we burned them together. She saw Bodhi's shoulders slump. Thank God. His arms tightened around her. Sailor, all I ever wanted to do was protect you and our family. Forgive me for not telling you about Claudio's psychosis. If you'll forgive me for today. Deal. God, when you called, I thought I might drive the car off the road with relief. Let's just hang here for a while so I can get my blood pressure down. Sailor grinned wickedly at him. Actually, I was just thinking I might try and raise your blood pressure. There are some shady cypress trees over there. Bodhi laughed. Then send it through the roof, baby. Tuscany, Italy. August. Sailor stood at the doorway to the villa that she and Bodhi had purchased a little over a year ago. She breathed in the sultry, warm air of the Tuscany hills, listening to the quiet murmur of their guests as they waited for her in the makeshift aisle under the pergola. Her daughter Solly was playing with her little basket of rose petals, eager to walk with her mother down the aisle. She heard a noise behind her and turned, her hand flying up to her mouth when she saw who was behind her. The surprise and joy flooded through her, and tears started to drop down her face. I thought you weren't going to come, I thought, oh my gosh. And she ran into Claudio's arms. He hugged her tightly. I could not stay away, not today. I'm sorry I did not come before. Sailor smiled up at him with tears in her eyes. Come meet your goddaughter. Sally beamed up at Claudio as Sailor introduced her and raised her arms to him. Hug. Claudio laughed and swung her up into his arms. Hello there, Solly. He studied her dark curls, her bright green eyes, and her café au lait skin. He smiled at Sailor. She is the perfect mix of you and Bodhi. Sailor nodded, too emotional to speak. He was here, she'd sent him the invitation and written on the back. No pressure, but God it would be good to have you there. She'd thought long and hard and then added an extra note, and now Claudio took it out of his pocket, his expression shy. And I could not resist your kind offer, so, if you would still like it, I would be honored to walk you down the aisle. Sailor burst into tears but smiled, nodding. Oh yes, please, please. Five minutes later, 
she had gathered herself as the music began to play outside. Claudio nodded to her. Are you ready, sailor? I am. He held out his arm and she took it, his hand supporting her as they walked to the door. Solly ran ahead at full speed but Sailor didn't care. Everything was perfect now. Bodhi couldn't believe his eyes. For a moment all he had seen was his beautiful fiancée walking towards him, dressed in a simple but beautiful white dress. It took a second to register who was walking with her, supporting her. His eyes met Claudio's, and his friend his best friend since childhood, acknowledged him with a nod and a tentative smile, before looking back to the woman beside him with nothing but admiration and love in his eyes. As they approached, Bodhi stepped down to take Sailor's hand from Claudio, and there was an unspoken communication between to the two men. Sailor murmured a thank you to Claudio, and he stepped back and took his place next to Bodhi's mom. Vittoria was already crying. Stunned by Claudio's appearance, Bodhi nevertheless now had only eyes for one person. His sailor, his love. You look beautiful, he whispered to her. I love you. I love you, she whispered back and grinned. Bodhi reached out and put his hand on her eight and a half months pregnant belly. Sailor had given him a Christmas gift, after all. In moments they were officially married, and the party had begun. Bodhi and Claudio spent time alone talking to each other, encouraged by Sailor, who didn't mind sharing her husband on this day. Her friends Bay and Tom Mayer, Emily Moore and Dash Hamilton were there. Evan Teal had come stag and Sailor was determined to fix the shy man up. Friends of Bodhi's were there, Grady and Flory Mallory and Maceo and Orianthi Bartoli, as well as other people from the local village. The wedding part went way long into the night. Guests started to drift away until just a few were left, sitting around the garden, the trees lit up with lanterns, a small brazier warming the already hot night. Sailor sat wrapped in her new husband's arms, perched on his lap and smiled up at him. Now I can believe we've made it, hubby. Bodhi chuckled. Me too, wifey. And later, when all these freeloaders have gone, I'll show you just how much I love you. Sailor chuckled, brushing her lips. Well, I hate to break it to you, Mr. Creed, but I think your baby son has other ideas. Bodhi suddenly felt a dampness on his leg. Sailor looked guilty as she grinned at him. Oops. Bodhi groaned and laughed at once. Girl, you have the worst timing. Come on. Let's get you to hospital. Bodhi gazed down at his newborn son with wonder in his eyes. Sailor grinned at his expression. He looks just like you, gorgeous, she said. Come sit with me. She shifted over in the bed and Bodhi perched next to her, cradling Adamo Timothy Claudio Creed in his arms. He's perfect. Sailor smiled up at her husband, her heart at peace at last. Just like his father, she whispered, and Bodhi tilted her face up so he could kiss her and show her just how much he loved her. The End Sneak peek for The Billionaire's Secret Desire, A Holiday Romance, Secret Babies 1. Chapter 1 Amber Duplass squinted at her oldest and dearest friend as he handed her a plate of perfectly cooked eggs. Knox Renault, you are a pain in my ass. Knox, his green eyes amused, grinned at her. Well then, my work here is done. But why? Amber sighed and bunched her auburn hair up into a ponytail. You're one of the wealthiest landowners in New Orleans, an incredibly successful businessman, and, according to Forbes, one of the world's most eligible bachelors. And yet you stand in your own palatial kitchen, she gestured around the vast room, cooking me eggs for brunch yourself. Haven't you heard of chefs? Knox shook his head. He was used to this line of questioning from Amber. You know I don't like a lot of people around me, Ams. Amber forked some egg into her mouth, almost swooning at the taste. Which is why you're a pain. I'm worried that you'll become a hermit. I think hermithood arrived a while ago, Knox said mildly. Look, I know you mean well but I'm nearly forty and I'm set in my ways. I like being alone. He dumped a panful of eggs onto his own plate and sat down. And anyway, in a few days the best and brightest will be here to drink my champagne and bother me all night. Gosh, why do I do this every year? He groaned and Amber laughed. 
such a Grinch. She ruffled his dark curls and he grinned, though he was sighing on the inside. The Renault family had given a Halloween charity benefit since way before Knox's birth. It had been a special project of his beloved mother's. Before the tragedy, of course. Despite his solitary nature, Knox could not bear to dishonor his mother's legacy. His eyes flicked over to the framed picture of her and Teague, his adored elder brother, on the kitchen counter. Both of them dark and beautiful, laughing and hugging. Both of them gone so senselessly. The tragedy of the Renault family was known throughout Louisiana and beyond. Tynan Renault, a respected businessman, adoring husband to the Italian-born Gabriella, and heroic father to his sons Teague and Knox, had suffered a psychotic break and gunned down his wife and eldest son one night before turning the gun on himself. Knox, away at college at the time, had been destroyed. After dropping out of school and coming home to the huge plantation mansion out on the bayou, he had struggled for years to understand what his father had done. Amber and his other friends had tried to persuade him to sell the place where his mother and brother had been murdered, but Knox refused. He took over his brother's business with his friend Sandor, and together, they had made a success of it. The company, Rencar, quickly became an outlet to forget his pain, with Knox pouring 20 hours a day into the work. Luxury food importing had never been his dream, was it anyone's, but he had found something he was good at, and that was enough for him. His boyhood dreams of becoming a musician were pushed aside for something that would utterly distract him. The studio his mother had set aside for both of them to work in had stood empty for almost 20 years now, as had Knox's heart. He realized he wasn't listening to Amber now, and apologized. She rolled her blue eyes. Knox, I'm used to you spacing out on me, but listen, this is your party. I'm just saying, why don't you try to be more gregarious for a change? These people pay a lot of money to come here. Mostly to see the murder house, he mumbled, and Amber made an annoyed click with her tongue. Maybe so, but the money we raise goes to a good cause, doesn't it? Something good to come out of, damn it, Knox, you're not the only one who lost someone. To his horror, he saw tears in her eyes. He reached over and took her hand. Ams, I'm sorry I know. I miss Ariel too, every day. He sighed. So much pain, so much death. Amber was right, he needed to get out of this self-pitying funk. All I ask is for you to do your part on the night. Mingle and talk to your guests. Amber's tone was calmer now and she smiled at him, her face soft and her eyes on his, holding them for a beat too long. Knox nodded, looking away finally. I promise. After Amber had gone, he wandered into his living room and flicked on the television. Local news station WDSU was doing a feature on Halloween New Orleans, the magical manic mayhem of the festival the city threw every October. Knox sighed and waited for the inevitable mention of his party. Wait for it, he muttered to himself. Will it be the Renault family curse or the mansion with the dark secrets first? The anchor looked serious. Of course, before the festivities kick off on Halloween night, the New Orleans elite will gather at the Renault mansion, out on the bayou. Regular viewers will know that the annual Creepy Cocktails Gala benefit is held every year at the place some locals call the mansion with a dark history. More on that after these messages. Knox clicked off the television with an annoyed flick of his hand. Same story every year. And now his guests who watched the news would be all the more curious about the only remaining Renault. Damn it. His cell phone rang and he answered it gratefully. Sandor man, you have impeccable timing. His friend laughed. Any time. Listen, we may have a deal on the Laurent restaurant chain. Knox sat up. Really? The Laurent business was worth twice what they had offered, but had been on the market for two years with no interest. Knox knew if they got it at a cheap price and refurbished it, it could make them a fortune. He and Sandor had decided to branch out into buying restaurants to serve their luxury foods as a new income stream, not that either of them needed it, but they both were bored with their business. They wanted to get their hands dirty and do something, something physical rather than just importing food for, well, people like them. Yep. Gustave Laurent is getting a divorce, and he wants to get rid of the property quickly. Knox was astonished. 
Gus is divorcing Catherine? Seems so. Seems like she was sleeping around on him. Knox made a half-amused, half-scornful noise. Like Gustav hasn't been messing around on her for years. You know Gus. Sadly, yes. Listen, I can be there in a half hour. Good, Sandor replied. And afterward, I'll spot you lunch. Deal? Knox smiled down the phone. Deal. See you then. Livia Chatelaine balanced three plates expertly along her left arm and carried them to the table. The two women and the child seated at the table smiled gratefully at her as she laid their food in front of them and returned their grins. Enjoy, folks. Let me know if you need anything else. She skirted back to another table that was waiting for their check and settled up with them quickly and with her innate friendliness. She had been working at Le Chat Noir Café in the French Quarter for three months now, ever since she had packed her whole life into her battered old gremlin and driven across the country from San Diego. Morico, her best friend from college, had been in New Orleans for a year and had gotten her the job at the café. It didn't hurt that the owner, a handsome, dark-haired Frenchman called Marcel, had a huge crush on Morico and would have hired anyone she recommended. Thankfully, though, Livia and Marcel had become good friends, and Livia showed up early, stayed late, and worked her ass off for him. In return, he gave her the shifts that fit best with her studies, and paid her enough that she could afford the tiny apartment she shared with Morico. Livia had decided as she left San Diego that she wouldn't return to her hometown again. It held no interest for her now, and there wasn't any family left there that she cared about. An only child, her mother had died when she was young, and Livia had brought herself up. She'd worked hard at school and at various jobs to put food on the table, while her father drank himself into a stupor every night and screamed at her if she disturbed him. Livia had stopped caring years ago about the man. As far as she was concerned, he was merely the seed donor. What she remembered of her mother were warm, happy memories. Cancer was a sucker, and it had stolen her happiness away when she was five. Livia's last memory of her mother was of the beautiful woman kissing her goodbye one day before school, and that was the last time she had seen her. Her father hadn't let her see her after she died. Livia had put herself through college on a scholarship and by working three jobs, and it had become second nature to always fight and scrape for everything. It gave her energy and reason, and when she had graduated top of her class, it had all been worth it. Her tutors had been loath to let her go and had championed her to apply for postgraduate research scholarships, but it had taken Livia four years to finally secure an offer from the University of New Orleans. Hey, dreamer. Morico nudged Livia out of her reverie, and her friend smiled at her. Moriko, a tiny Japanese-American of exquisite beauty, and she knew it, hoisted herself up onto the counter. Marcel needs a favor. Livia hid a grin. When Marcel sent Moriko to do his dirty work, it meant that, whatever the favor was, it would be a big and probably inconvenient one. What is it? Well, he's been asked to cater the Renault party on Saturday. You know which one I mean? Livia shook her head. Nope. Morico rolled her eyes. It's an annual thing Knox Renault does. He throws a Halloween gala party and gives a ton of money to charity. Never heard of him or it. So, what's the favor? Livia thought she could guess Marcel needed waitstaff. A moment later, Morico confirmed her suspicions. He was going to hire in silver service staff, but apparently they don't want anything but canapes and cocktails. Silver service staff would cost him more than he's making so. Livia smiled at her. It's no problem. Usual uniform? She pulled down on her too tight white shirt and tucked it back into the black mini she wore to serve. So, Saturday night waitressing for the rich muckety mucks? I'll be there too. Hey, at least we get to snoop around the rich guy's house. Livia sighed to herself. She honestly didn't mind helping Marcel out, but she had very little time for rich boys with too much money. She'd had to wait on them enough in her time. She went back out to the café and grimaced. Two regulars had just come into the restaurant. Speaking of rich muckety-mucks, she thought, plastering a fake smile on her face. 
The woman, an icy-looking blonde with bright red lipstick and cold blue eyes, looked at her dismissively. Egg white omelette with spinach and a mango teeny. She didn't look at the menu once. Her companion, a suave-looking man who at least smiled at Livia and said please and thank you whenever he was in, nodded. Same for me please Liv. Good to see you again. Livia smiled at him. She judged him for the company he kept, but if she was fair, he was always polite to her. She knew his companion was called Odell, and her father was one of the richest men in the state. It didn't impress Livia. You too, sir. Sure I can't interest either of you in some french fries to go with your salad? Odell looked horrified, but her companion grinned. Why not? Livia grinned and disappeared into the kitchen. Marcel slunk in and smiled at her. Thanks for Saturday, Livy. I'll pay you double. She kissed his cheek. No problem, pal. Marcel, his eyes so dark you couldn't see the pupils, nodded to the restaurant. I see Elsa and Lumiere are in the restaurant. Livia laughed. You're getting your Disney all mixed up, and anyway, he's okay. But yeah, she is the ice queen. Don't let their wealth get to you. It was all inherited, not earned. Oh, I know, and it doesn't bother me. Money can't buy breeding, Livia shrugged off the woman's rudeness. I can honestly say these people and their ways don't keep me up at night, Marcel. I'm just saying because I know the man, Roan St. Mark, is Knox Renault's best friend. It's more than likely they'll be at the party on Saturday. Marcel grinned at Livia, who rolled her eyes. Just promise me you won't tip their meals into their laps. Livia snorted. I promise, honey. Good girl. Livia finished out her shift, then walked home through the busy streets of the French Quarter. She had fallen in love with this city, the slow, sensual heat, the sultry, laid-back nature of the people. Strangely, for a city known for its voodoo and black magic, she had never felt uneasy walking the streets at night here. Morico was still at work when Livia got back to their apartment, so Livia took a long hot shower, then made herself a bowl of soup, grabbing some saltines from the pack in the kitchen. As she ate, she flicked through the television channels, but soon got bored. Dumping her bowl in the sink, she washed it out, then decided to go to bed to read. She had a piano recital coming up, and she wanted to go through the score again, miming her keystrokes in the air. She fell asleep with Moriko's cat cuddling in next to her, and didn't hear her roommate come home. Out on the bayou, Knox too had fallen into a deep sleep, but his was not so peaceful. Almost instantly, the nightmares came. A woman, a beautiful young woman he knew but one whose face he could not see, was calling to him, begging him to save her. There was blood, so much blood, and he ran through the darkened mansion, wading through something, blood, to get to her. A dark, malevolent force overcame everything, stopping Knox from reaching the girl. He heard her screams cut off abruptly and knew he was too late. He sank to his knees. He felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up. His mother was smiling at him. Don't you know you'll never save them, she said softly. Everyone you love will die, my beloved son. I died, your father, your brother. Ariel. You'll always be alone. Knox awoke, gasping for air in a pool of his own sweat, the certainty of his dream mother's words screaming around his mind. Don't fall in love. Don't risk it. Don't let anyone else get hurt. Chapter 2 Odell Griffongi lit another cigarette and stood out on the balcony of her bedroom. She hated this holiday and hated this party. And yet Roan, of course, wanted to support his best friend, Knox, and so now they were getting dressed to attend. Thank Knox never had a dress code for the cocktail party, Odell would have feigned a headache otherwise. Odell might have been brought up in the upper echelons of New Orleans society, but she knew her brittle beauty would only last so long and that her cool, aloof nature wouldn't make her many friends. That's why she was staggered when Roan, known as the fun-loving one in his group of Harvard grad friends, made a play for her. He could have had anyone. Odell turned back to see the crowds on the streets of the city. New Orleans went crazy for Halloween, parties everywhere, people haunting the streets, and the locals playing up the myths and legends to sell more drink, food, and tourist crap. 
The normally serene street where Odell and her cohorts lived were no different. Pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns, trees bedecked with twinkle lights and fake cobwebs, and Odell's least favorite thing, kids trick-or-treating at every house. Her doorbell rang, and although Odell knew her staff would answer it, she couldn't help an irritated, oh, buzz off. Her voice carried down to the street, and she heard Roan's throaty laugh from behind her. Don't be scared, Deli. It's a rite of passage, trick-or-treating. Odell made a disgusted noise. I never did that. Roan smiled at her, sliding his arms around her waist. No, you were too busy casting spells and mixing potions. Odell studied him coolly. You think I'm a witch? Cute cheesy line from me about you casting a spell on me. No, baby, I don't think you're a witch. You just have a warmth deficiency. He said it with a grin, and although Odell knew he meant it as a joke, it still stung. Because it's true, she told herself. What is wrong with me? Why can't I be more like Roan? Or Knox, whose heart was so big it actually scared Odell. Or even Amber, her frenemy, who had once had a thing with Roan. No, Odell told herself. Don't go there. Not tonight. She attempted a smile as Roan brushed his lips against hers. You're right. It's just one night. That's my girl. Roan looked her up and down in her tight black dress, and when his gaze met hers, Odell saw the desire in his eyes. Knox won't mind if we're a little late. And they began again. Livia and Morico helped Marcel and his sous chef Katerina, Kat, load the trays of canapes into the restaurant's van before Liv and Morico hopped in the back for the drive to the Renault mansion. Livia was trying to keep the trays from tipping and tying her thick mane up into a chignon at the same time, but the weight of it would not stay clipped. Morico grinned at her. Just pull it back. You'll never get it all up. I refuse to be beaten, Livia muttered. Eventually, Morico pushed Livia's hands out of the way. Let me. As Livia held the trays of food, Morico deftly worked Liv's hair into a messy bun at the nape of her neck. That's the best you're going to get, girl, so live with it. Livia tentatively patted it. You're a miracle worker. From now on, I'll pay you to be my hair wrangler. Morco laughed. You couldn't afford me. When they arrived at the mansion, they were stunned into silence. The old plantation home had been modernized to some extent. A plaque on the door detailed its history and its passage to the Renault family in the 1800s, wherein all slaves were freed and the plantation became a family homestead rather than a working freehold. The imposing white building with shuttered windows and soft light radiating from within was decorated with high-quality Halloween trimmings. Morico grinned at Livia as they passed a batch of expertly carved pumpkins. You think they got Michelangelo to do them? Livia rolled her eyes. The place screamed money and opulence, but Livia wasn't impressed. As they moved into the kitchen, she saw Marcel talking to a young man who was dressed in a dark navy sweater and jeans, and who Livia guessed was the owner's assistant. He had dark curls and the most intense and beautiful, green eyes she had ever seen. The stranger sensed her scrutiny and looked up. Their eyes met, and Livia felt a shudder of desire ripple through her. Gosh, if even the staff looked like supermodels here. She nudged Morico. Does Marcel want us to change now or after we've set up? After. Apparently, there's a dedicated room for us. Fancy. I know, right? Usually we have to squat in the back of the van to get ready. Livia snorted and between them, they quickly arranged the canapes on the silver trays. When they had finished, Livia saw the handsome assistant had gone, and Marcel was nodding at them. Lovely job. The food looks great. So, this thing kicks off in an hour, but guests are starting to arrive, so we'll start with the welcome pumpkin spice sidecars first up. Think you can cope? No worries, boss. Morco hugged Marcel, who turned red with pleasure. We'll show these rich kids a good time. Wait, that sounded dirtier than I meant it to. Livia snorted with laughter as Morico shrugged. Come on then. Let's get dressed. A half hour later, Livia was regretting the tightness of her skirt. It had been her go-to throughout college, short, black, and figure-hugging even back then when she was ten pounds lighter. 
She dragged it out of her closet this morning. It had been the cleanest, most professional skirt she could find. I need to go shopping, she told herself, as she plastered a smile on her face and made the rounds with a tray of drinks. The mansion's main ballroom, main ballroom, she'd muttered to an amused Morico. Because the other ballrooms are too small. Was decorated beautifully, even the cynical Livia had to admit. Twinkle lights draped the walls and soft music was playing as the guests milled around, talked and drank. Morico was making the first pass with a canapé tray, and Livia could tell her friend was gritting her teeth, fending off unwanted remarks and come-ons. Hey, Livy. She heard Roan St. Mark's voice behind her and turned. She was actually relieved to see a friendly face. If the guests weren't turning their noses up at her presence or trying to talk her into bed, they looked through her as if she were invisible. Roan's smile was friendly. He indicated the man he was talking with, a tall, dark-haired man with a neatly trimmed beard and dark brown eyes. San, this is my friend from my favorite restaurant. Livia, this is Sandor Carpentier, a good friend of mine. Sandor Carpentier had a warm, open smile as he shook Livia's hand. She grinned at them both, happy to see friendly faces at last. Can I get you fellas a refill? She waved the bottle of Krug she was holding and topped up their glasses. Boss tells me the good bourbon will be out soon, she said with a wink. If I know Knox it will be, Roan said and looked around. Speaking of whom, have you met our lord and master yet, Liv? She shook her head. But he would probably tell me to get back to work. Nice seeing you, Mr. St. Mark, Mr. Carpentier. Sandor, please, the man said, and Livia decided she liked his merry, twinkling eyes. He didn't seem as aloof as the others. And if you knew Knox, you'd know that's unlikely. He'd probably insist you join us for a drink. Livia smiled and made her excuses. Despite what they said, she didn't want Marcel to get into trouble if she was caught fraternizing with the guests. She made her way back to the kitchen to refill her tray. Morico was just coming in from the garden. Hey boo, I just finished up my break and Marcel told me to let you grab one now that I'm done. There are a couple of good places to hide and take your shoes off out there. Livia smiled at her friend gratefully and headed out of the kitchen door into the lush gardens. It was darker down here than at the front of the mansion, and she could see a fog coming in off the bayou at the end of the property. Livia thought it was much spookier, befitting the Halloween vibe of the party, and yet more beautiful than any of the decorations inside. With a soft moan, she eased off her heels and wondered why she hadn't worn her usual flats. No, she knew why, she had wanted to make a good impression for Marcel. She knew she could pull off the cool professional vibe with her heels on, and at least it gave her a few extra inches when she needed to be seen. Still, her feet pulsed with pain, and when she put her hot soles on cool ground, she sighed with relief. She crept barefoot into a little grove, and seeing the edge of a stone seat, headed for it. She stopped, seeing the other end was already occupied. Sorry, she said, then saw it was the assistant she'd shared a moment with earlier. He had changed out of his sweater and jeans and was now wearing what looked to be a very expensive black suit. Perks of the job, she suspected, but her attention was drawn by the way it fit his broad shoulders and slim figure so well. She meant to turn and go, but the sheer sadness in his eyes took her breath away. Are you okay? Her voice was soft and the man stared at her, his eyes intense, before he half nodded, then shook his head. Not really, but common manners dictate I say I am. So. His voice was deep, a beautiful deep baritone that sent a shiver through her. Livia hesitated for a moment, then sat down next to him. Escaping from the melee? Me too. Just for a minute. She smiled at him, noticing again how gorgeous he was, except for that pain in his eyes. She wished she could take it away for him. Are you hiding from the muckety mucks? His mouth hitched up in a half smile. Kind of. She leaned forward conspiratorially. I won't tell, she whispered, and he laughed. It changed his whole face, turning it from brooding and slightly dangerous into a boyish, joyful thing. Right back at you. He looked at her name tag. Livia. Not oh, Livia. She shook her head. No, just Livia. She shivered at the cool air coming up from the water. It really is beautiful here. 
He nodded, and seeing her trembling, he shrugged out of his jacket and put it around her shoulders. She felt her face get hot. Thank you. They gazed at each other for a long moment, and Livia felt tongue-tied. He smelled wonderful too, all clean linen and woodsy spice, and for a moment she found herself having to resist the urge to run her fingertips over his long, thick lashes. They were so black, they looked like he had eyeliner on. She swallowed hard, the desire to kiss this stranger overwhelming and bewildering. She cast around for something to say. I was thinking, that mist from the bayou must have known there was a Halloween party here tonight. Gosh, could she have sounded any dumber? She cursed herself but he smiled at her. I guess it must have known. I find it romantic. Dark and malevolent, perhaps. But also sensual. She hadn't had this reaction to a man in forever, or ever, if she was being honest. Electricity hung in the air between them. She had to dispel it before she did something reckless. She had Marcel and Morico to think about here. She nudged him with her shoulder. Hey, you better get in there before all the food is gone. Honestly, they're like sharks, these people. Fins and everything. The food is really good, too. I hope your boss agrees. Another smile, amused and sweet. I'm sure he does. He stood and offered his hand. Shall we sneak into the kitchen and grab something then? Trembling she took his hand, the skin surprisingly soft and dry and stood. Okay. But afterward, you have to tell me your name. Their bodies were really close now, and Livia could feel his body heat through her clothes. He trailed a finger across her cheekbone, and Livia shivered. She smiled but stepped away from him. I think we'd better get inside. His smile didn't change and he squeezed her hand. Of course. Knox. They both heard the female's voice from across the garden. Knox, where the hell are you? A thrill of panic went through Livia as her companion called out. Right here, Ams. Keep your shirt on. I should have known. Livia was frozen. Shit, shit, shit. This was Knox Renault. He smiled down at her and put his finger over his lips for a second before his smile widened into a conspiratorial grin. I have to go. She nodded and shrugged out of his jacket. Here, you better have this back. I'm going inside now, anyway. He thanked her, taking the coat, and with a last regretful look towards her, disappeared back towards the direction of the shouting woman. Oh damn, Livia hissed to herself. Way to be unprofessional. Catering 101, don't almost kiss the client. Jeez. Her face flaming with embarrassment, she went back into the kitchen and managed to work the rest of the party while avoiding any contact with Knox Renault or his friends. Difficult but not impossible. When it became clear the party was winding down, Livia hid out in the kitchen and dealt with the cleanup. Marcel was all smiles when he came to thank them both. Liv, you didn't need to do this, he said, looking in amazement at the stack of empty clean trays she was loading into the van. She grinned at him. No problem, boss. She made herself busy untying her apron. Did you get good feedback? Very good feedback and a somewhat unexpected bonus, which you'll find in your paychecks. No, don't argue. Say what you want about the Renault family, but Knox is a very generous man. He also told me that I was his go-to caterer for the future, which isn't saying a lot because he rarely entertains guests, but it's still something. It is something. It's a big something. Morico kissed Marcel's cheek and he gave her a hug. Thanks, Maury. He also said he'd be recommending me to his friends and clients. Good guy. Geez, look at the time. Come on kids, let's get out of here. I'll buy you both a late dinner. Later, at home in bed, Livia could not help but look up Knox Renault on the internet. She flicked through pages of photos of him, drinking in the shape of his face, the green eyes that looked just as sad in his childhood pictures as in every photo of him as an adult. She traced his face with her finger. In some pictures he had a beard, which made him look even more handsome, she thought. When she began to read about his history, the murder-suicide of his parents and brother, 
the mysterious death of his teenage sweetheart, the years of suspicion aimed at Knox himself, she learned he'd been thoroughly investigated after the death of Ariel Duplass. Knox was only 18 at the time and was the only suspect, but the police had completely exonerated him. The piece Livia was reading made it clear that his family's deaths had broken the handsome young man. Since his family tragedy and the subsequent investigation, Renault has kept a low profile. His luxury food importing business with friend Sandor Carpentier has made him a billionaire, but this has just served to draw more attention and comparisons to other tragic figures. Many locals refer to him as New Orleans' own Howard Hughes, a reclusive man with a myriad of secrets. Only once a year do we really get to see the man at his annual benefit on Halloween, but it doesn't stop gossip magazines the world over wondering about the romantic life of this devastatingly and some say, dangerously, handsome young man. As he approaches 40, will Knox Renault ever break free of his past? Gosh, I hope so. The thought came unbidden to Livia as she slid her finger over his photograph. Not that it would have anything to do with her, but she had sensed something special in the man she had met, that he was more than just another handsome rich boy. There were hidden depths there, she was sure of it. When she went to sleep that night, she dreamed of Knox Renault and his beautiful green eyes, and of the moment his lips would press against hers. Chapter 3 Amber rolled her eyes as Knox sat down at the table. It was the French Quarter, with busy streets and lunchtime crowds, and the restaurant Amber had chosen was almost full. You're late again, Renault. Where's the Rolex I bought you last year? Knox sighed, kissing her cheek. You know I don't like to wear it out in public. It looks too ostentatious. Not that I'm not grateful for it, he added, seeing Amber's frown, it was a lovely gift. I just don't know if it's really me. Amber opened her mouth to argue, then gave up. Knox looked different and had seemed different, lighter, since the party. Amber had wondered if it was just the relief of getting it over and done with for another year, but it had been a week since the party, and every time she had seen him, Knox had been happy. What's going on with you? she asked him now, and Knox, who was reading the menu, glanced up and smiled at her. What do you mean? I mean, you look different. You look lighter. I haven't lost weight, far from it. Amber rolled her eyes again. Knox was nowhere in the vicinity of overweight. I mean emotionally. You seem to be carrying yourself more cheerfully than usual. Knox laughed, his green eyes twinkling. Do I? Fine, don't tell me then. Amber snatched the menu from him grumpily and sulked behind it. Knox smothered a grin. Ams, you ever have one of those moments in life, however fleeting, where someone or something just reminds you why you're alive? Someone who sets off a thought process that makes you reevaluate your entire existence. Is this your fancy way of saying you got laid? Amber felt a twinge of jealousy go through her and brushed it away. He doesn't belong to you, he never did. Knox shook his head. No, I haven't. No. I just had a moment with someone, a woman, at the party. I'd like to see her again, is all. Really? Amber ran through all of the party guests in her head, and Knox just smiled and shook his head. Who? Knox hesitated and smiled ruefully at her. Can I just have this secret for a little bit? I swear, the moment it becomes more than a moment, you'll be the first to know. Amber relaxed. Of course, honey. She reached over and squeezed his hand. I'm very happy for you. It's about time you got your pickle tickled. Knox burst out laughing and Amber joined in, her blue eyes amused. As they ordered their food, she studied her friend. They had known each other for more than half their lives. They'd been drawn together by Amber's twin, Ariel, who had come home from school one day and told her family that she had met the most beautiful boy in the world. She hadn't been wrong. Knox Renault was the kind of boy that sculptors made statues of. That strong jaw, those perfectly symmetrical features. Big green eyes. Sensual mouth. Gosh. More than once since Ariel's death, Amber had wondered if she and Knox would end up together, mostly out of convenience, but he'd never made an advance, and she had never found the courage. 
She had to admit, it hurt a little that Knox had finally shown interest in someone, and it wasn't her, but she could not begrudge her friend his happiness. Amber's own love life was complicated. She always kept two lovers at a time, but never let either near her heart. Her beauty, her wealth, her position in society, she didn't need a husband, which made her lethal to the women of New Orleans, who kept their husbands away from her. Little did they know, Amber wasn't interested in any of them. What she wanted was far more complex. Far more Knox-like, she told herself, than pushed the thought away. He would never be hers, and she would have to accept that. So, when are you going to make your move? She asked Knox, who blinked with nervousness. To her amazement, two spots of pink appeared on Knox's cheeks as he shrugged. I don't know. I've been working on getting the courage up to approach her. Amber almost spat her water out. Knox Renault, billionaire, drop-dead gorgeous businessman, was nervous about asking a girl on a date. Wow. I haven't seen you like this since. She trailed off and looked away. Ariel was always there, always between them. Amber swallowed the lump in her throat. Knox's smile had faded and he nodded. I never thought this day would come, Ams, and look, no one, no one will ever replace her. I know that, sweetie, but hopefully someone will mean just as much to you someday. His eyes danced in a way she hadn't seen for years. I hope so too, Ams. I really hope so too. Livia tried to stop thinking about Knox Renault as she practiced her scales up and down, using the plain rhythm to distract herself. In the weeks since she'd met him, her body had felt wired, her brain whirling. To have that much chemistry with someone she probably would never see again, it didn't seem right. She faltered in her playing and then crashed her fingers down on the keyboard. Unless you're going for some kind of weird Stockhausen thing, a voice behind her said, I'm guessing you're having an off day. Livia turned to smile at her tutor. In the few months she had been at the college, her tutor, Charvi Sood, had become more than just a teacher to her. The two women had bonded over their love of jazz, of Monk Parker Davis, and to Charvi's delight, their mutual admiration for Judy Carmichael, the reason Livia had fallen in love with the genre. Listening to Carmichael's radio shows when she was living at home with her father, her headphones plugged in to dull the sound of her father shouting drunkenly at the television, she had used the genre as her way to transport herself out of the San Diego heat and here to New Orleans. Charvi put down the stack of scores she had in her hand and peered over her glasses at her young student. You okay? You've been in here practicing all week. You can rest, you know. It may be your master's degree, but rest is vital for brain power. Livia smiled at her. I know. I'm trying to distract myself from thinking about a boy. It's very annoying. Charvi laughed, shaking her head. It happens to the best of us. Want to share? Livia picked out a tune with her forefinger. It's embarrassing. He's way out of my league and... Let me stop you there, young lady. No one is out of your league. Livia sighed. It's Knox Renault. That stopped Charvi. Ah. Well, I would say the problem there isn't that you're out of his league, it's that he's Knox Renault. Livia looked at her friend curiously. You know him? I knew his mother. I've met Knox a few times. He's an enigma. At least if you believe the gossip. He has the saddest eyes I've ever seen, and he seems so sweet. Lonely but sweet. Nice. Gosh, nice is such a bland thing to say, but he was friendly and warm and... You have an enormous crush on him. Livia shrugged. Yes, but it doesn't matter. It's not like we run in the same circles. Forget I said anything. Charvi smiled. Well now, let's channel that desire into your playing. Give me something slow and sensual. And make it up as you go along. Think about Mr. Renault and let your fingers move across the keyboard. At first Livia was embarrassed, feeling exposed, but as her fingers stroked the keys she began to find a melody. She closed her eyes and thought about the feeling of him trailing his finger across her cheek, the scent of his skin, the ocean green color of his eyes. She played a melody so sweet she wanted to cry, and when she finished and opened her eyes, she felt her face burn red. Wow, you have it bad, Charvi teased her and held up her phone. 
It needs work, but there's something there. I've recorded it, and I'll email it to you. Your homework is to score it and mold it into a piece you can perform at the end of semester recital. Livia gaped at her. Are you kidding me? She felt panicky at revealing something so personal to an audience. But Charvi nodded. I'm deadly serious. That was the most connected I've ever seen you with your piano, Liv. She checked her watch. And I have a seminar. Work on it, Liv, and I swear you'll see what I mean. Left alone, Livia checked her laptop. Charvi had indeed emailed her the MP3, and as Liv played it back, she realized there was something there. She grabbed some blank score paper and began to write. Knox looked up as Sandor knocked on the door jam. Hey. Sandor grinned. You still working? Dude, it's Friday night. Let's go out and have drinks. Knox chuckled. I would, but I'm waiting on a call from Italy. Haven't you got a date? Sandor shrugged. She blew me off. I'm kind of relieved, to be honest. I'm getting too old to be dating a different pretty girl each week. My heart bleeds for you. So I'm your consolation prize. Sandor grinned. Yup. Grab your cell phone and take the call on that. We're going drinking. Knox hesitated. All right, but let's go to the French Quarter. Wanna mix with the tourists? Come on then. An hour and two shots of bourbon later, Knox relaxed back into his seat and glanced around the bar. He hadn't told Sandor that the bar he'd chosen was across the street from Marcel Pessu's restaurant, or that ever since they'd gotten here, Knox had been looking for any sign of Livia. He hadn't had one night of peace since he'd met her. The feel of her soft skin, her huge chocolate brown eyes, the way her tawny hair fell in messy waves over her shoulders, it all haunted him. The faint flush of pink when he'd touched her face. He'd been so close to kissing her, which would have been entirely inappropriate. But go, the feelings he had thought he'd never feel again were whirling and thrashing through him like a storm. He had to see her again, to see if the connection between them hadn't been just that moment in time. To see if it was real, tangible, and something they could build on. Also, he really, really needed to kiss her gorgeous pink mouth, it was driving him crazy. Knox? Buddy? Knox blinked back into the present. Sorry what? I was saying, I was talking to Roan at the party. He seems pretty keen on working with us on the Feldman project. Knox snorted and sipped his bourbon. What does Roan know about the luxury food trade? Nothing, but he does know about the shipping trade, Sander gave Knox a reproachful look. Look, I know you think he's a playboy, but he's got a good head on his shoulders. Besides, he wants to buy his way in. What? He told me he wants us three to go into business together. He wants in on the company. For the first time that night, Knox stopped thinking about Livia, leaning forward to study his friend. How come he hasn't said anything to me? Sandor chuckled. Because he knows you think he's a playboy. He's your best friend, but there's always been the Joker in the pack, and it's always been Roan. He was feeling me out in the hope I'd do the approach. So I am. I think it's something we should talk about. He wants to impress you, buddy, is all. Knox considered. I'm open to talking about it, certainly. Sandor smiled. So I can tell him yes? Talking about it, San. Nothing more at this stage. I love it when you get masterful. Another drink? Go for it. Knox leaned back, his eyes flicking automatically to the restaurant on the other side of the street. He could see the pretty Asian girl who was working with Livia at his party, waiting on tables, but there was no sign of Livia. He thought about what Sandor had said. Roan was Knox's oldest friend, but he was also someone who acted on impulse, he would best be described as reckless. Knox had worked too hard on the business, and not even his love for his friend could override the fact that Roan was not a good bet. Knox rubbed his eyes. Maybe he should loosen up, take a risk. Take a risk. His mind went back to the lovely girl he'd met at his party. Yes, he would take a risk. Enough of skulking like a creep across the street. Tomorrow, he would go to the restaurant and ask for her. If she wasn't there, he'd leave his number. 
If she was there, he was still smiling when Sandor returned with the drinks. It was after midnight when Livia left the practice rooms, and as she didn't have enough cash on her for a cab, she decided to walk home. When she got back to the French Quarter, she decided to go to the restaurant and see if Morico wanted company on her walk home. As she turned into an alley leading to Bourbon Street, she suddenly felt herself being jerked back, and a heavy arm locked around her throat. Shocked into action, she threw her elbows back with all her strength, cussing and screaming at her attacker. Get off me. She slammed her fist back into the man's groin and he groaned, releasing her. Her anger at full flood and the adrenaline spiking in her system, Livia punched and kicked the mugger until still groaning he took off. Yelling at her as he ran, she unleashed a litany of curse words at him, beyond caring who heard her. Finally, she caught her breath and picked up her bag, turning to go to the restaurant. She stopped. Knox Renault was looking at her, astonished admiration in his eyes. Livia's breath caught in her throat. Well, he said finally, a grin slowly spreading across his face. Hello again. End of sneak peek for The Billionaire's Secret Desire, a holiday romance, Secret Babies 1. Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2023 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel, it helps more than you know.